So let's remember everyone to uh, try and keep muted when you're not speaking because um, it's really easy to forget either way. And I know it's more embarrassing when you try to speak and you're muted, but in fact, it's also awkward when you're rustling papers and someone's trying to hear what someone's saying because that's easily done as well. It's just one of those things and we all do it. I do it as well, but try to make sure that I'll tell you if you've got it because I can see it on my screen generally if you've not muted. Thanks. Okay, I can confirm you're now live. Thank you. Thank you, Liam. Good morning, everyone. My name is Councillor Smart and I'm the chair of this committee. I would like to welcome you all to Cambridge City Council's planning committee meeting taking place at 10 a.m. on Wednesday, the 24th of March. I will roll call councillors alphabetically by, by last name to ensure they are present. Please advise me if you know of any apologies from other councillors when I ask you to speak. Are you present, Councillor Bajant? I am, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Green? Yes, I'm here. Councillor McQueen, I believe, is joining us later. Uh, she could make it at 10. Uh, Councillor Paige Croft? Yes, Chair. Councillor Porrer? Present, Chair. Councillor Thornborough? Present. Councillor Tunnicliffe? Present. And me, that's all. Thank you. So the officers permanently at the table uh, for this meeting are Planning Delivery Manager Nigel Glazeby, Legal Advisor Keith Barber, uh, Policy Manager James Goddard or, and Sarah Steve, uh, with James first and Sarah later. Meeting producer, uh, I believe today is Liam. Other officers and public speakers will join us throughout the course of this meeting. I will issue some of the start of relevant agenda items. If anyone has any problems hearing me throughout the meeting, please alert me by waving their hands or typing in the meeting chat function. <clears throat> I don't seem to have access to the chat function at the moment, but I'll sort that in a minute. Uh, housekeeping, so copies of the agenda can be found on the City Council's website under committee meetings, minutes and agendas. Can I ask all participants to keep themselves muted unless they have been invited to speak by the chair and to keep their backgrounds blurred? <clears throat> in addition, for public speakers, turn their cameras off until we come to the application we have registered you to speak about. If members would like to ask a question or get the attention of the chair, they will need to type speak or S uh, in the meeting chat function. The chair will introduce you when you are <coughs> able to speak. The chat function will be regularly checked by the chair and committee manager. Please try and refer to specific page numbers within the agenda if you are referring to a specific paragraph or plan. Please note <coughs> that the people who have followed or published meeting link will only be able to watch the meeting and will not be able to participate. <clears throat> Please also note there is about a 20 second delay between the actual meeting and the meeting which the public can view live streamed. <clears throat> the meeting is automatically recorded. <clears throat> I would just like to explain how public speaking will work today. The meeting is being broadcast live on the Council's website and public speakers are reminded that by speaking or appearing in this meeting, you are giving consent to be recorded. The process for each planning application will be, the case officer will give a brief introduction from his or her report. Registered public speakers will be invited to have their say. There will normally be three minutes for those speaking in support and three minutes for those speaking against, unless I've advised otherwise. Please note that public speakers are unable to join in with the council debate, and that includes using the chat function during the debate, please. The committee will then discuss and debate the item and may ask questions of the case officer. At the end of deliberation, I will ask members to vote by a roll call on the officer's recommendation. The council has a convention for major planning applications known as the Adjourned Decision Protocol, where there is a majority resolution is minded to make a decision contrary to the officer's recommendation. A decision to determine the application will then be adjourned and the officers will re prepare a re further report which will come back to a future meeting of this committee. For the comfort of councillors, officers and the public, I may choose to call short breaks during the proceedings. If councillors or officers require a break at any point, please indicate to me and I will halt proceedings at the next convenient opportunity. <clears throat> so moving on, uh, so apologies, I believe we, we just got Councillor McQueen, haven't we? Hopefully we'll join later. Uh, any declarations of interest, councillors? 
Yes, Councillor Thornborough. Um, I'm the ward councillor for Trumpington, but also I attended some of the pre-application <coughs> presentations and also I sat in on the design and one of the design and construction panel um, meetings. Um, and I've also been given a book um, on the flying pig. I haven't read the book and I, I don't believe, I've not been involved in any discussions with the developer since the applications have been submitted. So I feel I feel that I'm unfettered in joining in this application. Thank you for that, Councillor. Uh, I think next was Councillor Pora. Hand up. Uh, thank you, Chair. And um, as Councillor Thornborough, I previously mm -hmm. received a book which I think we all declared at the recent DCF on this, so same. For the other item, the major St Matthews Centre, just wanted to confirm that I have worked with my open spaces hat on, um, as Lib Dem spoke for that, with um, that Petersfield group, but we very deliberately did not discuss this application in any way, so my discretion is unfettered. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Bajant was next, I think. Chair, I take your part in some previous discussions on this development um, hasn't affected my view or, or made up my view and I am a member of the Cambridge Cycling Campaign. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Page Croft. Thank you, Chair. Um, my uh, son-in-law is a musician and has played in the Flying Pig and my daughter goes to the Flying Pig pub. Um, I also received a book um, about the flying pig, which I haven't read. I will read afterwards the history of it. I did do a site visit yesterday just because I wanted to clarify something <laughs> about inside the flying pig, um, but my decision is unfettered and I really, I don't know the landlord and the landlady at all. Um, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Any more declarations of interest, Councillors? Yeah. Well, so, I received the book uh, like everybody else. But... Thank you, Councillor Turnercliffe. So, um, um, Keith, this matter of receiving a free copy of the book priced at £15 online, is this a matter of any concern, Keith? Uh, no, I don't feel that's likely to influence uh, committee members, whether they've read it or not. I mean, if anybody has got um, clear concerns, then it's open to them to exercise their judgment and, and stand back from the debate and the decision process. But I leave it to individual members' conscience. So um, it, it may seem a minor item, councillors, but I too received this book um, some time ago. Uh, I put it in a pile of papers and never got round to reading it and I still have it and did mean to return it, in fact. And when I discussed this with a couple of friends, they thought I was slightly mad, but I do work very hard not to receive any free gifts in any capacity whilst a councillor at Cambridge City Council. Um, so it did rather um, conflict me. But I do feel that we do receive pamphlets and brochures from developers too, which probably cost similar amounts of money to produce. And I do not feel conflicted myself. I have not read the book. Um, so, and I did mean to return it, but never got around to it. So, um, uh, I think we're okay on that, as as we've also had a the, those comments from Keith, our legal advisor. So, hopefully, that's clear to the public watching and to um, both the applicant and uh, anyone else interested in this. In that case, let's move on to the application itself. Then, so this is item five on the agenda. 104 to 112 Hills Road. Um, are we able just to review the minutes? I think they're oh, appended to the. Did I miss that item? Oh, item four. Item sorry. Four, you were chair. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Minutes. Can I can I sign this as a true record, councillors? See nodding. Yes, thumbs up. Okay, thank you. That's for that, James, for that reminder. So yes, so moving now on to item five, the item I just said. Um, now speakers, we've got. A few. Um, I see that Alastair Cook has been crossed out, so in that case we have four public speakers, is that correct James? Arthur, Luke, Frank? Yes, I will be, um, I have a statement to read on behalf. Yeah, that's, that's acceptable. In that case, those four speakers I've agreed will share uh, 10 minutes to speak in total. So if you could kindly keep an eye on that, James, and obviously make an allowance for any 
um, changeovers in speaker in terms of a few seconds, stopping the clock or adding a few on at the end, whichever seems the best way for you to do it. Then we have the agent, Jonathan Bainbridge, who will have 10 minutes as well to speak, and he's been advised of that, um, I think on Monday, when after chair's briefing, so he has had time to prepare. Uh, then we have three city councillors, Richard Robertson, Mike Davey and Dan Somerville, and possibly Councillor Johnson too, I'm not sure. So, uh, let's get going on the um, presentation. So, uh, Phil, you were there to present the item? Yes, uh, Councillor, oh, Mr Chair, okay. thank you. OK, so if you want to share your screen to present and please use your laser pointer if you can, Phil, um, yep. as it's easier to see. Thank you. Can I just check you can all hear me OK? Yes, that's fine. You're a little bit quiet, but that's fine. I can hear. So just before you start, Phil, I can see Councillor Green, you seem to be outdoors. Are you? Um, you're able to hear OK, are you, and take part in the debate? Yeah, I'm in the botanics. I'm just out on site. So when you start talking about it, I can see exactly what you're talking about. But it's lovely and quiet and I can hear you crystal clear. OK, that's a novel approach. Is that there's no problem with that? Um, Keith, Barbara, is there being on site listening to the meeting? Um, no, I, I it's novel, as you say, but yeah. um, I, I can't see any problem with it. Right, let's go ahead then. So, um, Phil, uh, back to you. OK, uh, just check everyone can see the presentation. We can, thank you. Right. So the application relates to land at 104 to 112 Hills Road, Cambridge, with reference 20 slash 03429 slash FUL. H hang on a minute, Phil. Sorry, just stop a minute. So two things. Firstly, I can hear some sort of noise in the background. I think it might be Councillor Green. Have you, oh, you've muted now. Someone wasn't muted. And the second thing, Phil, can you make the image uh, full screen? Oh, apologies, yes. yeah. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank so you, that's great. The proposal is to demolish existing buildings and erect two office buildings with basement level cycle parking, car parking and other facilities. It is also proposed to refurbish and remodel the flying pig, which will involve partial demolition of the existing building and construction of a basement and new pub garden set within a new public realm. The proposed development has been assessed as falling within the remit of the town and country Planning Environmental Impact Assessment Regulations 2017. Officers are satisfied that the environmental statement and other additional information provided complies with the 2017 EIA regulations and that sufficient environmental information has been provided to assess the environmental impacts of the proposed development. The site is 1.07 hectares in size and is located on the western side of Hills Road, so that as you can see on the screen outlined in red, Hills Road running through here. It's adjacent to the Tannic Gardens to the west and south of the site as well. The application site is located within a controlled parking zone and is around 500 metres walk from Cambridge Railway Station. The railway Station being here, this is Station Road running through here. And the site is well connected with cycle paths, footways and bus stops. There are a number of existing buildings on site, the majority of which are poor quality and detract from the character and appearance of the area. So Betjeman House, Francis House, Ortona House and the car park to the rear of Francis House, so this building here. Will all be demolished. The application site highlighted in red on the screen in front of you lies in the New Town and Glisten Road conservation area. The immediate street scene of Hills Road 
uh, has a mixed character range from two to three storey terraces to taller office buildings. So this is the site here, there's two storey terraces opposite, but also as you come just further north of the site the, to the junction with Station Road, you can see Cat House and obviously Botanic House, which sits immediately north of the site. The character of the wider conservation area is similar in this regard, including residential terraces through to large scale offices, such as, as I've said, Botanic House and those within Station Road. So these are typical terraces within the conservation area on the bottom right, and then the more large scale office buildings, as you can see on the bottom left. And the Botanic Garden is also an important area of open space within the conservation area. The two office buildings are set back from the road frontage and read as a pair. In terms of the elevational treatment of the buildings, a slightly different approach has been applied to the colour and pattern of the brick cladding of buildings B and C. The so building B here on the left and then building C on the right. Building B is clad in the buff brick with vertical emphasis. Again, the close up as you can see on the left here. And building C clad with a more horizontal red brick. Flying Pig Public House will be refurbished, including partial demolition of the existing building and erection of a part single, part story rear extension and basement. So that's the existing site layout you can see there, the building itself, and then the pub garden in this area here. And these are comparisons of the existing elevations at the top of the slide. So the east and south elevations, east being the front, and then the proposed elevations on the bottom section. You can see this is the area of the pub that will be demolished and then extended at the back here. Lee, the other west and north elevation showing comparison of existing at the top and proposed at the bottom. It is part of that development is to use a matching brickwork and slate tile to, to match the existing building. And the existing pub garden will be repositioned to the south of the public house. So CGI here showing the remodeled pub and the pub garden sitting the south of the building rather than it currently does to the west. So that's the summary of the proposal. I'll now move on to key material considerations. Uh, firstly, the extant planning permission. The extant planning permission was granted in August 2007 for a mixed use development, including offices, which is Tannic House, 156 dwellings and a substantial demolition of the flying pig. Subsequent permissions were granted for phasing the development, phase one being Botanic House and phase two, the residential element in 2008, and an extension of time to implement the permission in 2010. The permission has been implemented by virtue of the construction of Botanic House. The applicant has sought legal advice on the matter of the implementation of phase two of the planning permission, 060552 FUL, which is the original permission, and the council's legal advisors have reviewed the applicant's position and have considered the matter afresh and are of the opinion the planning permission remains extant for the applicant to build out. The, the permission therefore provides a fallback position for the applicant. So the so next material consideration, the principle of development. The application site forms part of the site allocation M44, which is on the screen here. And in this location here, and it falls within an area of major change, an opportunity area that's identified in policies 21 and 25 of the local plan. Both these policies support regeneration of land and policy 21 also identifies specific land uses for the allocation, which include class A uses, class B office and residential. The proposal therefore conflicts with this element of the policy 21 as it does not provide a residential use. The MPPF and policies within the local plan recognise the importance of providing a good supply of land for both housing and employment. The councils can currently demonstrate a 6.1 year supply of housing land for the 2021 to 2026 period. Now uh, that's a recent update uh, which was published uh, last week. 
the housing trajectory for Cambridge also forecasts that the overall housing target will be exceeded without delivery of the housing approved on this site. This demonstrates the provision of housing within Cambridge is robust and does not require delivery from this site. In supporting the economy, the local plan states that Cambridge's excellence in the fields of research, higher education and high technology uses will be promoted and that maintaining a good supply of employment land is essential for Cambridge's economy. Policy 40 supports the development and expansion of business space, particularly in locations where there is a strong demand, and this is one such location. Therefore, despite the conflict with land use is set out in policy 21, the principle of a comprehensive employment led regeneration of the remainder of the allocation complies with local plan objectives for regeneration and meeting the demand for employment land to support economic growth within this part of Cambridge. The viability of the flying pig. Uh, policy 76 of the local plan recognises the importance of protecting existing public houses and the proposed works to the flying pig have attracted a significant level of objection. Whilst the proposal will alter the flying pig, the existing facilities are to be reprovided within the proposed development, which is considered to allow the pub to continue to operate in a viable manner. Design and visual impacts. The design of the office buildings has been approached on the basis of a 360 degree frontage. The hard edge of the road frontage associated with the existing buildings and extant planning permission will be replaced with buildings which are set further back, apart from the flying pig, which retains its prominence in the street team within an enhanced public realm. So this image shows the extant planning permission, including Botanic House, with this element of the scheme through here, Ortona House, Francis House, and the multi-storey car park at the southern end of the site weren't part of the original permission. But as you can see, there's a quite a close built form to the back edge of pavement, which carried through in the extant planning permission, creating quite a hard edge to the road frontage. That's a, a street level view giving an indication. So this is Francis House, the proposed scheme through here. And the facade, as you can see, of the flying pig highlighted in blue, just there, and Botanic House in this location here. Whilst the office buildings are taller than the extant planning permission and existing buildings, the visual impact is softened through the increased and variation in setbacks from the street frontage, undulating facades and setback upper floor. So you can see here this orange outline is Francis House, building C proposed here, and then the blue outline is the residential element of building, uh, sorry, of, of the consented scheme, building B sitting in this location here, and then obviously relationship with the Botanic House as built. The, the upper floors here of the building are set back, so that's a section through, but I'll just come on to some other slides to show it in more detail now. You can see there the ridge line of the Botanic House and then it dropping down the parapet line coming down from the proposed, sorry, from the proposed scheme here. These buildings are set back now from the road frontage, the flying pig at the front of the site still uh, against the pavement and, and in a prominent location in the street scene. And that's compared to the, the building line, which was much further forward and hard up against the road frontage. Importantly, Botanic House is retained as a landmark building in Hills Road. So we can see here looking down Hills Road from the north, Botanic House is clearly still the landmark building in the street scene. Building C, just slightly visible, and the flying pig in this location as well, but building B is tucked away and doesn't actually come into view until you start to turn the corner into, into Station Road. The relationship of the built form with uh, the Botanic Gardens has also been designed with a particular focus on ensuring the buildings do not appear as a wall of development protruding significantly above the tree line. And I'll come on to some images from that shortly. The changes to the townscape are considered to be beneficial, particularly due to a removal of poor quality existing buildings, an improved public realm, and new high quality buildings which reflect the more recent 
modern developments such as Botanic House and DB1. It is acknowledged that there will be some visual impacts from the proposal, the most significant of which is within the Botanic Gardens. The proposed development is identified within the environmental statement as having a significant adverse impact on some views in the, the, within the Botanic Gardens, although this is based on the worst case scenario of the winter months and is confined to views in the eastern parts of the garden. Whilst no mitigation is proposed within the site to reduce the impact, the existing tree cover in the summer months does provide substantial alleviation. So the image on the screen at the moment shows you TV. Uh, these are images from the Townscape Visual Impact Assessment that form part of the application, and they are accurate visual representations of the scheme and you can see in the top corner of the location 18 of what that view is that you're currently looking at. So the existing view and then the proposed building B and building C. And that is the, the summer view of that same location with the building C here and building B. Again, you can only just see the, the top of building B there. So the location 21A, as you can see, which is next to the Sainsbury Laboratory in the Botanic Garden, looking back towards the site, the Botanic House here, the existing view, proposed building B, building C, set back in this location, and that's again the winter view, and that's the contrasting summer view. Again, building B now very much obscured by the vegetation within the gardens and building C. Uh, not visible at all. The historic environment, uh, the impact on a number of designated and non-designated heritage assets has been assessed as part of the application. So the dark blue buildings you can see on the screen are the listed list of buildings. So there's Corey Lodge, Royal Albert Homes, the War Memorial, and the milestone I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt um, with your indulgence chair it's come to our attention due to the foibles of teams the piece of software we're using two mobile phone numbers are being displayed so the public speakers who i believe these are attributed to may wish to know that and i have a statement from one who can be read. Um, I'm not sure if you just wish to continue as part of the meeting, but I just wanted to draw to your attention that mobile phone numbers are being displayed. I'm afraid this is outside our control. It's a foible as a team. I just wanted to make people aware. Sorry for the interruption. That's fine, James. Thank you for saying that. Are the two people whose public uh, mobile phone numbers are being displayed, are they um, content with that happening? So um, is now exiting. Oh, uh, I can see one number there, but I can't see any now. If it, I think we'll just carry on, James, with the presentation, and um, we can come back to any problems later. But thanks for that. So sorry, Phil. Carry on. Thank you, Chair. So the, the dark blue buildings, as I was saying, are the listed buildings that have been considered as part of the assessment. The locally listed buildings are in orange and buildings important to local character, uh, the flying pig in lighter blue. The hatched areas are buildings that are detracting from the conservation area. Historic England and the Conservation Officer do not object to the proposals as submitted. Uh, less than substantial harm of a low to moderate level has been identified with regard to the impact on designated heritage assets, which carries considerable weight. However, this harm is considered to be outweighed by the public benefits. These include making effective use of the land through the comprehensive redevelopment of the remainder of the allocated site, removal of buildings which detract from the conservation area, enhanced townscape and public realm, economic benefits, is now joining. In including jobs growth, a net gain in biodiversity, betterment to surface water drainage and improvements to the local highway network for walking and cycling. Transport and highways. The proposal will result in a reduction in on-site vehicle parking and vehicle trips in the peak hour. 
The proposal also provides a significant level of cycle parking and proposes improvements to the local highway network through direct work, such as provision of a Toucan crossing and upgraded cycleway. So in this location here is the proposed Toucan crossing in Hills Road, which will allow access to the segregated cycle access into the basement. The existing bus stop, which is here, will be relocated to here and the cycleway also upgraded. Other proposed sustainable transport initiatives include provision of an electric bicycle scheme of 50 bicycles, which will be free to use for occupants of the building and on site servicing through a bike doctor. A financial contribution of £500,000 is also sought with regard to improving cycling and walking movements at the station, station Road and Hills Road Junction. County Highways officers are in support of the proposal. In considering the environmental information within the environmental statement, the only significant adverse effect identified is to some of the location viewpoints on the eastern side of the Botanic Garden. This is based on the worst case scenario of winter and which will be significantly reduced in the summer as some of the images have been presented. This visual impact is considered to be outweighed by other benefits of the scheme. The material considerations referred to in this presentation are considered to be the key issues in relation to the proposal. Others are set out within the report. The proposed development would bring significant public benefits that accord with and meet the three strands of sustainable development set out in the MPPF and policy one of the local plan. It is therefore recommended the proposed development is granted planning permission subject to conditions, including those referred to on the amendment sheet and the section 106 agreement. Thank you, Chair. Right. Uh, thanks, Phil. Um, councillors, was anybody sufficiently interrupted by um, the intervention there that they need to hear anything again? I presume not, but please speak now if something does need to be repeated or put something in the chat to alert me. Okay, there's nothing there, so I presume that was all fine. Um, those two public speakers whose phone numbers were um, shown on screen, I couldn't actually see them. I could only see plus four, four and then lots of stars. So I wasn't aware of any numbers, but those people could leave the meeting, um, reset their um, uh, whatever you call it, the uh, settings to not show the number, I presume, then come back to the meeting if possible. Um, if not, please alert me now. No, OK. In that case, we'll go to the, the uh, speakers. So the objectors first. Uh, what we'll do is, James, if you can read the um, statement first. I presume it's not very long, maybe a page, is it, James? Not very long. Good. In that case, we'll start with that within 10 minutes and then after that, we'll go alphabetically through the other three speakers who are speaking in objection. And those are in order, Frank Goldthrop, Arthur Kalsazi and Luke Nash, I can't see the surname, Luke Nashat. If so, that's first uh, Frank, Arthur, Luke. So James, if you want to start off then with, and then we'll go to Frank. Uh, certainly, Chair, I'll start the timer. In like, so this is, in late November 2020, the applicant modified their planning application. As a concerned local, I raised concerns about the changes, but some of my comments were not published on the planning portal due to council technical issues. This year, a new technical fault with the portal has made it impossible for me to even view the application. I can access other websites and could access the portal until this year. I raised these problems respectively with planning comments at greatercambridgeplanning.org on 7th December 2020 and with planning at greatercambridgeplanning.org on 25th of Feb 2021. I received any acknowledgments of the faults, not explanations or solutions. I do not know how many other constituents are affected. There are many reasons to reject this application. The fact that online commenting and scrutiny were impossible some locals due to council technical faults, while offline engagement is impossible through COVID, in, is in itself reason enough to reject the application. At the very least, postpone this hearing until the portal is fixed and backlog comments from 2020 to 2021 are published. 
and there's now eight minutes, 47 seconds to go. So Frank, you're next. Thank you, Chair. Um, I trust everybody can hear me. Um, yes. My concern really is regarding the integrity of the local plan. Um, I, I've always assumed the purpose of the local plan is to balance the demands for commercial expansion with the housing provision of our city. Um, and indeed, this principle uh, has been followed to date in station in the Station Road area. When Brookgate applied for their permission in 2008, it included offices, uh, 331 houses and 1000 student uh, rooms, which, of course, um, have had the effect of reducing pressure on the local housing market. So the experience of Brookgate is that that was a mixed use development. So Botanic House was also a mixed use development uh, offices, 156 dwellings, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. At some point, this was lost because the phasing was allowed. I might add that the phasing was under delegated powers. It never came back to committee. What effectively is happening now? And I attended the public consultation and I asked the applicants about the housing element. Um, they smiled uh, and they said, oh, we can get around that. Uh, and indeed they have. And the way they've got around it is basically, uh, and if you look in the, the uh, 2019 housing trajectory, it actually lays it out. They didn't reply to the questionnaires which the City Council sent regarding the housing element. Uh, it's a novel technique not to just reply, but the result was the officers, perhaps not unreasonably, removed it from the housing trajectory. Now, I actually think that's wrong. Um, we're assured that the, that the new housing direct, uh, trajectory will, in, will, will uh, fulfil the uh, city plan for housing provision. But there's no guarantee that other developers couldn't come forward with a similar argument put forward by uh, these applicants, namely, oh, sorry, we've changed our minds and we're not going to do it anymore. This site is in the local plan. I think that is the key issue. And I'll finish to say, uh, councillors, that you all know what the situation is regarding housing for young people in Cambridge. It's impossible for a young couple to buy a house in Cambridge. It's very expensive to rent. The only way young people in our city can get into the local housing market is via uh, either a, a subsidised rent from a housing association or by part by part rent again via housing association. The real issue today is about 61 affordable homes for local people being deleted from this scheme. And I, my heart goes out to the young people in this city who face such an uphill struggle with their housing. And I hope you will take that into consideration today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Frank. Uh, next up is Arthur to speak. Are you there, Arthur? James just stopped the clock. So do you know if Arthur is with us, James? Um, two phone numbers disappeared off screen um, and came back as anonymous. It might be that we can see it here in the meeting, but it's not on the live stream. I have to check that later, Chair. But, um, so I know the, the, the numbers disappeared and rejoined as anonymous, but I don't know if Arthur is with us still. OK, well, Arthur, if you can hear me, we'll have your contribution later. So next, uh, Luke, you're here, aren't you? So if you can speak for your two and a half minutes now, please, Luke. Arthur Kaleski is now exiting 300 new construction jobs per year for five years will be created the applicant's reference is 4,000 construction jobs on site has the one has the annual 100 million pound growth value added the... so, uh, not here sorry can't hear, can't hear. yeah yeah uh, okay so just put the clock back a bit uh james so Luke, we can't hear you very well. You're a bit quiet. And then also, I think the signal was a bit weak as well. So if you could speak a bit closer to your um, microphone and also you sensibly turn the camera off. So if you'd like to start again, please, Luke. Thank you very much. You want me to turn the camera off? Yeah. Okay. The committee report states 300 new construction jobs per year for five years will be created. The applicant's website says 4,000 construction jobs on site. Does the annual £100 million pound growth rate have been seen in the state? Is now joining. Additional jobs, office jobs for Cambridge City. 
trip, trip generation figures at 8011 account for approximately half that number. Logically, they ought to match. How are the other 1,300 odd workers going to get? 2017, agents acting on behalf of the landowners have confirmed the site will be developed in three phases, with housing completions on the residential section expected 2029 to 31. November 2019, a wholly non-residential scheme on this site would not accord with the development plan. April 2020, the council has taken a conservative approach to delivery on this site by making no allowance for housing on the remainder of this site within the planned period. Why? Where's the evidence Cambridge residents have decided since 2018 they need offices here instead of housing? Shouldn't members have more time to scrutinise the Office and Housing Supply reports of GL Hearn, which clearly demonstrate no shortage of office supply in the city? The style and overbearing scale of this is better suited to London than the prevailing character of Cambridge. The proposal still isn't based on any approved master plan as per policies 14 and 21, but thanks for finally acknowledging the policy requirement in November. The future viability of the existing pub hasn't been demonstrated, and nothing that anyone cares about will be retained. Camera doesn't support this application, as you were told in November. We think if it has to close for two or three years, we think that's what would kill it, said Mr Stone. Members, if you approve this application, you will kill the pig and eviscerate the community. Thank you. Right, thanks for that, Luke. So, Arthur, I don't know if you can hear me now. I, I hear... can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, that's fantastic. Good, Arthur. OK, yeah, yeah I, think... I redialed. Um, I don't know what you say, James, but I think about two and a half minutes then, Arthur, if you want to start now. Yeah, about three, three and a half, two minutes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, get going then, Arthur. OK, um, well, um, I fully back what the previous two speakers said about the lack of provision uh, of uh, individual dwellings as promised. Um, it, there really is very little I need to say about it, except that I'm a local resident. And from what I see, there is no need for office space in there at all. And from what I know of the waiting list, uh, for Council and Housing Association housing in central Cambridge. They are enormous, and so I respectfully disagree with what Phil, the planning officer, said about housing delivery being on track. I mean, it may be theoretically on track, but empirically, uh, it doesn't look anything like that. And also, empirically, there is an enormous glut of office space in uh, southeast Cambridge in the station area. So I think uh, granting the application under those in that situation would be totally unjustified. Uh, my second point was that the a period applied for for building works of five years is massively excessive and would cause blight on the area and particularly continuous traffic jams and noise in Hills Road. It's, um, it's absolutely ridiculous to imagine uh, the work being staged over five years. I think if anything is approved, the work should be completed within about 18 months. And my third level uh, or my third point of objection is to the concave shape of the building frontages. That is geometrically and thermodynamically environmentally unfriendly, it wastes eating energy, it is totally ungreen, and uh, on that basis, uh, those buildings should not be approved. So um, with my thanks to the two previous speakers, I very much oppose the application, and I hope the council will not grant it, will not grant it. Thank you. Right, thanks, Arthur. So, um, James, can you confirm that was within the 10 minutes then? That's correct, Chair. There was, um, we've used up nine minutes, there's one minute remaining. Okay, well, the uh, the speaker, um, what's the name? Uh, Jonathan, isn't it? Jonathan Bainbridge. 
the agent, you you have 10 minutes to speak because that was already arranged. So um, if you want to take nine instead, it's up to you, but you have that period of time to speak. So over to you then, Jonathan. Thank you, Chair. Can I just confirm that you can hear me, please? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, Chair, thank you for the opportunity to speak in support of the application this morning. Given the high quality and comprehensive nature of the officer's presentation, I will keep my words as short as I can. But if I may, I'll start with an introduction of our proposals and a response to the climate emergency. I'll touch upon the importance of the Botanic Garden and the Flying Pig to our application. I'll bring the committee up to date on the development needs across the city, and I will conclude by highlighting some key extracts of consultation responses that have been received to the application. Chair, in 2019, Pace appointed a design team led by Simon Alford. Simon is a founder of the Sterling Prize winning architects AHMM, and he is the current president elect of the RIBA. Fundamental to Simon's brief were two points. First is the duty of care that Pace has to its neighbour to protect the tranquility of the Grade Two Star Cambridge University Botanic Garden. And second, developing a scheme which places sustainability and well-being at its heart. We have achieved these goals and we are incredibly proud of the quality of the application and the strengths of the scheme that is before you today. But this would not have been possible without the guidance and feedback from members, officers and consultees, but most importantly, the community. Indeed, it's a result of our engagement with the community that PACE has introduced a third element to Simon's brief, and that's protecting and celebrating the flying pig. And it is without doubt that this exemplary level of engagement has directly shaped the application. And we would like to publicly thank everyone who's been involved in the journey to today's committee. If I may now turn to the climate emergency, the officer report concludes overwhelmingly that the proposal is compliant Arthur with Kalecki. and in many cases exceeds is the requirements. Now exiting. Excuse me, and in many cases exceeds the requirements of the council's own policies. The report presents the scheme as one that is economically, environmentally and socially sustainable. It takes your decision to declare a climate emergency head on. And it really isn't just rhetoric when we say that this development will be one of the most sustainable new build office schemes in Cambridge. But what does that actually mean? Well, it is ultra energy efficient. The building utilizes a passive design to optimize daylight and air quality and it uses almost half of the energy of a building that is built to today's building regulations. Similarly, it will use more than 50% less water, but on the other hand, it will provide a 570% increase in biodiversity across the existing site. And in operation, the building will be entirely free of fossil fuels. Together, these points enable the development to be the first new build office scheme in Cambridge to achieve BM outstanding. And addressing well-being and mental health, the building will be certified as platinum under the well standard. We very much hope that these proposals will set the bar for future development in Cambridge, encouraging others to exceed policy too. Turning now to the flying pig, I mentioned earlier that this proposal celebrates the pig as an integrated part of the master plan. It is a key building in our design and the office space is moulded to draw you into the building. It's designed to preserve the character as a freestanding structure and a key social asset within the campus. In contrast to this, the impact of providing housing adjacent to the flying pig would be profound. If we apply the agent of change principle, the potential for noise complaints would stifle its important role as one of Cambridge's best loved music venues. We want to do better than that. As I say, we're striving to do all we can to celebrate the pig, its people, its Thai free real ale and its music. And this is precisely what the application does. It gives the pig a bright and a long term viable future, which most importantly is accessible to all. The application will maintain the character and charm of the pig. It will provide the same internal and external floor space it has today. It will preserve the main bar in its current form. It will continue to provide accommodation on site and a new south facing beer garden will act as a shop window and allow for pig fest to continue. As we look to implement the works, we will ensure that any period of closure is carefully managed and kept to a minimum. PACE is without doubt wholly committed to ensuring the future viability of the pig. Chair, turning to need next, I'd like to direct members to 8.14 of the officer report. It concludes that the council has identified enough land for housing to provide 5.4 years of supply. 
Indeed, as the case officers noticed last week, sorry, noted last week on the 19th of March, the council published updated housing supply data for 21. Housing land supply has increased to 6.1 years. But in stark contrast to this, there is no doubt that the pressure on Cambridge to provide sufficient quality office floor space remains, and that pressure is immense. 8.19 of the officer report notes the council's own employment land and economic development study. It independently concludes that there is less than four months worth of supply of office floor space. As I've said to you before, our research suggests that this is less than three months. But what is without doubt is that for the council to realise the ambition of Cambridge to continue to meet the be the UK's engine of innovation and success, all of the of the city's needs must be met and the supply of office must rise. And as the most connected location within the city, this site is within the very place that this space should and must be focused. That's why the council itself has allocated it as an area of major change and an opportunity area. Members and chair, to conclude, I'd like to draw your attention to four consultation responses received during the determination of the application. Historic England have stated that the scheme in its current form would be more complementary to the adjacent Botanic Garden and that the commercial use is more contextually appropriate in the sensitive location. Cambridge past, present and future have said that they feel this scheme is a significant improvement and likely the best scheme proposed at the site. The campaign for Real Ale has stated that the plans are better than those which predate them and that PACE has worked hard to address concerns raised during the consideration of the application. But members, I think one of the most important comments is that that's come from the disability panel. They have said that this is amongst the most impressive proposals before before the panel in recent years. The opportunity for such an accessible landmark development is to be applauded, as are the much needed improvements proposed for the flying pig and its surrounding public realm. Members to close, this application delivers significant public benefit. It is an exemplar that is sustainable in an environmental an economic and a social sense, and we very much hope that it will be a scheme that will foster the continued success of Cambridge as a compact and highly sustainable world city. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you for your presentation, Jonathan. Now we go to uh, councillors who want to speak on the scheme. I've got three or four. I'm not sure, we're we'll just confirming that now. So Councillor Robertson, Councillor yeah. Dave, Councillor Somerville, is Councillor Johnson wishing to speak as well? Apparently not. In that case, just those three then. So Councillor Robertson, you're first. Thank you, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Well, I'm here today to oppose this application. Primarily the committee should recognise that the site is in a very prominent location, which requires a much better proposal for its development than this one. There are many ways in which it fails to comply with the 2018 local plan, and I'll deal with those in sections. The first major point to be made is it must be recognised that this is in reality an application for change of use. The extent permission from 2007 established that there should be 156 residential homes on the site. When the 2007 permission was given, it was in the expectation that the whole site would be developed. But in 2008, a variation was allowed permitting Botanic House to be developed as phase one, to be followed by the rest of the site as phase two. This application proposes to renege on that commitment for to build houses. At the time of the of this, at that time, not all of the land now on the application was owned by the applicant. Notably, Francis House was not included. So although the extent permission was granted some years ago, the 2018 local plan reconfirmed the principle that housing should be provided on the site. Reference M44 has been applied to the site and carries the expectation for the 156 houses. The applicant cannot be allowed to completely dump the provision of housing on the site. There is evidence that the office market in Cambridge has become oversupplied, with many existing buildings lying empty, including some large ones on Hills Road itself. 
However, demand for housing is higher than ever. Moving on to sustainability, our policy 28 expects the integration of the principles of sustainable design and construction into the design of proposals. Yet the application is for a building which does not make use of the light and heat from the sun, nor does it have any natural ventilation, and the building would be dependent on air conditioning, and mechanical ventilation. It would seem impossible that the application meets the requirements of the Sustainable Design and Construction SVD for passive design and reduced energy use, particularly with regards to the thermal mass of the building and energy efficient cooling systems. And I would request that the office confirm that this building does not meet those requirements. Moving on to design, policy 56 and 57, 55, 56 and 57 cover this. This is a site of critical importance for Cambridge in a very prominent location. The local plan rightly identifies it as a major opportunity site. However, the current proposals fall well short of the standard that should be expected. Applications are required to respond positively to the context and draw inspiration from key characteristics of the surroundings. Proposals for new development should create a scale and form that is appropriate to existing buildings in the public realm and open spaces. But there are two issues here. The prominent location requires the design of the new buildings to be of high quality, right? However, the scale of the proposed development is too great and would severely harm the setting of the Botanic Gardens, the Grade 2 style listed Botanic Garden next door. The height of this development on this site should be kept well below the tree line of the Botanic Garden and it proposed this for it to exceed it. The proposal is for six commercial stories across the southern part of the site and would have a particularly overbearing impact on the winter garden in the Botanic Gardens. Now this garden is of course particularly well enjoyed in winter when there are no leaves on the trees and the proposal of an illuminated six storey wall of glass would form an oppressive backdrop at that time. The second point is as the site is located in a conservation area it is important to, important to ensure that the balance of harm versus public benefit comes down on the side of the latter. There must be more public benefit than harm. However, the Hills Road street frontage that is proposed fails to continue the character of the conservation area in which it sits. There is an established scale for offices on the west side of Hills Road of four storeys. The seven storey Botanic House building is of course an exception, but an exception can be made for this because of its landmark role at the junction of Hills Road and Station Road. The Botanic House has a degree of elegance in its proportions and, and the, the eight storeys of the proposed development which would be built next door would, would, that would deprive that Botanic House of its elegance. To allow an eight storey wall of offices along Hills Road would, act, would also set a precedent and could lead to destruction of the quality of other parts of this conservation area. Uh, in particular, I'm thinking of near Bateman Street and Norwich Street. The negative impact of the proposed eight storey building on the two storey terrace of buildings opposite on the other side of Hills Road must also be acknowledged. The architecture of the proposed development is, is not appropriate. Rather than providing a varied and interesting response to the sensitive context of the site, the proposal presents a monotonous and overbearing wall of glass that is quite out of character with the conservation area the site is located in. It should be noted that the Design and Conserv Conservation Panel felt that the scheme falls far short of the level of design integrity that could be achieved on this prominent site. Although the retention of the flying pig is very welcome, it would look very odd. A two storey Victorian building with an eight storey 21st century backdrop. It would not only lose much of the re rear of the property, but in the words of the design and conservation panel, it would be appear uncomfortably out of place surrounded by 
low level office planters. Policy 59 um, the requires that deals with the quality of the proposed public realm, and this proposal is very poor. The, de the, de the design should be making a positive contribution along Hills Road, but the undulating spaces between the street frontage along the street frontage are not attractive and are of little public value. Within the site, the two routes across it are of poor value because they would be overshadowed for much of the day and create an unpleasant wind tunnel. The space between the two office blocks is really just a service yard, which means that un an unattractive and utilitarian space would be located at the very heart of the development. As the conservation design and panel felt, there is insufficient space set aside for a coherent and successful landscaping component to this proposal. The tall buildings will mean that the landscaping would have little light and the plants could well fail to thrive. That the, the plantings could be completely reliant on artificial irrigation and vulnerable to any failures in that system. Policy 60 on tall buildings and the skyline requires any proposed structure which breaks the existing skyline, as, as this one would, to be considered against criteria including the impact on the historic environment. The eight storey building B proposed in particular would be cons consistently visible above the tree line. With the listed botanic garden adjacent to the site, it is essential that this heritage asset be protected from adjacent insensitive overdevelopment. The proposed buildings would lead to a partial loss of open sky and an increased sense of enclosure, both qualities of the visual amenity of the Botanic Garden. No mitigation measures are proposed within the site for this impact on, on, due to the site constraints. It should be noted that the first proposal envisaged, an earlier proposal envisaged two buildings, one of 10 storeys and the other of eight storeys but following the intervention of the design and control panel, though it was reduced by two floors in each case. But what we've got in front of us is still a scale which is still higher than the, the uh, heights approved in the 2007 extant scheme approved. The first application on this site was made in 2005 but was rejected partly because it proposed buildings far too close to the boundary with Botanic Garden and also because elements of, a, of it were too tall. The subsequent successful application agreed in 2007 removed a large five-storey building and substituted a block of three-storey houses and a smaller five-storey res residential block. This application before you today seeks to restore those additional floors and even exceed the height of the botanic house. <coughs> it also proposes to locate the buildings close to the boundary with botanic garden, a concept which was rejected in 2005. Basically, the application shows a building which does not fit within the existing landscape and exceeds the established tree line. Then we move on to conservation enhancement of the Cambridge's historic environment in policy 61. And here again, the significance of the heritage assets of the city and their setting need to be recognised, but the application does not comply with those requirements, particularly with reference to the adjacent Botanic Garden. Then there is the matter of the car parking space. This really is in conflict with our sustainable transport requirements policies 5, 25, 80 and 81. To comply with these policies, the site should be entirely car free, apart from provision for disabled drivers. The report seeks to accept many of the failures to comply with policy by stating that the properties, that the proposals are better than the elements of the extent planning consent. Well, this may be so, but this is the point that they failed fail of the failure to comply with local plan policies is just not acceptable. The extent permission was granted in 2007, well before the preparation and adoption of the 2018 local plan, 
and it should be noted that the site was not included in the conservation area in 2007. This was added in 2012 after the Botanic House was built. So there are comments and statements from conservation and English heritage acknowledging that the proposed buildings will harm the significance of the Botanic Garden and the conservation area. But they took the view that because they, the ex extent permissions are worse, the new proposals should be allowed. But to do so would be an error. It's essential that the committee reject this and seek to apply the current policies contained in the 2018 local plan. The 2007 consent does not cover the whole of the site, remember. Uh, the, the site which is seen as a, a single entity in the Hills Road corridor opportunity area. The applicant should recognise that to get permission for the whole site, current planning policies must be adhered to. So to summarise, this is a thoroughly unpleasant and ill thought through proposal. It's an application for change of use to drop any provision of residential accommodation. And this change of use has not been justified. There are big questions about compliance with sustainability requirements. The design does not meet expectations for buildings on such a prominent site. It would result in an excessively large set of office blocks out of keeping with its setting and risking the quality of the conservation area and the listed botanic garden. The proposed 250 car parking spaces is in conflict with our sustainable transport policies. I will leave further analysis of the proposals for the flying pig to my colleague, Councillor Davies, but would state that any view that a mixed development, including homes forming a community on the site, together with the pub in its entirety, would make much more sense than this unwelcome proposal for offices. I hope the committee will reject this application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Right next is Councillor Davey to speak. Uh, thank you, Chair. Can you hear me OK? Yes, we can. Excellent. Um, uh, good morning. My name is Michael Davey. I'm the City Councillor for Petersfield. Um, and uh, Executive Council for Finance and Resources. And I've asked to speak on this application because of the major implications for constituents, both in the ward and across the city. Um, I wish to oppose the application. This is a site of crucial importance for the city of Cambridge, given its prominent location. And the local plan rightly identifies it as a major opportunity site. However, it'd be my view that the current proposals fall short of the standard that we would expect. I plan to refer briefly to issues relating to scale and mass, but will concentrate my comments predominantly on policy 76 and the implications for the flying pig. So firstly, regarding policy 55, responding to context, I would argue that this proposal ignores the prevailing character of the area, both in terms of scale, mass and architectural value. The scale of the development is too great and so would severely harm the setting, particularly of the grade two listed building at the Grade 2 listed Botanic Garden. As Councillor Robertson has already said, the current scale across the southern part of the site would have a particularly overbearing impact on the Winter Garden, which is obviously best enjoyed when there are no leaves on the trees, making the eliminated buildings behind the scale inappropriate. The scale of the development on Hills Road frontage should also be carefully judged. As the Design and Conservation Panel noted, the reconfiguration of the west road of Hill, the west edge of Hills Road is considerable, and the panel feels that the new street frontage needs to be considered as a whole from Brooklands Avenue to Station Road. The experience of walking along this highly articulated frontage proposed needs to be very clear as to where the public realm begins and ends. And so to the flying pig. Whilst the retention of the pub is welcome, it looks ridiculous within its current context. A more sensitive brief that restricts the height of the new development would give much greater opportunity to integrate the flying pig into the development in a more sensitive manner. There are a number of planning policies that should be taken into account by the committee just in relation to the flying pig. <laughs> Policy 61, conservation and enhancement of Cambridge's historic environment. The flying pig is totally dominated by this overbearing proposal and its significance is lost by the poor distribution of the new office buildings. Policy 58, altering and extending existing buildings. 
The proposed alterations to flying pit do not respect the character of the existing building and will seriously undermine the viability of the pub as a business. Policy 62. Local heritage assets. It would be my view that the history of the site is not adequately understood. There is considerably new information regarding the history both of the pub and the wider site and its relevance to the development of the city physically, politically, historically and economically that is yet to be fully understood. And finally, perhaps most importantly, policy 76, protection of public houses. In my view, the economic benefits have not and cannot be protected in the current COVID climate, as acknowledged by the authors of the economic benefit statement submitted in support. No justification for the development has therefore been provided. It has not been demonstrated that the viability of the pub will not be adversely affected. The associated development does not preserve or enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area within which it sits. The proposals will result in a garden area, both being overshadowed within trading hours and deprived of sunlight to detriment of flora and patrons. The design and conservation panel Again, noted the flying pig public house seal still appears to be a fish out of water. This revised proposal provides greater generosity for the public ground level, but does not yet create a setting that makes sense of this leftover fragment of the historic street. The panel remains concerned about the dominating enclosure caused by these large office buildings in views looking both north up Hills Road and south to Drudge Station Road. And finally, to conclude, address the planning officer's comments on policy 76. He begins, it's not just the bricks and mortar which make the pub what it is. The pub is much loved and cherished by local Lego community, not least because of its contribution to the Cambridge arts theme, particularly music. This is due, largely due to the ongoing efforts of the existing tenants since 1997. But the offer, officer then goes on to propose a number of proposals which he considers to be uh, to ensure the viability of the pub. But it be my view that these are as a minimum. They are inadequate and crucially will not work to maintain the pig. And then finally, under 8.35 of the report, a phasing condition is proposed to demolition and construction works, whereby the worst case scenario is likely to be closure for three to three and a half years. And fairly obviously, even if it's not the worst case scenario, how can the pub possibly remain viable if it's closed for three years? So to conclude, this development runs contrary to all the things that the pub, the pig, has been established for. You cannot simply take the pig in isolation and ignore the rest of the development. In addition, and crucially, the flying pig is part of the broader musical community within the city and the region. This not, must not be forgotten, but I fear that in this instance it has. Even during the last year, there are over 70 gigs held in the pub or the garden, all socially distanced. £20,000 was raised through crowdfunding. A CD was released on behalf of the pub. Its role in the cultural health of this city must not and should not be underestimated. Let me refer finally to policy 76 D and E. To approve, the pub, to approve a development, the viability of the public house must not be adversely affected and E the loss, including the associated development, will not detract from the prevailing character and appearance of the area, including whether the building is of merit or has any distinctive architectural features. Being viable and being the flying pig are, in my view, two different things. Closing a pub for over three years in the current financial gap climate is almost guaranteed to affect its viability. The proposals for the interior renovations of the pub will seriously impact upon its potential to hold gigs internally. The proposal to move the garden will not help. This is not a failing pub. As one of my constituents said to me just this morning, leave it alone. The flying pig is completely dominated by this overbearing proposal and its significance is lost by the poor juxtaposition of the new office buildings. I would therefore argue that the application fails on a number of levels, but specifically fails to meet the criteria of policy 76 D and E, and I would therefore ask the committee to reject this application. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. So just to reference information, uh, we've got, as far as I'm aware, one more councillor to speak. After uh, Councillor Somerville has spoken, we'll have a short break before we start the debates, because we've been going for nearly an hour and a half now. So Councillor Somerville, you're a councillor in Trumpington where this 
um, proposal is cited. So would you like to present now, please? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I would like to speak on this application initially as a whole, uh, but focus the majority of my, con my concerns and comments around the issue of the flying pig, because that is the issue that has been raised to me primarily by, by residents. Uh, I do believe that there are some points in favour of this development. Um, Cambridge is a tech hub. Uh, it is one of the leading such uh, cities in the country, if not the world. Uh, I think it is important that we think about the um, green growth as a way out of the economic damage caused by both COVID and Brexit. Um, and this development with its, uh, its ideas and considerations, such as providing flexible office space for startups, does help fit that vision for Central Cambridge. It is looking to replace office space, particularly Betjeman House, which is at end of life. This is a key consideration because the best way to avoid uh, emissions from construction is not to construct things, but if buildings are at the end of their life or are particularly inefficient, then the lifetime savings of carbon uh, over time, can it can be that a new building is better. Um, the environmental standards of this building are a key consideration of the proposal. It will still be standing far beyond 2050 in terms of its design life uh, when we have committed as a country to reach net zero in emissions. So its environmental performance is a key point. Uh, the application is uh, intended to reach BRIAM outstanding. Indeed, it is attempting to exceed that standard in order to ensure that it meets it, which I applaud. Uh, it will have zero fossil fuels on site and strong support for low carbon transport, both in terms of electric vehicles, cycle parking and public transport. I do take the point around um, that one of the other councillors raised around in an ideal world, we would have zero cars on site. Members may wish to explore the uh, how this building fits into that, uh, but I also believe I, I do appreciate that there are commercial considerations that it may be very difficult to provide office space with no parking at all. That's an issue for members to decide. Um, although BRIAM isn't a perfect measure of a building's performance, it's one of the best that we have currently available. Uh, and this, its target would ostensibly put the building in the top 1% of environmental performance in terms of office buildings. That certainly exceeds uh, other proposals for Cambridge and the rest of the country. Uh, in my opinion, this sets a standard we should be demanding for all new development in Cambridge, especially given that many current pr proposals do not even meet this standard. Uh, I'm a little confused by Councillor Roberts comments, uh, sorry, Councillor Robertson's comments around energy efficiency. Uh, my understanding is that a large part of the architectural design has actually been driven by the need to minimise energy use. Uh, for example, incorporating passive shading in order to minimise energy use by reducing solar gain. Uh, however, members may wish to seek clarity on this point, as I do agree with Councillor Robertson that it is a key question and must be answered to member satisfaction before permission is granted. Uh, I'd also express the opinion that the current proposals are much better than the extant consent in terms of the impacts on the Botanic Gardens, the public highway and particularly the Flying Pig pub, which would be almost completely demolished under the extant consent. I do appreciate the other councillors point that we need to also judge this application on its merits and against current policy. However, we cannot ignore the extant consent given both questions remain as to whether it is still valid. So if this application is refused, there is a possibility that that consent could be uh, could be constructed. Um, and I believe that that represents a, a risk to the amenities of the community. So it must be taken into consideration. And in addition, it's likely to be a relevant factor in any appeal. Um, in terms of the concerns that have been raised by by residents. Um, I won't go into these in, in great detail because I think they've been raised eloquently by some of the other speakers, but uh, I'd be remiss if I didn't mention them. The impact on the bot botanic gardens must be considered. Uh, the height of the buildings and how they fit with the area is also a concern that has been raised to me. 
um, the requirement for office space in Cambridge and whether that has changed in a post COVID environment. Um, the world may have changed and, and it, it, my understanding is that most of the assessments were made before COVID hit um, and in addition the requirement for housing. But I don't consider myself an expert on those matters and defer to uh, the judgment of members of the panel. However, the key issue and the overwhelming proportion of comments and concerns raised by the public have been res with respect to the Flying Pig pub. It's on this issue, issue that I'll focus. And when we refer to the pub, um, as Councillor Davy says, we don't just mean the bricks and mortar, um, but those are to be considered. The building's important, the community that has grown up around that uh, building, that institution is important, and the viability of the business is important. The building itself is a valuable and increasingly rare Victorian building that adds character to a conservation area. Um, it, is, it has been noted that while it is not a listed building, uh, Victorian buildings are vanishing from our cities and if we don't seek to preserve them, then we will lose them. Uh, I, I would like to echo comments from the Newtown Residents Association that encouraged us to keep such buildings as a reminder of our heritage, even as we develop modern buildings around them. I appreciate this contrast with some of my colleagues' comments around the incongruity of the having a Victorian building around the site. So I think it's important that members have a balanced view that some residents see that as a, as a positive. Um, the, the Flying Pig is also a traditional and long established public house, not just in terms of its architecture, but also the fixtures and fittings um, and as a, as a space to spend time. Uh, particular concerns that have been raised around the building include concerns around the structural integrity of the building. Um, as well as its suitability as a living space going forward. Uh, members may wish to see clarity in particular about the feasibility of the condition uh, under point 6.9 raised by the conservation officer in your report that the basements be constructed before any demolition work occurs. Members may wish to ask how that is to be feasible without risk to the building. Uh, members may also wish, wish to seek clarity on concerns that have been raised uh, by members of the public to me that the height of the building is insufficient to allow three floors of living space and the current plans are not detailed enough to determine whether this is the case. There's also the aspect of the flying pub and the community around that, particularly the live music community, uh, although it is also a real ale pub. Uh, it's a thriving music venue. The community are desperate to get back into it post COVID and post lockdown. Uh, members will note in particular the letter from the Music Venue Trust describing the Flying Pig as a staple feature of the nighttime economy in Cambridge, contributing to the character and function of the city, much loved by its local community and having a reputation for developing new talent in the local area. Concerns have been raised by members of the public and by my colleagues that the long closure of the business will deprive the community not only in markets, Petersfield and Trumpington, but across the whole city of a hugely important cultural venue. Initial proposals for this venue, uh, or for this application rather, included provision for a temporary venue in Altona House. These were abandoned in favour of the current scheme on the grounds that this minimised the closure period of the pub as both public house and music venue. However, there is now great concern from the public uh, at the officer's report that the venue could be closed for up to three and a half years, even given the condition suggested by officers that building B cannot be occupied before the pub is opened. Um, and this period of closure, if it is so long, would not only deprive the community of a highly valued asset for a considerable period, but also threaten the ability of the venue to re-establish the music scene that it has cultivated so successfully. And finally, the pub is a business. A pub must be a functioning business and I'm sure members will note with concern the declining number of pubs both in Cambridge and around the country even prior to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, an impact that has in terms of the hospitality industry been particularly severe. Um, a long period of closure will also increase the difficulty of re-establishing the pub as a business. People's habits will change and on reopening the pub will have to fight hard to re-establish the customer base. Uh, concerns have been raised about whether the venue provides equal amenity to the existing structure. 
The applicant, on the other hand, argues that while some arrangements are different, the provisions are equal or superior. Uh, while some aspects, such as the provision of disabled toilets, are indubitably to be welcomed, um, at the very least, the changed nature of the building will require a period of adaptation, which would be a further difficulty for the business. I'd also I'd like to, at this point, uh, mention two cases from uh, planning elsewhere that set, I think, useful precedents. So please bear with me, councillors. Uh, the first is the Carlton Tavern in Kilburn. Um, and this established a precedent that a pub could be ordered to be rebuilt in facsimile as a planning enforcement sanction. Now, I'd like to stress that there is no implication whatsoever that there is a parallel between the current plans and what was in the legal demolition of the Carlton. However, I'm bringing it up to demonstrate the scope of the powers available to planning committees. The second case that you may be less aware of is that of the Joiners Arms, um, particularly bringing members' attention to the minutes of the Tower Hamlets Development Control Committee on the 14th of January this year. This concerned the Joiners Arms, which was a noted LGBT venue, uh, and as part of that uh, planning consent, the venue was awarded £238,000 in Section 106 funding to compensate for the community for the loss of the venue during the three-year development. This is included £100,000 for temporary venue provision during construction, the rest being available to fit out a new venue uh, as the old one had been closed prior to the, um, the planning application. In addition, when the rebuilt venue was opened, it was required to be offered rent free for 18 months. So while uh, being a musician is not a protected characteristic, I'm sure members will recognise that live music is of great cultural value to Cambridge, uh, that music and musicians have hit, been hit particularly hard by the uh, impact of the COVID pandemic, and the loss of the venue represents, of the music venue, represents a considerable loss of amenity, and hence why I think there's a relevant parallel with the joiners arms. I'd therefore like to propose three conditions. So if members are minded to approve the proposal, which given the officer's recommendations seems to be a likely outcome, I would strongly recommend that it is subject to the following conditions. First, to protect the structure. We need more detailed plans as to exactly which parts of the structure are to be retained, with the condition to retain as much of the existing structure as possible. For the existing structure to be documented internally and externally to allow reconstruction in, in, fa in, facsimil in facsimile if required in the event of accidental damage. And a condition that if any part of the structure retained in those plans is damaged during construction, that it be rebuilt in facsimile. I'd again like to stress that there is no expectation that this condition will be required to be exercised and the developers have indicated their willingness to accept this condition as an expression of their commitment to preserving the pub. However, public consultation has made it abundantly clear that the bricks and mortar of the flying pub are precious to the community and it must be protected accordingly. Second, to mitigate the impact on the community. Uh, provision must be made to mitigate the loss of amenity of the venue during the period of construction, especially given that that construction period could be considerably lengthy. I suggest the condition of a Section 106 agreement establishing a fund to which community music groups can bid for supports to projects, activities or events that help preserve the live music scene in Cambridge as a whole, recognising the flying pig's value to the whole city, not just the ward in which it sits. I suggest that this fund be sized based on the precedent set by the Joiners Arms, which provided £100,000 in funding for temporary provision of amenities over three years to offset the loss suffered by the community for the loss of their venue. However, I also strongly recommend that this fund be scaled to the length of the closure. The developers um, have stated that the three and a half years they believe is an overestimate, but are unable at this stage to provide, uh, given the stage at which the construction plans are, aren't able to provide an estimate of the actual length of closure, let alone a target to which they're willing to commit. Therefore, if we scale this fund to the length of the closure, such that the total funding is proportional to the time for which the flying pig is unavailable as a music venue, it will offset the loss of amenity in proportion to the impact on the community. 
A key point of this is that the developers may object to a financial commitment that is beyond their complete control, as there is a risk that unavoidable construction days may increase the cost of this fund if it is scaled to the length of time for which the venue is closed. However, if this fund is not scaled to the length of the closure, it is merely passing that risk to the community who in the event of a construction delay will be further deprived of the immunity of a music venue without further mitigation of that loss. I'm sure members will agree that to pass this risk to the community is unacceptable. If there is risk resulting from this construction, it must be borne by the developer. And finally, provision must be made for the rapid re-establishment of the existing business. My suggestion is to apply a condition of an 18 month rent free period for the lease at the beginning of tenancy following reopening, the same as that imposed on the joiners arms. This will enable businesses, the business to focus on rebuilding the role of the flying pig at the heart of Cambridge's live music scene and adapt to any quirks or teething problems associated with the changes made to the venue as part of the construction process. Uh, finally, I hope members will forgive me from diverting from strictly planning matters for a moment. Uh, I'd like to echo the community in recognising the considerable effort and achievements of the current tenants in the thriving community that they have created. Although planning conditions must be about buildings, not individuals, we must recognise that the current tenants have made an irreplaceable contribution to the venue that is so valued by the community. In conversations leading up to this application, the developers also repeatedly recognise this contribution. In addition, while it can't be made a binding part of the planning process, they also made a commitment during these conversations to give the current tenants first refusal on any new lease, and I would like that commitment to be a matter of public record. So in summary, I remind members of my recommended conditions to protect the flying pig. The retained structure of the building by means of a condition to rebuild any retained section damaged during construction. The imposition of a section 106 funding requirement scaled to the length of closure of the flying pig venue and of the order of £100,000 over three years to support the community live music scene during construction work and the imposition of an 18 month rent free period to help get the business back on its feet after closure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor, and thanks to all the speakers. So as I said, we're going to take a break. Um, we've been going an hour and a half already. Um, we and officers need to have regular breaks rather than sitting in front of the screen for too long. I've listened to what the speakers have said so far and I've reassessed the structure of the debate I plan to have with you councillors. Um, I don't want to slavishly follow a set of categories, but from what I can see, and please correct me if I'm wrong or you feel we should change this, but I plan to come back after the break and discuss in this order. So firstly, there are six categories. Firstly, the extent or existing permission in simple language. Secondly, the flying pig. Thirdly, housing, four, sustainability, five, highways, and six, all the other matters that concern this application, like design, beauty, street state, all those things. If you think of anything else or have a little think over the break, we can reassess that, that set of categories. I'm just trying to get the best debate we possibly can without extending it any longer than it needs to be. Um, and councillors, when we do come back and debate, I would appreciate it if you could come to the table on each item you wish to speak on and speak once. And we'll only have returns to the officer if any questions haven't been answered, if that's satisfactory. So it's now 11.36. So if we come back at 11.45, uh, please, let's have a nine minute break. Time to have a little walk and get a cuppa. See you then.
Hi there, chair. Uh, we're still live, just to let you know. So just just go in uh, and continue as you were. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, Liam. So, councillors, if you'd like to come back to the table now, then please, metaphorically speaking, for some of you. Right, councillors, I think you're mostly back now as far as I can see. So um, I'll do a roll call just to check we're all here for debate. So I'll go through it alphabetically as normal. So if I could ask Councillor Bajan, are you present? I'm still here, Chair. Thank you. Councillor Green? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Page Croft? Yes, Chair. Or present, Chair. Councillor Thornborough? Present. Chair. Uh, Councillor Tunnicliffe. Um, I think Councillor Tunnicliffe's camera is on, but maybe he's just popped away from it for a minute. Um, I'll come back to Councillor Tunnicliffe. So when we have these breaks, it's probably, I think, easiest to correct me if I'm wrong, James, if everybody just turns their microphone and camera off, but leaves the connection live so that the live stream continues rather than having to cut the live stream and then re restart it. Yes, what we can do, Chair, is switch between meeting signs, but it's best if, if councillors stay logged in and it's up to the producer to work the magic either. Um, leaving the live stream on um, and the cameras on or switching to a sign. Um. Hi there, yeah, so for four breaks of around 10 minutes, I usually just leave it running um, and just, yeah, and then anything longer than that, then I, I have a slide prepared. That's fine, OK, thanks Liam, thanks for that input. So, um, Councillor Tunnicliffe, you seem to be, I've got your camera on, but I can't see you. Are you with us? He, he was there a minute ago. <laughs> yeah, perhaps he had to leave the camera for a minute. Um, I think I'll, I'll just recap on the list of topics and I can, when Councillor Tunnicliffe, oh, here he is, right. Damien, hello. You're back. Unmute. Unmuted. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. All right. No worries. Thank you. OK, in that case, then, so just to confirm everybody. Um, it's gone again. Oh, you can probably hear the sound noise, but um, this isn't part of the presentation either or debate. So um, just to say that I plan to go through them as one extant or existing permissions on the site two, debate on the flying pig in relation to, three, housing in relation to the item, sustainability for five highways and six, all the other topics. And I've made those topics up mostly in response to the speakers uh, who have raised various issues and also in response to councillors' concerns on this committee. No one's said anything else. So as far as I'm concerned, we'll stick to that. Councillor Thornborough, yeah. I just wondered whether the housing issue could be the second item because it seems to follow on from the question about the extent permission. That's my only suggestion, but. Want to do that if that's, I can see that the opposition spokes is nodding, Councillor Porra, so. Let's do that then. So housing is two, flying pig three. Um, and the only, only other thing to say is um, Councillor McQueen, who couldn't at, um, attend the meeting to start. I can see you're here now, but you won't be able to take part in debates or voting on this item as you haven't heard all of it so far. So you have to wait to the next item before you start, and that could be some time, I'm afraid. And then so, that's fine, Chair. I just wanted you to know that I was here and 
uh, and watching and I'll, I'll be here when the next item starts. Thank Thanks, you, Chris. Chair, Chair where, where does uh, things like um, scale and massing and, and that sort of architectural six, where does that come? Six, um, uh, OK, any any other? Yeah, it's not to demean the importance of it. I consider that to be a very important matter, but I'm just picking up on people's concerns and um, and also councillors' concerns so that we can debate items fully. Um, it seems the best thing to do. So in that case, uh, we'll go to the existing provisions. Councillors, who'd like to speak first? Councillor Thornborough. Yeah. Um... I was doing some homework over the weekend looking at the previous planning applications and one of them is not listed in the officer's report and it's it's its reference number is 10 stroke 0291 stroke FUL and it's for a temporary cycle storage car parking and refuse facilities and it's for it's it was granted permission in June 2010 for two years. So the, the first, my research showed that the, the original consent um, required, one of the conditions was a requirement to build the underground parking um, before the construction of the buildings. And my, then um, my understanding is that the developers wanted to build Botanics House first with, without building all of the underground parking. So they got this two year temporary consent for what is actually the current parking on the site and the current bicycle storage units and the current refuse facilities. But that it was very clear in that approval that it was only for two years and the condition two was at, it was explicit in that the use hereby permitted shall be discontinued and the land restored to its former condition on or before the 3rd of June 2012. Mm. 2012, that's nine years ago. So my my also my my other understanding, and I think what we've been taught, we were taught during um, our training for planning committee was to do with um, with the uh, planning application consents being built out and that there was a, there's a requirement for diligence. So once you start, you there is no end date to when you have to complete your what you've got approval for, but there's a requirement to be diligent. So it seems to me that this this uh, consent back in 2010 was for temporary for, for two years and that the the um, that that was given so that the the rest of the phasing would would start explicitly after that temporary consent terminated but that hasn't happened and there doesn't seem there doesn't seem to be any enforcement taken with regard to that the end of that temporary use so it just seems to me that it it seems almost like a clear message that the the developer has decided not to continue with the development from the, the from the period that that temporary consent was finished. So that's my question. Does that temporary consent imply anything? Thank you. OK, um, thank you, Councillor Thornborough. Let's try and keep our questions succinct, please, so that we get through the debate. Councillor Porro. Thank you very much. Um, like Councillor Thornbright, I've been digging around on the planning portal. So my understanding is that in 2007 it was agreed and the panel at that point, the committee would have balanced the public gain potentially of affordable housing versus the site, the building, and they agreed it. Obviously, the, my concern is the section 73 that allowed the Botanic House to be built because I thought after that, well, they've had a three year extension. So in 2013 that expired. But it appears that because Botanic House was built, the remainder of the site, even though the phasing wasn't completed, has remained extant, which I understand absolutely what Phil is saying in the report. I feel a little bit like that is constraining us significantly and would like to note that if we have other big developments like this, we maybe need to make sure we don't end up in this situation again. The question I have for the officer 
is obviously the permission is extant, but it's not extant for the bit that the developers didn't own at the time. So I think I'm right in saying that's building C. So my question is relating to the extant permission. I understand that we're in this difficult position where it's kind of the extant one is potentially a lot more detrimental. But my understanding is we have some leeway around building C, I think it is, so the one furthest up Hills Road, that that isn't covered by the current extant permission. And I certainly have some concerns around massing and scale of that one that I think um, I would be grateful for his views as to whether the extant permission affects that and whether our decision, obviously we'd add less weight to the extant permission if that's the case. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Borough. Councillor Green. Thank you. Um, yeah, similarly, I wanted to uh, query really, query stroke challenge the assumption that the extant permission um, provides a right in planning for the applicate for the uh, previous application to be built out if this one isn't approved. Um, it's quite significant because if you look at the comments from the conservation officer and the landscape officer, they're premised on the, on that basis. Um, they've both said in so many words, uh, yeah, the scheme's not great, but it's better than what's gone before. And that is in writing in the report. Um, uh, and actually, Cambridge University have made similar comments. Very, there's a quite long section on comments by Cambridge University because um, they are, I assume it's because they're the owners of the botanical gardens and they've made similar comments that they think there could be some negative impacts. The assessments haven't been fully carried out by the applicant, um, but based, you know, comparing with what has uh, seemingly got permission, it's better. So I think it's really important to bottom this out. Um, I don't see any specific comments from the planning officer in the report. I might have missed them, but the comments that I see are from the consultees, the official consultees, um, based on this premise. And so I think we do need more definitive advice about what is extant and um, where the planning and legal background to that. Uh, the, the cases that have been listed um, uh, as case history show that in 2006 an application was approved um, and then in 2009 there was a further application to renew that permission because it hadn't been implemented. So that raises a question in my mind about whether or not the 2006 consent was only valid for about three years and if that's the case does that mean that further subsequent applications were only valid for about three years. There isn't enough detail in the report for us to understand this crucial piece of information. Um, and um, uh, so I think given the importance of whether the extant permission and what aspects of the extant permission um, remain, I think we uh, really there is a bit of a gap really in the evidence and in the information that we've been given, which does cause me concern. Thank you, Councillor. Any more questions on this matter? No, good. OK, so I just want to also ask at this stage, uh, Phil, Sam, one of the speakers mentioned there were technical faults on the website in terms of seeing um, information which relates to this item and others, this um, question of ex existing permissions and other things. So I'll just put that in there at the same time. And also, Phil, if you could just comment on the fact that the current application is um, significantly um, outside the, the line of the extant permission. So Phil, hopefully you could follow all those questions. If you could give a replies to those now then, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. The, the permission the Councillor Thorne Borough refers to, yes, I've just, I've been able to just find that um, and that appears to relate to um, the Botanic House building. And that's 2010, sorry. So, uh, it, sorry, it's not, I'm just, I just haven't been able to find the plans on that, sorry. Just bear with me. But in any, in any event, it's, 
it, a temporary permission um, is 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 that, and then normally what would happen is if it was retained after or seek, sought to be retained after that period, um, an application would be made for, for permanent retention. It's clearly by the looks of it just been left on on the site and um, is is retained. But I don't believe it's linked necessarily in any way to not not being able to subsequently implement that permission or a reference to not being able to implement what was what was due to come. The facility was provided. It was intended, obviously, that it would it would just be a temporary facility. Um, but it, it doesn't mean that that, that, that subsequent phase would have come forward. If that if that's what um, what was due to happen. That's okay, Phil. I mean, they're quite technical yeah. questions. Sorry, I'm just quite, yeah, I quite sure. Well, we can go to Nigel, the planning delivery manager, as well later. So, if you just go through the other questions, please. So, yeah, in terms of the extant planning permission, that that is a, is part of the land that we're now considering for for this scheme. Um, but it might be best if I have a if I share a plan. Are you still looking for the plan, Phil? Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm just just okay. um, going to the. If it's going to be a couple of minutes, do you want Nigel to comment on the previous matter you talked about or hang on? Um, yes, yeah, perhaps if Nigel can just have a have a. Right, planning delivery manager, Nigel Blaisby, do you want to just comment on that previous point that Phil didn't seem too certain about, please? Uh, thank you, Chair. I mean, I wonder if I might ask Sharon Brown. It might be something we need to um, have five minutes to go away and look at, but sorry, Chair, there's a problem with my camera. Um, uh, Chair, it might be something we need five minutes to go away and look at, but I'm yeah. um, Sharon Brown is with us, Assistant Director. I wonder whether Sharon will be able to respond on that point. Thank you, Chair, um, three of you. Um, I think it's really important um, to understand that the extant permission is a material consideration in the consideration of the planning application that's in front of us today. The question would be, say, in an appeal situation, the level of weight uh, to which one would accord to that material consideration, and that would come back partly to the level of likelihood of implementation of the extant permission. Um, this is um, quite a complex area of case law and I'm sure um, some of the members that have been researching this case have uh, appreciated that from uh, from the research that they've done. Um, so that would be something that you know there would be arguments for and against and there would be considerations and interpretations in terms of whether the temporary permission and that situation impacted on that and subject to any further clarification from officers that illustrates that. And I think that is something we would need to take away chair and just come back to maybe a bit later on in the committee if we could. I think it's really important. I think that the main principle in this discussion is uh, yes, the extent scheme is a material consideration that has to be weighed up but there is then the level of weight that you accord to that and that is arguable on, on a variety of grounds. All right, thanks for that Sharon and Nigel. Um, if you need to come back later then let's do that. Phil, are you ready to go on with answers to current questions? Yeah, so I just wanted to show the, the plan. Um, Make it full size if you can Phil and use your laser pointer, thanks.
Thanks, Phil. Can see that now. Thank you. Yeah. So this this was the extent of the extant planning permission, and this is Francis house here and the, obviously the car park behind. Now, for the, the obviously the applicant still has shown, as just said, the option of implementing that permission, but I don't consider they would be able to also implement building C as well as that extant planning permission. Building C would sit in this in this location here, so you wouldn't be able to have both of those on the site at the same time, uh, which I think was the the point raised by Councillor Pora, where where Building C sat in the context of that permission. So you couldn't you couldn't build Building C and still have the extant permission in place. All right, you said that. So uh, can I just check with Councillor Pora? Is that your question, Councillor? Was there anything more to it? I think it was just that. Therefore, we can consider building C, so the bit that's outside the extant permission under the current local plan. Back to you, Phil. Well, build, building C is, as I say, you, can't, you, you couldn't have both. You can't have C and the extant planning permission. So All right. You, you, yeah. Yep. Any more response, Phil? Uh, I think Sharon's covered the comments from Councillor Green about uh, the extant permission and where it sits uh, and the weight it has. I think that was Councillor Green's comments. In terms of the technical faults on the website, um, I think the website does have issues from time to time in terms of availability. But I mean, we've had a number of comments in from uh, the public about this proposal. So I think there has been um, sufficient opportunity to comment on uh, the, the scheme and also access the, the information available. OK, thanks, Phil. Um, Sharon, you wanted to speak as well. I've got a note in the chat from you. Oh, that was earlier, Chair, so I've, okay. I've made my point. OK, thank you. So will you or Nigel or both come back on the previous point you mentioned now or later on in the, in the debate? Sharon. Um, I think, um, and I think probably we, if we can come back on that later on in the debate, that would be really helpful, Councillor Smart. Okay, great, thank you. So in that case, then we'll go on to um, the next topic of conversation, which is housing. So questions on the housing component that was originally provided, but is not provided in the scheme on the table we see today. Councillor Thornborough. Yes, I would really like um, the officer to uh, answer the question raised by um, Councillor Robertson about that we that because there is this extant permission in place, and it sounds and it sounds like that you know if if the whether this application is approved or not, they could implement that um, extant permission immediately tomorrow. Um, does that mean that the the or not, you know, if, if they if they get a different consent and they chose not to, it's it's change of I just wanted to make sure it's is that change of use so we don't have the housing, we don't have the affordable housing, but also the the extant consent includes a community building, some uh, informal open space that's informal open space and also a children's playground. So it's all of those elements that would be um, we're changing from. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Before I go on, um, Councillor Page Croft, you have your hand, your electronic hand up. Um, I presume that's to ask a question on this matter. If you could just just type in the chat, it's much easier for me to follow then. Okay. So do you want to speak next then, Councillor Pagecroft? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I, I agree with what uh, Councillor Thornborough has said about the, the need for the, the 
the housing. Um, I did look on a government website yesterday and it had on there that only 43% of people will actually be thinking about going back to work in their offices. Most of them, the companies are quite happy for them to work at home. So why do we need these offices that are going to stand empty because there's loads of empty offices already around there when we actually do need housing. I went to a, I had a meeting a few months ago about trying to find places in in Queen Edith to actually build more housing. So where they say that we're on target to get the right amount of housing, why are we then looking for these little spots and spits of places to build housing when we've got a perfectly good um site up there big site up there which you could have offices housing children's playground shops whatever you like why does it have to be offices when it was already decided to be a joint development thank you chair thank you councillor um next up i believe councillor green thank you yes um it's, it's another really important aspect of the application um uh, I was um, quite impressed upon by the speakers and um, Frank Gorthrop gave some valuable evidence um, in relation to the housing, um, the lack of affordable housing or any housing in this application and the need for housing. There was another speaker who, who told us of the empirical evidence um, for uh, the need for more housing in the, in the face of data provided by the applicant that shows that we're meeting our housing um, supply requirements in the local plan. And I tend to agree with that. I tend to think that um, the government issues advice on how many houses should be built in the area. But we all know that housing in Cambridge is out of the reach of uh, many people, many local people. Um, I think it's really important that we deliver above and beyond the amount of housing that the government asks us to do. Um, I know that's um, that's not enshrined in our policy, but the empirical evidence is there. So I do find that uh, contribution made by the speaker very, very, um, very Im impressive. And I, I think we also need to, as we're talking about the need for housing on this site, I think it also um, follows that we need to consider whether there is a need for office accommodation on this on this site. And I think the opposite is true. I think there's a lack of demand for office accommodation at the moment. There are plenty of vacant office sites. Whilst we do want to promote Cambridge as a, as a technical hub, as um, Councillor Somerville referred to, and that is important in this location, it's an opportunity area and it's near the station, it's in a sustainable location. I don't think the applicant has got this right. There's a huge amount of car parking around the office that they've provided. I'd encourage people to drive in. Um, and not use public transport, totally negating its fantastic location near the train station. So I am not persuaded that they have achieved a good um, standard of um, de development design um, in regard to sustainability. I think they've missed the main issue about traffic and congestion in central Cambridge. Um, and I think um, whilst I don't agree that the extant permission remains valid and I would regard I would give little uh, weight Councilor, to you're, that. you're swaying off this your sort of agenda here because we, we've done extant already and we're going to go on to highways later so if you just focus on this particular matter of housing that would be good thanks uh, so I'm talking about the need for housing and how that relates to the extant consent because the the extent consent has housing in it um, so the point I wanted to make was that um, I don't um, believe that the extant consent should be given a lot of weight, but I do think that um, how's the need for housing should be given weight. Um, whilst we have seen several applications submitted for this site and they've changed quite radically, we've also seen three local plans come and go. Um, so those previous permissions, in my mind, um, no longer meet our development requirements for Cambridge City Centre. Um, I think we should be, this, this site should have a very generous allocation of housing applied to it and any office accommodation um, which would, um, would come with it should be much more um, 
uh, developed with much more emphasis on the use of public transport. Thank you, Councillor. So if we could um, please try, Councillors, to ask uh, short questions rather than make long speeches. We will get through this in a much better and more efficient way, I think. So my question to you, Phil, is uh, do we, are we able to question the lack of housing in this item on the table relative to the previously item put with housing in? Or is that just the commercial imperative of the applicant and it's up to them to see, you know, uh, apply for what they see fit? So Phil, back to you for answers then, please. Chair. Uh, <coughs> oh, sorry, I missed the councillor. Sorry, councillor Poor, I apologise. I'll try and be brief. So for me, again, it's this issue of waiting. I can understand previous applications, you would wait affordable housing against potentially the massing. And obviously we now have lost that. I understand um, the officer's argument about why, but for me, I think, as I think Councillor Green and Thornborough touched on, it's that balancing thing. We're now through COVID. We know that working patterns are going to change. And I also note that Cambridge assessment moved out of a considerable number of officers pretty well within a few hundred metres of this site that are still predominantly empty and some are quite high quality buildings. So I have concerns about this. The other thing I'd like to ask, and I think the officer will be able to confirm this, but obviously at the moment, an empty office box can be just converted to housing, thus avoiding the affordable contribution. Now, my understanding is that isn't the case for new build. But personally, given the amount of changes the government are pushing through in terms of PDR at the moment, can we, were this to be approved, um, Phil, add in a condition to make clear that if this were to be converted in future to housing, we need an affordable component? I appreciate at the moment the law suggests that that isn't relevant, but we are looking at a lot of changes around the area, so I'd be grateful for a response on that. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And the acronym you mentioned there, PDR, is Permitted Development Rights. So, Phil, can you um, come back then, please? Yeah, um, <clears throat> in terms of the first question, um, yes, the, the applicant could still implement the housing scheme tomorrow uh, if that's what they wanted to do. That's um, the benefit of having the extra planning permission and having had that implemented. Um, obviously, if, if permission were to be granted for this scheme, they would take, they would then have an option for, for either of those developments. So the office proposal or or the phase two of the original planning permission. Um, in terms of um, why are officers needed? Well, um, and I guess against housing, as, as I said in the report, it, there is a balancing exercise to be done here. And currently the evidence is that we are meeting or Cambridge is meeting its housing supply, uh, both in terms of its long term trajectory for overall numbers, as well as its it's five year housing land supply without the need for this site to contribute to that. Um, and that suggests that there is an opportunity therefore consider if there's demand for other uh, land uses such as employment where, where there is demand in this location that that should be given consideration in terms of the plan as a whole, which also encourages economic and employment growth as opposed to, to housing growth. Um, and the, the evidence, the council's own evidence through the economic uh, land review, uh, sorry, employment land review and economic economic development study, which has been published uh, last year in support of the emerging Greater Cambridge local plan, there's there there, there is evidence that there isn't a big supply uh, or excessive supply of office space in this location. There's actually a constrained supply, and that floor space of B1 and BA is actually lacking in this location. So in 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 meeting local plan requirements, it would it would be deliver, uh, delivering on a demand that the local plan says it supports. Um, so that but as I say, there is that balancing exercise. Uh, the question around the the land use uh, query in terms of the residential use not being provided from Councillor Smart the policy does say that uh, it should be mixed use development and include residential. The policy does say that, but we'll, as I said, we're just we're looking at this local plan as a whole and what development is appropriate in what locations. And if there's other demands to be met, 
specifically in this instance around employment, then that um, is is something that uh, is material and significant in this in this in this situation. Uh, in terms of conversion of office space to residential, uh, it is correct that new uh, office buildings built after the 29th of May 2013 don't benefit from permitted development rights to be converted into residential. So you had to have had an office building on or prior to or prior to that date to be able to benefit from converting to residential. So on that basis, if the, if the office were to be built and then a proposal to convert it to residential was to come forward, that would require planning permission and would be subject to the relevant policies, including affordable housing provision. Thank you, Chair. Although just to caveat what you just said there, Phil, you, you didn't actually mention space standards, and I presume that uh, that any residential housing that came forward as a part of any proposed scheme, which is all hypothetical, of course, um, would not necessarily meet our space standards because that wouldn't wouldn't be. Uh, it's not quite termed in the same way, is it, for an, an application in that way? Is that correct, Phil? In terms of the space standards, if it was a convert, uh, it, no, if it was a conversion, then that's correct. It, it would not. It would not be. Um, that's only on the, on the new build. Yeah, that, new build yeah. actually, sorry, I shouldn't really have raised that because it's all hypothetical. Let's talk about the, the thing on the table. Has everybody had their questions answered on that matter? No, Casey Poor, come back then. Sorry, Councillor Poor. I think was I asked whether we could do some kind of condition that would ensure if PDR permitted development rights change in the future, we could ensure that it did come back to planning a bit like we do kind of with, I don't know, what's that article falls where there's certain sites where they have to come back if something changes. Because I, I appreciate this is completely hypothetical and I have no reason to think developer would do that actually, as they've obviously doing this as a high quality eco office building. But I do think, you know, we don't know who might own it in future. So is it possible to protect that if this were to be agreed? Thank you. Phil, can you answer that or Sharon or Nigel even? So those permitted development rights um, wouldn't uh, apply retrospectively, so there wouldn't be a need to have to condition the development on that basis. Right, thanks Phil, good. Now just before I go on, I've, I've noted that Councillor Bajan, you left the meeting and came back again. I presume you didn't miss many minutes since I haven't heard anything about that? Chair, sure, I was just about to report that. I, I, I just lost contact for about 15 seconds. And it was the same speaker, the same subject. It was completely self-explanatory. I missed nothing. Normally, that period of time isn't isn't considered to be uh, a problem, so that's fine. Thank you very much, Councillor, for letting me know that. Um, in that case, if there's no more debate on that matter, we'll go to three, which is the flying pig and implications for that public house on the site. Speakers, please in the chat ideally or hands up if I can see them. Uh, Councillor Green. Thank you. So with regards to the flying pig, um, I, I'm, I'm, I hope I'm right in understanding that the pig themselves haven't object, the flying pig themselves haven't objected to this application. It's camera who are now objecting on their behalf, seemingly, well, sort of, um, you know, independently really but um uh the physically i think the the development does does um dwarf the flying pig and that does from one perspective seem um out of context but in, from another perspective i think it's a bit it is quite endearing in that you know you've got this old building and it's been it would have been clearly preserved by the new new development going in in around it um so I think they would benefit in the long run from the additional um, trade that would be generated by having this whopping great development right near them. And so I can understand if they're no longer pursuing, actively pursuing an objection. Um, I didn't agree with the um, comments this, when, when Councillor Summerbell was speaking about the Section 106 contributions, purely because, <clears throat> you know, I got into um, 
got no reason to disbelieve the issues about the uh, pub that he referred to in London that received compensation via a Section 106 agreement but, um, because of closure and trade being affected. But my understanding is that that's not a normal kind of use of Section 106 um, funding, um, that it, they're heavily constrained by um the, the law in the Planning Act and it has to be um, perfect. Um, Section 106 money is to deliver things that are necessary to make the development um, uh, um, to be enable it to be approved. Um, and I can't see that compensation um, would be uh, would meet those meet those requirements in this case. Um, and he talked a lot about conditions that could be applied. And again, I thought um, we do sometimes apply conditions um, on this planning committee or suggest new ones, but we rarely do because obviously we're looking at the application in front of us and what's been recommended by the planning officer. We're not at liberty to in include very many conditions very often. So I think the, the issue of the flying pig seems to have resolved itself. It doesn't seem to be such a major issue now as the scale and massing and the impact, the environmental impact. I hope I'm right in saying that, but please correct me if you believe there is a still a live objection from the flying pig themselves. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Green. I seem to have lost lost um, camera pictures of all the councillors, but I can still hear people speaking. So I don't know if that's the same for everyone or just me. Uh, if you switch off of um, uh, the one of the gallery, so if you go back onto gallery mode, uh, that will fix that. There's an issue with uh, large gallery mode right now. I, I don't know why, but there is an issue. Um, All right, for that, Liam, um, producer. Um, some pictures are coming and going, but as I say, I'm not missing anything of the meeting as far as I can gather. So um, is there a next speaker? Yes, uh, Councillor Poor, you're next. I think Councillor Pagecroft was before me, Chair. Oh, OK, Councillor Pagecroft. Thank you, Councillor Poirier. I've, I've got a few uh, questions and queries concerning the pig. Um, I went for a site visit yesterday because I'm quite concerned about where are they going to put the disabled toilet? Um, because there's a few steps down from the main room down to the, the cellar area where the cellar area is going to be. And I presume that's where the disabled toilet is going to be. Um, and what I wanted to know is, um, are they going to keep the, the wooden floor that's in the main pub at the moment because that is actually part of the quirkiness of the pub? And also I'm quite worried because the front facade is actually made of um, wood and wattle and daub. So is this going to be able to take the weight of the roof because they're going to make the roof bigger so that they can put the bedrooms up there? But there's no plan for a dormer window to make the room bigger. So. Um, I want to know what um, what 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 they're going to do about preserving the front of the the frying pig because it is quite delicate, um, and also um, the little tiny wall they're going to be putting in the garden. That's not good for when they do their charity things I've heard, heard yesterday. They like it to be inclusive, so they like a big wall. And could we make that an acoustic wall so it doesn't affect uh, the the hotel across the road, so no noise goes over there when they have these things in the, in the garden for charity, because they do quite a lot of work for charity. Um, and the back wall. Now, the back wall in that pub, I've never been in the pub before, but it's got a wonderful back wall there, which is glazed and it's a door and it belonged, I think it was put in by somebody in the 1950s, something to do with a rock band he played in. Now, that is a beautiful, beautiful window and I would like to know if that can be preserved in the new design, in the round design at the end there. Um, a disabled parking, is there any disabled parking? Um, there's, it's going to be, where are they going to put the garden now? They're going to get no light in the garden. Where it is at the moment, they will do. Um, and also, I want to know about disabled parking. Did I say that? Sorry, I've got so many bits here I'm looking at. Um, and that's about it at the moment. If I think of anything else, I'll come back. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, OK, right. Before you want to come back, if you have any other um, points to make, try and make them in one go. I'm not speaking to you only, Councillor Pagecroft, to all councillors. So if really? you put no. points no. in one go, we'll get through it in a more efficient way. Thing. The wall is a flint wall and it's an old, old wall. Could that be, if they're going to move the garden to the side, could they not use some of the flint and the brick from the old wall to make it look a bit more, more quirky? 
Thank you. Right, thank you for that, Councillor. Very good. So, Councillor Pora, you're next. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I was quite interested in the S106 proposals that Councillor Summerbell mentioned. I've read something separately in the paper just about different pubs being preserved. So, again, I'd really appreciate the officer's input. And I must admit, I suppose, if the developers are obviously very committed to the flying pig, and I appreciate that they have done what they can to move the building line back and give it some space. But this idea of the viability for me is quite concerning, particularly that there doesn't appear to have been an offer of somewhere else for them to locate temporarily, which apparently was in a previous uh, planning application. So again, be grateful for officer advice on that. I also had a request, condition 46, which is the one that talks about the phasing of the flying pig needing to be substantially finished. I would be keen for that to be a little clearer to actually read that the pub should be usable as a pub. I appreciate that substantially completed is a planning term which has its own um, references but for me I would like that to actually say in effect that the pub needs to be fun able to function as a pub because I think that makes it clearer that it would definitely be returned to that use uh, mm. and strengthens that condition so I'd be grateful for the officer's view on that. Um, Yes, sir. I think that was everything I had to say. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Porra. Councillor Thornborough. Yeah, yes, um, I, I don't know whether I can raise conservation issues here as well as the flying pig, because it, it seems that this the flying pig is an, an important part of the conservation area and the the conservation area. This is is important and uh, it's integral, and I, I do, I do fit the uh, some can, of the yes, people please. picked up about um, the comments from the conservation and design panel comments about the flying pig, and one of the things that they said is more could be felt that they could more could be done to enhance its setting and strengthen its presence on the street. I do feel that the what what is left does seem to be a bit like a, a kind of Disney World. Um, token tokenism about um, a cute little let's have a cute pub and in front of something which is radically different and um, I'm I do have concerns about the 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 setting the pub being retained in this setting and whether it does preserve and enhance the conservation area here yeah I also wanted to question Ortona House is that a building of interest? It was also pale blue on the map and it's next to um, the pub. And but it, the officer didn't um, mention, didn't refer to it when he did his presentation. So is that a building of int historic interest? Thank you. OK, I hope you managed to keep up, Phil. Lots of questions. So Councillor uh, Bajans. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just rising a slightly different angle to the question of, of the pig. Um, this building is of historic value to Cambridge, whether it is hugely historic or whether it's part of the conservation or not. It's of only interest because it belongs to Cambridge and it be belongs to the people of Cambridge, so to speak. It's part of our infrastructure. And I'm wondering, is there any way that is it worth a consideration of not allowing it to be changed at all? And that so that it can stay as it is the pig. Because if we're going to change it and we're going to move it around and it's going to be changed about, then what purpose is keeping it? I'm not saying that's an opinion. I'm just asking a question, if that makes sense. I'm really far from making up any decision about this because this is important, but I do believe if you're going to save something of this stature, then we should talk about actually saving it. And if we're going to pull it down and change it all around, what's the point? It, or is there a point? That's a better question. Is it? Point? Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bajant. Uh, so, Phil, my questions relate to the viability of the flying pig. So uh, often when we get to planning items on the table as it were in planning committee, all negotiations already happened. 
but I'm not quite clear if you could just sort of just talk a bit more about um, what might be possible um, at this meeting. So um, in terms of the viability of the pub, I mean in terms of being closed for a period of time and what is that period of time? Because uh, periods of three, four year, years have been mentioned, but also two years, I think, is in the report. So the period of time would be useful to know. Um, also, the possibility of the applicant supporting the flying pig put during the period of it being closed. So is that possible? Is that something we could condition in this application? And uh, yeah, all of those things that have been mentioned really, uh, what are the constraints that we're, we're lying under in terms of what we can, we can achieve at this committee? Because I think we all agree, we don't want to lose a building of local interest and also all of the activities that happen within it if it can be possibly avoided. So Phil, back to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, yes, lots of questions on, on the flying pig, understandably. Um, in terms of, I'll start from the top, the queries about uh, objections from the, the landlords. I'm not aware of any objections um, from the landlords. Uh, I wasn't aware of, of an objection, particularly from camera either. Um, in terms of uh, the compensation that Councillor Green referred to, yes, um, quite rightly referring to uh, the SIL tests and whether any uh, obligations in that regard meet the SIL tests and um, that is something that we would we'd have to consider if members are minded to look at additional compensation as perhaps suggested by Councillor Somerville and then just touched on them by Councillor Smart. Um, but I, in terms of uh, the disabled toilet location, uh, just let me share my screen and I'll go on to that. So can you see the plans? Yes, we can see them, thanks Phil. Yeah, OK. So this is the ground floor plan of the pub. The accessible toilet is in this location here. And the route to get into the pub is through these gates and then through this door. So that would be the level access available to uh, anyone requiring the accessible toilet. So that's all on that is all on the same level. So it won't be in the basement. There's other toilets and facilities, as you can see on the left hand side in the basement kitchen storage areas um, but know that the the accessible toilet is in this location here at ground floor level uh, in terms of retention of the the bar area etc yes that is proposed to be retained and there is a condition about uh, sorry a, an obligation within the when within the um, Section 106 agreement to record and preserve those elements that aren't obviously personal possessions to the existing tenants to be um, retained and pres preserved in, in the revised layout of the flying pig. So there is obligations there to deal with that to deal with that matter. Um, and similarly, the front facade again is proposed to be retained as, as part of the proposal. Um, I note that there's obviously comments from Councillor Somerville about a possible condition and we uh, we do have a condition about a structural monitoring system within the proposed conditions regarding the regarding the flying pig. Um, but it may be that we need to look at a, a further condition around a structural report that gets submitted uh, prior to commencement of any works. So we have a full detail of of the structural condition of the building, um, but that's something that our members may wish to consider. In terms of the wall uh, around the flying pig, yes, there's been, uh, there is again a condition about details of this wall to be submitted and agreed. Um, we did have discussions with the applicant about this during the course of the application and 
we feel that it, it needs to act as an acoustic barrier to to uh, patrons in the garden. And currently it's proposed that that wall would be at least 1.6 metres tall with a possible uh, further um, barrier on top of that to a, to a total height of about 2.25 metres. Um, the, the exact makeup of that wall uh, we're seeking to get agreed by condition. So that would, uh, touching on uh, Councillor Pagecoff's point about acoustic performance, yes, that is the intention that we, we get further details on that wall so it does act as an acoustic barrier. Uh, within 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 the pub garden. Similarly, the um, the details of uh, the existing wall and re referencing the brick and flint um, construction that it currently is, that condition, the same condition about the wall, has included reference to uh, being able to salvage some of that material if if practicable in in reconstruction so yes we have um again referenced that in in the in the condition uh in terms of disabled parking uh the, the parking there's no parking at a uh, street level for for the flying pig uh there is there is a drop-off area in this section here which would allow uh cars to set down and and drop off but there's no there's no on-site parking at street level. There, there's parking for the flying pig itself in in the basement. Being uh, so is now basketball. joining. So in, there is so there is a um a, a parking yeah, space available there. In, in, the, in, the uh, in terms of the table parking, um, the parking that is there's no parking at uh, street level. Sorry, I'm getting feedback, councillor. Uh, there is, there oh. is a drop-off area. Is now exiting. Oh, that's better. Sorry, I had some feedback there. Yeah, okay. In Councillor uh, Pora's points, uh, Section 106 agreements, um, again, in terms of what other planning obligations may or may not be possible, uh, we would have to look at some discussions with, with the applicant around whether there was a proposal for um being able to look at further further planning obligations um and the viability due to its closure uh the 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 point around substantially completed in in the phasing condition uh i understand that and as you said it, it, it's a point really that stems from um enforcement really in terms of uh, buildings not not being substantially completed and, and requiring buildings to be, if, if necessary, substantially completed. Um, there is there is an obligation, though, uh, proposed for the applicant to provide uh, all the extension works uh, and internal fit out as part, as a, as a sort of planning obligation. So a turnkey solution, essentially, um, as as part of the proposal. So I think that would cover that point in terms of making sure that it is actually fit to be used as a pub, it's it's an obligation on the applicant to make sure that that is the case. In terms of uh, the conservation issues that uh, Councillor Thornber raised, uh, this is a, a non-designated heritage asset, so it doesn't afford the same weight as as designated heritage assets, although it is located within the conservation area, um, and. I, I understand the points around the direct impacts on the building and that it does cause a degree of harm to to the building itself and the introduction of obviously the commercial buildings uh, which affect its setting. I think in terms of the point around uh, its contribution to the street scene and its presence, I think that the, the, the initial proposal was quite a low wall on the frontage and really the building itself was the most prominent, but I think with regard to increasing the scale of that wall, that will will improve its presence within the street scene and give it uh, give it some some more prominence, uh, rather than as you say, feeling like a bit of a leftover piece. But equally, um, the buildings that the surround this structure currently are buildings that detract from the conservation area. So you those buildings would be removed, and I think uh, there's a there's an argument to say that there is more there's there's a lack of cohesiveness within within those buildings, and there's, there's 
a much greater cohesiveness with the proposal as it stands, albeit that um, they are the buildings are increasing in scale. Uh, and uh, Otona House, yes, uh, that is not a building of any significance. I think the building that was on the, the presentation was the former Osborne Arms pub, which has subsequently been removed. Ortona House is next to that, but that doesn't have any uh, historical uh, or architectural significance uh, in the conservation area. In terms of Councillor Bajan's point about the pub staying as it is, um, that isn't the proposal before members. The proposal is to um, alter the pub and create uh, buildings behind it, but as the, as the scheme as submitted stands, that wouldn't be possible. The, the pub is to be retained in its form as proposed with, 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 the, with the alterations um, that have been put before you. And also, I think it's important to refer back to the extant permission on that point. The, the extant permission didn't seek to retain the building as a standalone building. This, this goes significantly further in keeping that building presence within the street scene, much more so than the extant planning permission did, which only retained the facade stitched around uh, a new modern residential scheme. In terms of the viability, I think uh, Councillor Smart's point, yeah, again, this is a point that uh, obviously we've been touched on by Councillor Somerville and, and what if any compensation is is or reasonably due what for the period of closure. Um, the period of time based on the construction program that's been submitted with the application appears to be around three to three and a half years, as, a, as I said, a worst case scenario. Um, uh, whether that um, detail could be refined through the phasing plan uh, or phasing condition uh, in more detail once the, the applicant's, applicant's got a better idea that, you know, that could could alter and, and could improve. Um, but at the scheme that's put forward at the moment shows it would likely be that sort of that length of time. And in terms of, as I've said, I've touched on the additional conditions or, or planning obligations. Uh, it's something that I would have to probably have a, take some advice from um, our, legal, our legal advisor and the extent of what members were considering was a, was perhaps necessary in that regard and, and making sure that that met the, the seal test. I think that's the, all the points, Councillor Smart. OK, thanks, Phil. So um, Keith Barber, the legal officer, do you want to comment now on that matter or do you want Phil to answer some more comeback questions and then come back later on that? Yeah, can I can I comment now? Um, yeah. Good. What, I, what I would say, Chair, is that we keep an open mind to the possibilities of of drafting an appropriate planning obligation in relation to those matters concerning the flying pig that uh, Councillor Summer, Summerbell uh, brought up and have since been pursued this morning. So let's keep an open mind and perhaps look at it again when we uh, just before you come to the vote. Does that help? That's fine. So look, councillors, I can see you want to come back on maybe some questions that weren't answered or maybe more questions. I think the way it's going, we may have to have another break before we finish with this item, but not now. But I, I reckon about another quarter, half an hour or so we'll go for. And if we're not finished, we may have to have a break then again. So uh, Councillor Page Croft, you want to come back? Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to forward that the, the landlord and landlady are actually tenants of the applicant and they are not allowed to comment on anything to do with any alterations or anything to do with the flying pig. I just thought that ought to be out there so this is why there's been nothing from them and also um, they, they've been paying, I know it's nothing to do with planning, but just to put some something out, they, they, they've been paying the applicant full rent for, for the flying pig for the past year. So, you know, they're really on their uppers now. They they have no income coming in at all. So surely we should be trying to do something for some of our um, 
huge people. You know, they would. I mean, if if this, if this pub is closed for another three and a half years, and the way it's going to be built, who knows if they want to come back in because they're going to be overshadowed, and it's going to take a long, long while for them to build the the music scene up again. Um, I just think we should be a bit um, gentler to them. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And I do concur with your comments there. And I was disappointed to see that the uh, flying pig has been asked to pay rent for the last year by the applicant. It, mm. it, it's not a good look. And also, perhaps just to add to your questions, Councillor Pagecroft, I wonder, Phil, if you know whether the applicant, sorry, the flying pig has been asked to sign a non-disclosure agreement with the applicant. So um, just going forward with the next speaker, which is Councillor Thornborough. No, I don't think it's me. Oh, you've done already. OK, it's been ticked. I see. Councillor Bajant. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I, I'm not I'm not very clear on the officer's answer there. And we have an extent for permission. And I want but the extent position is quite historic and the world's changed a bit about conservation recently and we have great greater concern about maintaining our infrastructure from earlier times than we did perhaps when previous application was granted so i'd like a bit more technically a response saying are we able to actually ask for this pub to be left in the, its actual situation that it's in now, or mm. have we missed that com opportunity completely? Because I think if we have the opportunity to keep the pig as it is, as a really historic building, part, not millions of years old, but certainly part of our instruct, infrastructure and heritage, then we should know that we have that opportunity. Thank you, Councillor. Um, just to say, if you don't mind me saying, Councillor, change is not necessarily a bad thing. It may well be that I'm, I'm splitting hairs and the common sense approach is that no change will be good for the flying pig, but that some change might be good. So uh, we are in effect redesigning the scheme on the table with your proposal, Councillor Bajan, but I will ask the, the officer to reply to it. Chair, I've got to be able to answer that. I'm not redesigning any scheme on the table. What I'm saying is if we can stop this destruction of the existing flying pig then that changes the whole context of this application i'm not asking if i could i'm asking is it possible for us to maintain the pig in its current condition that's the only question i'm asking so just to um say councillor Bajan, i don't think the applicant is supplying to destroy the flying pig but to change it so just perhaps a bad choice of words Kent, um, Sharon, did you want to say something? You've come on screen. I yes, did, yes. Um, I, I think in, in response to Councillor Bajan's point, policy 76, which relates to the protection of public houses, does specifically not say that no change uh, should be allowed to, to pubs. And if you uh, go down, and I think this was mentioned in Councillor Summerbell's comments, uh, to the end of that, that policy, you've got the loss of any part of the public house or its curtilage will be permitted if it can be demonstrated that the viability of the public the public house use will not be adversely affected, it will retain sufficient cellarage, beer garden, parking, dining, kitchen areas will remain to retain a public a viable public house operation and the loss associated, um, including associated development, will not detract from the prevailing character and appearance of the area, including where the building is of merit or has any distinctive architectural features. So there is a criteria in the policy uh, which, if satisfied, mean that it would comply with policy. It's clearly up to members to decide whether the proposal on the table complies with that policy. Thank you, Sharon. Um, Councillor Benjamin, you want to come back? Yes, Chair, briefly. I, I, I'm not really asking about it as a pub. I'm asking about it as a historic building that's in a conservation area. Is, I know it has separate, separate, but not exclusively separate 
rules within the way our planning op, op, um, scheme works. But I want to know if it's an if it's in a conservation area, it can be treated as a building that cannot be knocked down. That's all I'm asking. Okay, just before you come back, Sharon, I can see you want to speak again. Um, just to say, so we're all clear, it's a building of local interest and it is a pub. Okay, Sharon, you go. I think it just might be helpful, Chair, if I if I might ask the Conservation Officer Christian Brady to just say a word in response to Councillor Bajant's comment at this point. That sounds like a good idea. Yeah, go ahead, Christian. Uh, thanks. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think Councillor Bajan makes the point that in relatively recent years, attitudes to the retention of historic assets have changed um, to give more weight to their retention. Uh, and that's, that's clear from the guidance that we have now in terms of the MPPF, for instance. Um, the way that you regard the flying pig in terms of the type of heritage asset is of, of some significance in this. It's both a component of the conservation area and therefore has importance in that respect in terms of the contribution it makes to the conservation area. And that's picked up in the uh, conservation area appraisal, which picks it out as a building that makes a positive contribution. And it has significance in its own right. Um, and this is the, the point about it being potentially a non-designated heritage asset as well. But um, how you assign the harm to, to that building is important because um, a designated asset like the conservation area is going to have greater weight assigned to harm to it than um, you know, a non-designated asset standing on its own somewhere uh, because the NPPF treats them differently. Harm to the conservation area has to be balanced against public benefits as a designated asset. Harm to a non-designated asset is simply a material consideration. In fact, uh, there's a balance process required by the MPPF there. Um, the way I've commented on this building is in relation to its contribution to the conservation area. And impacts on the flying pig, uh, I suggest, need to be taken into account along with impacts on the conservation area. I think my, my uh, comments on this application, as they appear in the public record, have been slightly misrepresented in so far as it's been suggested by at least one speaker today that um, Yes, I've identified, acknowledged that there is harm both to the botanic gardens and other aspects of also the conservation area. But then let's say OK, because I've said it, it's better than the extant scheme. But that's not really the position. I've simply pointed out that there are harms to these assets and that in the planning balance, in the decision you will be making uh, at the end of this where you seek to balance the harms with the public benefits. The extent scheme is just one of those aspects that you'll be taking into account. So my position uh, both on the flying pig and the scheme generally would be to say yes there are harms that have been identified um, and the extent permission is merely one of the material considerations um, that you need to take into account when you're rounding up the public benefits to weigh against the harm to the historic assets. Thank you, Chair. 
OK, thank you, Christian. And look, I'm sorry, Phil, we've digressed slightly there and you've still got questions to answer. I, I presume you've still got the answers there. Just before we go on, um, um, my hope is that the public can follow these meetings. So just to uh, say that SEAL is the Community Infrastructure Levy and the MPPF is the National Planning Policy Framework. I realise that some conversations are necessarily technical, but let's try and have language everyone can understand, please. So Phil, back to you. Thank you, Chair. I think the only point was the the NDA question, and uh, no, I wasn't aware of any NDA uh, requirement or proposed on the on the landlord. I think Sharon answered the other questions from Councillor Bajer and, and obviously um, Christian. Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, now uh, I'm just looking in the chat. No more questions, councillors, on this topic. Can't see anything though. So I think just to say, obviously, it's an important point, an important topic rather. And um, I mean, speaking to the applicant, I suppose, in a way, and to all councillors here in the committee, I, I'd hope that the flying pig, if this item is approved, the flying pig would be, uh, as it were, like the jewel in the crown, really, of this this development that the applicant would take it under its wing and would want to support the flying pig and make it successful. I mean, it clearly could be successful as um, Councillor Kelly has, sorry, Councillor Kelly, Councillor Green has said uh, that um, with more custom, it has the potential to be quite successful, I'm sure, in the future. But three and a half years is a long time. And I think we need to certainly at some stage visit the uh, possibility before we make a decision of what the applicant might um, do uh, to support the flying pig, both now and going forward. So I think that's a real and present question for this committee to address. And it may be difficult to, as it were, design that on the table. We might have to ask officers to go away and come back to Sharon Spokes. But we do need to give them some sort of steer if we are going to do that, I think. But maybe not at this moment. But we will come back to that later, I think. So if that's all the debate on this item, I think on this, sorry, on this topic, we'll now do um, four so sustainability. And I think after that, we might stop for a break and then come back finally to finish and, and vote on the item. So in terms of sustainability, I've put that down as a topic because, uh, mostly because the the um, the application is, is, is very sustainable, so say the applicant being a bream outstanding which is the most which is the highest racing the bream racing you can get but also because one of the speakers councillor um robertson said that he wasn't sure it meets sustainable requirements and there's been some debate about that as well so i think that would be useful and also i want to be fair to the applicant to give uh, us a chance to talk about that part of the application so councillor thornbury you want to speak first um, yes, so I've uh, I've also been looking at the Sustainable Design and Construction SPD, and in that, um, and also in our one our policy in the local plan, it does talk about a hierarchy for energy use, and it it very clearly states that it you should uh, you should consider passive design first, and then there is a there's several routes um, bands. And that the bottom one is full building mechanical ventilation and cooling. So my understanding is that this building does not have openable windows. It, it does not have it. There is not the ability to have natural ventilation. Um, so it relies on its fully um, ventilated system. And also it, it is very deep. Um, also in our SPD, um 2.2.22 it even it talks about depths of buildings with reference to sustainability and it said it does say it is generally acknowledged that a depth of between 9 to 13 meters creates the most robust and adaptable form so i've been measuring the buildings and they are they are huge in plan they are um, sort of 50 block 
Block B is about 50 by 60 metres across and block C is um, about 40 by 70 metres. So from the from the external wall to the, the court well, uh, to, is, is just the very big and that does not allow for natural ventilation. So this is so I would like to ask the officer that the, to confirm that this this does not comply with our hierarchy for cooling, does not re comply with our hierarchy for energy use. I'm also I also want to raise the the fact that this is a, my understanding it's an in situ concrete building. So the the Bream uh, assessment is for the building in use, but doesn't really consider the embodied energy or how you go about building a building. So in situ concrete is massive amount of energy to create the building. But but I don't think actually, I don't think we can consider that. But what we can consider is adaptability, because that is actually part of our sustainability requirements. And in situ concrete buildings are, are much more difficult to adapt. And one of the requirements is actually to design for deconstruction and flexibility. And you cannot deconstruct an in situ concrete building. And now the, the other thing is with the, there's a change in the building use class in September this year, which means that without the, the this will be classified as a, a building type E. So the um, the. The use of the building is is we can change without uh, as part of permitted development, so this could change this could become all restaurants or uh, um, food consumption on the premises, or it could become an indoor sports and fitness place or health services. There's um, all of these changes are now allowed within permitted development and but they require different um, uh, uh, mechanical ventilation. So an indoor gym requires more than uh, an office or a, a, a restaurant also requires more. But because it's in situ, it's not very adaptable. Um, and then also the there is talk about this being an office space for um, it could be for micro startups and sound it sound it is sounds really good and I want to support micro startups but I am concerned that if it's um, subdivided this building is subdivided that the, the there could be a lot of spaces where there is no view to the outside and there's absolutely no natural light at all if it's open plan there is some view there is some natural light there's no natural ventilation so I just that's what I was my concerns about the comments about sustainability thank you thank you councillor very useful councillor green you're next thank you. yes i just did want to um emphasize the point about um the uh the way this the way this development would fit into our transport strategy and um raise those um concerns again about the um presumption presumably for private cars uh, and reliance on private car use for this site with the size of the car park that's proposed um, and um, just voice concerns about that especially in the context of the location which is right in the city centre near to schools where there's a lot of congestion anyway because of the school school run um, um, it's near St Mary's it's it's near um, the six so we are going to have a topic of highways where we can discuss transport if you want to. Uh, OK, well, there's an overlap again. I'm sorry about that. But from, from, right, my, from my perspective, sustainability the crucial issue here is that they have looked primarily in, in, in telling us that they meet the BREAM excellence standard. They've looked primarily at the building and not looked at access to the building, which would drive motor transport into the city centre, bring a lot of motor transport into the city centre. Um, and that's something we're trying to move away from with all of our policies, you know, that um, we're trying to encourage people to use public transport, cycle more, walk more, and that's supported by local and national policies. So um, 
as well as the issues about pollution. So I think these do come squarely under the heading of sustainability. P- Petersfield Ward that I represent has got um, high levels of air pollution um, that I've campaigned against and uh, nitrous oxide, dioxide coming out of car uh, engines is the primary pollutant. It's m- regularly me- measured as above European standards in Petersfield, which uh, borders this site. Um, so on behalf of the people I represent, I have very strong concerns that the, the uh, sustainability arguments put forward to support this application focus too heavily on the construction of the building and not enough about the use of the building. Um, so, I mean, it, it's possibly um, a, um, you know, it's possibly a, 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 a an issue which I think befalls a lot of architects and they're too focused on the building and not enough on the on the surrounding um, spaces, the landscape, the uses of the building. And I can see why, because an architect is trained to build, to build and to develop a building. But uh, this is a case of cutting off your face to spite your nose rather than your nose to spite your face, because I just think that the surrounding area is so beautiful and so attractive and so important that that is the primary issue here, not the building. Thank you very much, Councillor Green. Uh, Councillor Porra. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I would just like to question one of the war count, or I think it was Councillor Robson mentioned that it was using aircon. So could we just confirm whether that is the case? Because my understanding is aircon is deeply not very environmentally friendly. Um, I know the biodiversity net gain. I, you know, I welcome the sustainable building. I think that it's good to see these kind of buildings coming on. But again, I share the concerns of Councillors Green and Thornborough that we're perhaps focusing on some areas of it being excellent. I mean, the biodiversity gain, I think it's 570 percent. That's great. But actually, that could be one tree going to six trees because we're starting at a pretty low bar for obviously a brownfield site. So the other thing is, yeah, private car use concerns me, not in terms of highways, but in terms of this, if this is a genuinely sustainable site, which it really is. I mean, it's next to the train station. I would want to see no cars and I do note that whilst EV electric vehicle points are welcome a lot of the pollution isn't just from the exhaust pipe we've still got tyres and other bits that generate it so again my concerns with the environment relate to the cars as well thank you thank you councillor um so uh, my point if it's different to the points that have already been made I'm just trying to think it through Phil is we have a question about or I have a question about the nature of sustainability and that which is being presented by the applicant as a very sustainable building is not sustainable in terms of uh, our plan, our policies. And as um, Councillor Thornborough has noted, the building is to be constructed from poured concrete, which is one of the worst things that we could really be doing in the current emergency that we're um, experiencing all over the world. So it does seem to be somewhat in contradiction uh, when other materials like cross laminated timber could be used at zero carbon. So I'm just not quite clear uh, on your thinking there, Phil. I realise the Bream outstanding is a fantastic classification, but it doesn't seem to actually answer all the questions in terms of sustainability. So Phil, back to you. Thank you, Chair. Um, It might be best if I ask my colleague Emma Davies to comment on a number of the points that have been raised. Uh, she's we'll a sustainability you. officer and I think she will probably be able to answer a lot of the questions around the construction side of things that have been raised. Yeah, great. Thanks. I didn't know you were here, Emma, so thanks. Over to you. I know, I've been sitting very quietly. Um, yeah. Thanks, Phil. Um, so yes, it is an issue that we've spent a considerable amount of time discussing throughout the development of this application. So we did actually have lots of discussions as part of the pre-application process around issues such as ventilation of the building, preventing issues such as overheating. So the building does actually benefit from natural ventilation. So what they're using for this building is a mixed mode approach. So there are going to be uh, ventilation facade openings in the facade of the building that will allow natural ventilation into the building. And they have also looked at, because of the deep plan nature of the building, they have also looked at enhancing the floor to ceiling heights to allow for a greater stratification of the air as that travels through the building. 
Now, obviously, at times of peak demand, that can be supplemented by a mechanical or a hybrid mode. So they've got a number of different strategies. I think they're looking at um, displacement, ventilation, and in terms of active cooling, they're not using air conditioning, but they're using the air source heat pumps that are proposed. They're going to provide both heating and cooling. So there is some active cooling. It's going to be all kind of controlled by a building management system. So that's going to monitor things like CO2 uh, levels in the building and also the internal temperatures. So the elements of the kind of mixed mode ventilation strategy that can then kick in when those are required. Um, but they have certainly followed that cooling hierarchy that we talk about in the SPD. There is a section in the sustainability statement uh, which does specifically go through the different elements of that hierarchy that they've followed. So the passive design measures, they've given a huge amount of thought to the issue of solar gain and looking at different forms of shading depending on the facade of the building. So it is something that we've spent a, a huge amount of time on and those passive design measures do actually reduce the cooling load of the building by around 29 percent. Um, so, you know, please be assured that there is going to be the potential for natural ventilation. Those louvers are going to be put into the facade of the building. Um, on the issue of embodied carbon, again, that is something that we did discuss quite a bit as part of the pre-application process. And I know the sustainability consultants working with the architects, they actually modelled a number of different construction methods for the building. They did look at cross laminated timber. They looked at a range of different options and they considered embodied carbon, but they also considered life cycle emissions of the building. So thinking about, you know, depending on the construction type, whether that would increase energy loads within the building, thinking about things like cooling loads. So they've actually chosen this approach because when looking at the life cycle emissions, it was one of the best approaches from a life cycle emissions perspective. And I think it reduces the life cycle emissions. I believe it's around 75 percent less than an average office building over a 30 year period. And that's all part of the BRIAM assessment. So there are specific credits in BRIAM for looking at things like embodied carbon and life cycle analysis, um, which they have carried out. Um, I'm just trying to I, probably not the best person to pick up on some of the transport related issues. It, again, it was something that we did discuss. We did discuss whether there was any kind of adaptability in those parking spaces for them to be actually changed to a different use. Should we actually find that they're not being used? Because as, as has been said, this is quite a sustainable location. So you've got the, the train station is very close by. So it was something that we talked about, and I think they have looked at ways in which over time they can actually reduce the number of car parking spaces that are provided and perhaps give those spaces over to some sort of different use. Um, so there is adaptability in how the building is used, kind of worked in to the design. Hopefully, I think that answers all of the questions, I hope. That's very useful. Thank you very much, Emma. Great to hear from you. So, Phil, did you want to add anything to that or are we done with that? I think just picking up on the transport issues, uh, Councillor Smart. Um, well, you can, if you want, but if it's going to be brief, but we're going to do highways uh, uh, as the next topic. So, but go ahead if you feel there's something needs answering. I was just going to say, um, uh, Emma's correct in saying that the, the basement has been designed as a flexible space so that if um, the car parking spaces weren't um, being used that they could be adapted uh, as single or double height spaces so you could take out some of that mezzanine basement and, and create a flexible space for alternative uses um, when when or if um, demands for um, private vehicle usage changes. Um, just to pick up uh, as well that the number of private on-site parking spaces is reducing and uh, there is also a reduction in uh, peak trips uh, in, in the AM and PM peak as a result of this proposal. Uh, so it is uh, reducing reliance on, on private car than, than the existing uh, site and, and the extent planning permission. 
And the mod the modal split uh, that has been uh, forecast on on this scheme is that uh, the, the split between walking, cycling, and public transport is about 80% of trips, as opposed to uh, just under 20% for private vehicle trips. So there is quite a significant um, forecasting of of public transport and the sustainable transport in in association with this this site, as well as the electric vehicle charging points, which has been touched on. Okay, thanks for that, Phil. Um, Councillor Green, will you put your hand up there? Yes, go, you want to come back on something, do you? Yeah, it was just that last point. So when you talk about this development um, leading to a reduction in car transport, how's how is that? I mean, are you talking about a reduction in the proportion of car transport by users of this site or an overall reduction? Because that does seem counterintuitive, seeing as it's a more densely developed um, site, it would be. So as I say, we're going to do transport next. But Phil, did you want to answer that question now then, please? I was going to say, I think we've got transport colleagues here. They, they'd be probably best to answer that. I don't want to do that. Generation. that the transport topic when we do that. So we'll just hold that question then, Councillor Green, if you don't mind. Um, so I'm quite reassured by what's been said there by Emma and Phil in terms of sustainability. Um, um, I, I know St Matthew's primary school was rebuilt and it overheated. I hope this doesn't happen to this building should it, we approve it. But then that didn't have any louvers to give 29% reduction in heating or whatever it's called. So um, yes, Councillor Thornborough. Can Emma just comment on the adaptability of uh, for use of this building, the construction? Does this construction type allow for ease of adaptability to go from a gym to an office to a restaurant and uh, micro um, units and back to big open plan spaces. Thanks. Right. Do you want to come back on that, Phil? Do you mind if Emma comments on that again? Thank you, Emma. Over to you then. Yeah, I think they've um, looked at the kind of the floor plates of the building and tried to make those floor plates as adaptable as, as possible. So I think the kind of the superstructure of the building is quite heavyweight. But from recollection, when we were discussing kind of adaptability of the kind of the main floor plates, those are more easily able to be adapted. And I think that they've also looked at providing kind of space um, for alternative plant, for example, if it were to change to another use that, that maybe needed a little bit more in the way of ventilation. So I think they've they've worked in some of that space into the kind of plant zones uh, that run between the floors of the building. So, you know, I, I do accept the points about the kind of the superstructure of the building, but I think the actual floor plates are a bit more adaptable. Right, thanks Emma. Anything to add to that, Phil? No? Okay, no more questions. So, councillors, look, we've been going over an hour and a half again since the last break. We're going to have to have another break. So, oh, councillor um, Bajan, you want to speak? So, just briefly about permitted development of the stuff under the ground. Are these buildings under the ground, the garage space and everything, allowed to have that open plan permitted development to be used for any class of use? Perhaps Emma could tell us about that as well. Uh, that won't be Emma, I don't think that'll be Phil. Uh, um, I think we've had that question answered, haven't we? But Phil, do you want to come back on that councillor's question, please? Um, that um, Well, that ancillary space with the building um, would probably, I think, would require a change of use if that was the case. It wouldn't um, automatically benefit from permitted development. OK. OK, you say you think. Uh, yeah, sorry. Yes, I'm just trying to think of the new use classes order. Yeah, it's uh, OK, Phil. I, don't know. I was just going to say this. We have a clear answer whether Sharon or, or Nigel want to comment as well to confirm what you said or whether they concur. Can't see either of them speaking. Perhaps after lunch they could answer that. Yeah, yeah, we'll come back to that then, Phil. OK, so yeah. councillors, uh, unusually we're going to have to have a lunch break in the middle of an item, but I think it's the most sensible thing to do to um, debate this item properly. Uh, we don't want to rush it. Then again, we want to you know, get through the item properly. So I think it's uh, what's it, 1.24 now. So if we come back at um, 10 to 2, so slightly shorter lunch break, I think. And whilst you're away, don't discuss the item with anybody, please, because we're still mid-item, decisions still to be made. And 
um, just turn your microphone and and um, oh, actually, you can, you can leave the meeting, I think, because I think that was what Liam said, well, didn't he, uh, James? Yeah. Hi there. Yeah, I will put up a slide uh, in a moment for lunch. Yeah. OK, so we'll we'll leave the meeting and come back for uh, uh, 10 to 2. Thank you very much, everybody. Just to advise you, Chair, the committee manager after lunch will be Sarah Steed. <laughs>
We are now live, thanks. So welcome back, councillors. I hope you've had a chance to stretch your legs and have a snack. Um, we're still on the item on Hills Road, the first item of the day. Um, so I'll just do a roll call now, then councillors, if you don't mind, check we're all here alphabetically. So Councillor Bajan, are you present? Yes, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Green. Come back to Councillor Green. Councillor Page Croft. Come back to Councillor Porer. Sorry, yes, Chair. I'm here. Thank you, Councillor Thornborough. Present, thanks. Thank you, Councillor Tunnicliffe. Present. Uh, yeah, it's a bit strange asking if you're present when you're clearly or because I can see you. But anyway, you must do this this routine, I suppose. So Councillor Green and Councillor Page Croft don't appear to be here. Um, yeah. Councillor Page Croft. It is Councillor Page Croft, yeah. Thank you. OK, great. So just Councillor Green to come now then and then we can get going. We'll just wait a minute or two. I can see Councillor Green, Councillor Smart. Can you? Oh, good. All right. I've just tapped it here. Ah, Councillor Green. Yeah, okay, sorry. Okay, thank you, Councillor Green. Um, I'll just mute you, Councillor Green, again, because it's a bit noisy with the wind in the background. Right, okay, so we're going to be carrying on with 112 Hills Road, application four. Um, so far, we've discussed uh, the existing conditions, the existing application on the site. We've discussed its relationship to the Flying Pig Public House. We've discussed housing and we've discussed the sustainability of the applied for building on the site. So we've got a couple more to do. Well, highways we'll do next, so anything to do with roads, cycling, all of that sort of thing. And then finally, anything else. Streetscape, trees, landscaping, that sort of thing, all those things. So um, highways, any questions on highways? Perhaps if you could just type in the chat, please, councillors. By the way, I presume, Phil, you're back with us, are you? Yes, Chair. Yes. Yeah, just check in. I've lost all the faces of the councillors again, so I'll just do what uh, Liam said and redo the um, screen. Uh, I have also lost, uh, I've lost them as well. Yeah, it must be the same thing, Liam. So just bear with a moment. I think, what was it you said, Liam, to redo the gallery, wasn't it? Something. Yeah, so if you go to the uh, more actions and then just yeah. switch in and out of gallery modes, then that, that, that should sort of nudge it back into, yeah. I've got it back. Has anybody else got a problem? You're all OK? Just seems to be me there. Maybe it's because no, I've got the same problem. I can only see Phil. OK, in that case, like Phil said, um, councillor, if you go to the more actions uh, um, logo, that are three dots at the top and change from whatever you've got gallery to large gallery, then back to gallery or something like that, just change it to and fro and you'll get the, us back. Yeah, that, that that's correct. That's exactly what you've got to do. I can see the gallery. I just can't see anyone except Phil, but I think that's because everyone's got their camera off, possibly. No, no, we're all got cameras on. We're all there. I'll, I'll try again. Do more actions. Um, I presume you're on large gallery, so change the gallery, then back to large gallery, and that should reboot it or whatever you call it. <clears throat> so anyway, you're still in the meeting, Councillor Poor, and yes, thumbs up. Good. OK, great. In that case, highways. Anybody want to ask questions on highways? Councillor Bajant. Thank you, Chief. And that there was a question left over from previously about permitted development and the use of the parking spaces underneath to make yeah. it very because the officer wasn't exactly sure and I'd like to know about that. And my point would be about highways, if it's covered by car parking, why when a when a building is two five hundred meters from the railway station, 
on the major bus routes and park and ride routes do they need 250 car parking spaces? I can understand you might need 50 for people that come and go, but this is a ridiculous waste of car park of space in our city centre. So really two questions in a way, or one statement and one question, I suppose. Yeah, um, Councillor Bajan, do you want an answer to your, your held over question straight away or should we save to well, the end? When, uh, before I vote, yeah, that's all I need. Yeah, yeah, okay, fine, fine, fine. Okay, so right, um, Councillor Thornborough. I would like uh, to, I'd like to ask whether this scheme com fully complies with our transport hierarchy of prioritising walking and then cycling and then public transport. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Any more questions on this topic? OK, um, so uh, just to remind councillors, when you answer at some stage, that it might be good to show that um, slide of the plan of the site outside of the building and the road and the cycle lanes. So feel back to you for some answers then, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the, the parking provision accords with policy. Obviously, the parking standards are maximum parking standards. And part of the parking provision uh, provided on site accounts for existing parking for Botanic House, which is under leasehold arrangements of 50 spaces. So the remainder, the 150 spaces, is for the, the new commercial buildings. Uh, and as I say, the maximum parking ratios uh, in, in the city centre, there's no, I appreciate what the council is saying about the location uh, being a sustainable location, um, but the policy doesn't require car free development uh, and they have really, they have pushed the ratios on this, on this scheme and um, I believe they're at higher ratios than I think what's um, been agreed with recent schemes in, in station, uh, station road CB1 area. Um, so I do understand the point about um, provision of parking on the site, but I don't believe it's against the local plan policies with regard to with regard to car parking. Uh, in terms of uh, cycling, walking, and uh, public transport, uh, I, I said before the break that the modal split for this scheme uh, is forecast to on a basis of about an 80-20 split, so 80% of trips are expected to be by a sustainable means of transport, um, and I think it's around 17% that is uh, by a private car. So that is based on um, modelling from CB1, so it's consistent with sustainable transport in that in this location. And so yes, I do believe that it strongly promotes walking and cycling, uh, including um, highways works that are proposed as part of this part of the development. Uh, let me just bring that plan up, Councillor Smart. So it's the proposed highways works is the one yeah. I'm referring to. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, so. I thought it might be useful for councillors just to see that again to re familiarise themselves mm. with the arrangements. So this is the, the Toucan crossing and the access, cycle access into the basement, the bus stop and the, and, and the cycleways on either side of the road as part of the, as part of the proposed development. OK, thanks. We'll just keep that up a minute. Yeah. Um, so I presume, if I can ask another question, that the proposed cycleways will tie in with the, uh, in fact, it does say tie in on the, on the picture, doesn't it? Tie in tie, with the yeah, existing cycleways on Hills Road. Correct. Yeah. And it, do we have a highways officer with us? I, we did we have. Do. Really. Yeah, we do. Yeah. Did that yes. person want to comment at all on the proposed works? I mean, <coughs> a, through you, Chair, if I may. Yes. Um, Ask, does, does this prioritise pedestrians as in terms of the pedestrian cyclists, public service vehicles, private motor vehicle in terms of the user hierarchy? The answer is yes, 
given the context, obviously Hills Road is an existing adopted public highway. As Phil has already identified, there is the two crossing, which allows both pedestrians and, across, and cyclists to cross Hills Road, thus giving them priority over the motor vehicle. Um, the developer is introducing a new floating bus stop, uh, roughly in the centre, <coughs> excuse me, to the, to the south of the development, roughly in the middle, which removes the conflict for cyclists and buses. Obviously, it does introduce a low level of conflict for pedestrians and cyclists as the pedestrians cross the cycle route. But that's a balancing act we've considered elsewhere and they seem to work remarkably well. Uh, floating bus stops they are becoming a common feature throughout Cambridge now and most people don't know how they operate. And you narrow the cycle way down very slightly to give a sense of deceleration, which seems to say lack of road and hunting the road seems to work extremely well. So again, prioritising then the, the public service vehicle over the domestic vehicle by allowing them to stop on the carriageway, people get on and off and the bus pull off again without having to enter a lay-by, which is always problematic for the poor old bus driver to get out of. Again, um, there's shared use facility, sorry, there's dedicated cycleways on both sides, which as you quite rightly point out, Counter Martin, is actually joining into the existing system, then taking them to um, the junction of Station Road, Hills Road, where, and I hope David Allen is actually on this call, David's team have negotiated a substantial contribution to future works on this junction for improvements for pedestrians and cyclists. It doesn't form part of this application, but we are aware that there are other, other developments in the area that will come forward in the foreseeable future and therefore we will be able to do quite a significant change to that junction. What that is at the present moment hasn't been fully decided, but I think, I think as I say, I hope David is on the call because obviously he can answer your questions about traffic generation better than I can. Um, again, there is a drop off point for taxis. Phil, can you just roughly point where that is? I'm sorry. Yeah, there. <clears throat> um, that removes the necessity for taxis to stop on street to drop off and pick up. There is, and no denying it, a conflict between the, the taxi entering and leaving that bay with cyclists and pedestrians, but it's low speed. And again, it's balancing between do you have the taxi stopping on street or do you provide them somewhere where they can stop off highway while they unload and load passengers, etc. And again, promoting to a certain degree public service vehicles, which taxis are. And again, we've, we've obviously got to cater for the wide spectrum of people. So you'll have people with ambulatory difficulties who may want to use a taxi to actually just drive, get to the site. That was deemed to be an acceptable interruption within the framework of, of non-motorised users. So anybody getting more questions, I'm more than happy to try and answer them, but hope that's covered the works there within the proposed adopted public highway. Yeah, thanks, um, John. Let's hold on then. So, Councillor Thornbury, you want to come back with something else? Yeah. Um, if the in the the current extant um, permission, there is the I assume the S one hundred and six is also extant, and in that in that for that application, the the funding towards the new junction is five hundred and sixteen thousand six hundred pounds, and that was agreed well over 10 years ago so i'm just a bit surprised that the amount that's been discussed for the new one s106 is actually less than the extant permission um and i just like to say it's really good to see this drawing again because the buildings are pulled back from the footpath but uh, um almost all of it seems to be accommodating uh, transport, either vehicles or um, cycling. Not much uh, space for walking uh, for people around those spaces. OK, thanks, Councillor Thornborough. Any more questions before I go back to uh, John and Phil? No, OK. I'll just ask one more thing then, um, John or Phil. So I was concerned about two things, the conflict coming out of taxi drop off and service vehicle drop off um on the left hand side going into town but you've already answered that john but the other concern i had was cyclists coming into town and turning right down station road so there's no real <clears throat> um, ability for cyclists um to be able to use that right hand turn in a 
Well, it is a safe way, but it's not ideal because they're going to have to go into the car lane to get into that right hand turn box. So perhaps you can answer that as well, please. John, I guess you're the best person for that. Or, OK, thanks, John. Over to you. Yeah. At the present moment, you, you are quite right, Councillor. Um, the main reason for that is that is the difficulty of width. Um, obviously, to provide a, <clears throat> excuse me, a safe lane for a cyclist to traverse between two motor vehicle lanes, it's going to have to be at least one and a half metres wide. And um, if you install that, you end up squeezing everybody else's lanes too much. Um, it's not ideal, I don't deny it. Uh, again, it might form part of the overall junction improvements for his station road, um, Hills Road, to see whether we can actually provide some more space. But we are very concerned, as I said, within the context of the existing highway, what they provide is actually um, quite good. Because again, if you've got Bitumen, is it is it the Bitumen building? The, the oval shaped building? I forget which it's called now. That's, That's existing, that so obviously we can't eat into that. So, yeah. Um, and again, obviously, the buildings to the south are existing, so we can't, we can't, there's not a lot of space, unfortunately, to widen the, the highway in that location, which is why, as you rightly point out, we've ended up in a less than ideal situation, but we've still got the advanced stop line and hopefully it's a slummy environment so cyclists feel reasonably confident to enter that area. Okay, thanks for that, John. Uh, Councillor Thornbridge, did you get your question answered successfully there? No, I thought not. So, do you want to just repeat your question then, please, Councillor Thornborough? Yes, so there is the current application um, for the housing. It includes a S106, so I'm assuming the application is current, so the S106 is current, and that has a 516,600 pounds towards the new junction, which is actually the whole of the station road junction, but not down here. So why? Why are we negotiating a figure lower than that when this figure was agreed over 10 years ago? Shouldn't we be adding inflation onto that figure? <clears throat> Good point, Councillor. I don't know if Phil, you need to answer that or whether John can. I can answer it briefly, but David Allen may well uh, explain it in more detail. But um, this is obviously prior to the community infrastructure levy regulations coming in. So it was prior to the seal tests in terms of obligations. Um, but it was also, I think, uh, a figure that was based on a completely set of different criteria uh, with regard to highway contributions and how they were achieved at that point in time. Um, so that it's 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 not a case of comparing apples with apples, really, I don't believe in this instance. Um, and the, the contribution we're looking to secure with this application is to deal with mitigation as a result of the impact of the development, which is the requirement of the, the community infrastructure levy tests. But David, I don't know if you want to add to that. Um, David, Alec, do I just say what you're, you do? And also maybe you could answer or help to answer Councillor Bajan's question about the amount of car parking and the effect that will have on road usage. Uh, absolutely. I'm David Allen, Transport Assessment Manager at the County. Uh, my team assesses the transport evidence that comes in with the site and use that to take a view about how to minimise the transport impact, avoiding severe impacts and to maximise the opportunities for sustainability. sustainability. The County isn't the local parking authority, so in terms of setting the parking standards and determining whether the level of parking is appropriate, uh, that's a local planning authority matter. However, obviously the um, park ability for parking spaces to induce tra trips means that it's something that the county is very interested in. Um, I'd agree with a lot of what Councillor Bajan says about this site having great opportunities for sustainable transport. It's located in the city centre, which benefits from very good accessibility, good um, local cycling infrastructure and walking infrastructure and strategic infrastructure coming forward and indeed proximity to the railway station. Um, so in terms of the level of car parking, I think we accept as the highways authority that there is no policy basis for us to push it any lower. Um, we welcome the fact that it's lower than the extant consent. And um, if there is an ability for that parking to further reduce over time, we certainly wouldn't object to it because um, we do see that this site could function um, with a with a very high uh, mode share. In terms of the amount of spaces that are included and the results of uh, what we think will happen in terms of the mode share, we do believe that this site can work very well and without severe impact. Um, John Finney touched on the 
mitigation package, uh, as did Phil. Uh, what we've done effectively is we've looked at the routes that uh, walkers and cyclists will take and, 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 and vehicles, and we've looked at um, a package that can deal with those impacts um, as best possible, and we've costed those. Um, so the uh, amount of money that we've arrived at for Station Road is based on a indicative drawing submitted by the developer, by the developer. We talk that through with our signal team and highways team and we felt that the cost estimate was appropriate for that scheme. It's not to say that will be the scheme that is ultimately delivered uh, because we'd recognise that the GCP for example has got an interest in the city centre and it may want to do something above and beyond that uh, but the important thing here is that the developer has demonstrated to us that there is a scheme, um, they've costed that scheme and we'd be happy to take that as a uh, as a contribution. So I hope that addresses the, the questions. I suppose the one line answer to the um, to Councillor um, Councillor uh, Thornborough's question, um, uh, the one line answer is that we, we feel that the mitigation package for transport is appropriate to make the development sustainable. OK, thanks, David. And just to underline that then, so Phil, what I heard then was that um, in terms of policy requirements, we uh, are not in a position to criticise the uh, item because of having too much car parking. Is that correct, Phil? Yes, yes, that's correct. OK, thank you. Um, are we all done on transport, highways, what sort of thing, councillors? I spoke this one other thing. One councillor earlier on, I forget which one, asked about policy requirements. So I presume that means uh, in terms of cycle parking as well, Phil. So uh, do we have all of that in place in terms of cycle? Can you just confirm that? Yes, yes, the cycle parking provision meets the local plan requirements, councillor. And I presume that if there was a need for more cycle parking, which could well happen as other countries like Holland have had to increase their infrastructure for cycling, that we could use some of the car parking for cycle parking in the future, or they could, the applicant. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, right. Okay. Martin, Chair, yeah. can I ask um, where the taxi drop off? Is that also for uh, disabled and also for the musicians to drop the? the gear off there if they're going to go into the flying pig. Thank you, councillor. Uh, Phil, can you answer that? Yes, uh, yes, chair, it could be used for those purposes, absolutely. OK, sorry I missed your hand up there, councillor Paige Croft. I'm trying to keep an eye out. It's best for you to type in the chat, but if you want to use the hand, I'll, I'll keep an eye out. And Sarah put a note there as well, so I'm sorry I missed that, Sarah, straight away. OK. I can't you know, look into the chat. Pardon, pardon, what did you say, Councillor Pagecroft? I can't always get into the chat. If I okay. don't, it wipes everything it's else off. It's fine. If that works best for you, that's fine. We'll work around it. Councillor Bacon, you. want to come back? Is that me, Chair? Yes. Thank you. I just I just want to be clarify the situation. Are the transport officers saying that no way does LTM 120 apply to this site in regards to the amount of transport that it's potentially bringing into the cities, especially as it might be moving traffic. So people have come and go and come and go and come and go. This is this is, this is the place we do not want cars going. And it is, it's, the officer was a bit vague. Is it, Were they meaning that it doesn't really apply or that it doesn't apply? Thank you. Thank you. I'm sure the officer wasn't wasn't meaning to be vague. No, um, I'm not sure. I'm sure. Which officer you meant in particular, but would, would one of you like to come back and just explain to everyone what the LTM 120 is so the residents understand what we're talking about and then answer that question? So I think um, I think there are two important policies to take into account here. There's the LTN 120, which sets out the walking and cycling provision and the quality expectations of that within the vicinity of the site. And then there is the NPPF, which, which sets out um, and, and the local plan, which sets out how many parking spaces the development should have and the sustainability expectations. Um, I suppose my point on parking relates to the fact that there is a, and, and, and apologies saying this from the Highways Authority perspective, because it's a planning authority matter, but my understanding is there is an extant level of parking on this site that a developer would be entitled to, to deliver. And further to that, the developer is coming forward in their current proposals that is lower than the current parking standards and lower than the extant consent. So it would be very difficult to suggest that the 
level of parking associated with this site um, is 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 a reason to object to the development and from the local highways authority perspective we welcome the restrictive approach to parking i think it's an interesting point that parking could be further reduced over time which we'd, we'd certainly welcome it um but um that was the point i was making as regards to the parking in terms of the walking and cycling and the facilities in the vicinity of the site uh, we've secured mitigation to are we recommending securing mitigation to improve enhancements at the crossing points to make it um yet more attractive to access the local facilities by walking and cycling including links to the station um so we certainly have taken uh, taken policies on board in 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 crafting that recommendation OK, thanks for that, David. Did that answer your question, uh, Councillor Bajant? Thank you very much. Yeah, that's very clear. Very Thank you, clear. sir. Thank um, you. So um, I purposely put that, uh, had um, Phil put that uh, slide up, so reminded us all about transport. And now we're all coming back for a third bite of the apple, I think, in terms of asking questions. So if we could try and ask, ask questions all in one go, it'd be a lot quicker. But 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 we are where we are. So uh, Councillor Thornborough, you want to ask something else? Yes. Could the officer? I know on in other areas of Cambridge there where our policies apply as well. There's acceptance that certain roads are actually uh, fully congested and that we cannot increase the trip budget. Are the officers saying that uh, Hills Road and Station Road still have capacity for more transport? And that we have not met it, that the congestion that we get already is acceptable and we can actually put more cars on. Uh, okay. uh, yes, based on based on the transport evidence that's come in, the number of vehicle trips that uh, would be associated with this development could be accommodated on the network without an impact that we could reasonably argue is severe. Thank you, David. And can you just tell everyone briefly what a trip budget is so everyone understands what we're talking about? Yeah, a, a trip budget is a concept that we're using on on certain areas within uh, within the city and within the county. A trip budget is a mechanism whereby we break much larger development master plans into smaller sections. Um, so that rather than the whole development coming forward in in one large chunk of say 5000 houses 10000 houses we break it up into phases and each phase is monitored from the very start of the development so that when going into a future phase you can look at the number of trips associated with the development and determine whether or not there is capacity to proceed uh, we are not suggesting that a trip budget would be appropriate on on a development of this scale or location um, it's typically an approach that we've reserved for the um, sort of larger um, edge of city growth areas thank you very much david okay are we good to carry on then now i think so thank you very much for that it's a good debate on highways and transport and thank you john and david for your contributions so now we'll go on to a, uh, the last um, topic, which is all the other things that concern the item. So things like the beauty or design of the um, um, project, uh, the uh, scheme, the streetscape, landscaping, trees, all those sorts of things. I prefer not to go back to the topics we've already covered, if possible. So Councillor Thornborough, you want to? Are you? Yeah, your question first. Yeah, so I've got three questions uh, on page 20, 37 of the agenda pack. Can you give the item number please, councillor, so we can all see it on our screens as well. So like 6.1 or whatever. Yeah, it is. It's, it's paragraph 6.15. Thank you, it, carry on. It refer, it's a comments from Historic England and it refers to uh, six and four stories buildings, but the, these are not six and four story buildings. These are eight and six storeys building. So can you confirm that that is that's incorrect? It's my first one. But also. Um, it, it also in that paragraph, it says um, previous iterations would be more harmful uh, due to mass height and scale of the previous versions, but um, I can't see this. This application is taller than the extant consent. So 
I don't see how this can be more harmful than the extant consent as far as heights concerned. And then finally, on the next page on 6.19, it refers to this application being now subservient. So now subservient. So I thought this is that this new block is the tallest. So how could it be subservient to any existing building, please? Any more questions, councillors? <clears throat> uh, yes, Chair, similar, yeah. similar lines. Um, I'm particularly concerned about the impact of the uh, proposal on the Botanical Gardens West Elevation. Not, on, not only height, which has just been mentioned, but width, the whole very, very broad extent of Building B in particular is um, I, I don't buy the argument that um, changing seasons uh, make these things all right. Um, it's uh, a minimum of six months um, without leaves for most species. Um, and uh, as we know, the horse chestnuts in Cambridge are shedding their leaves um, in, in July. So it's much, much more than uh, six months. So I have a particular concern with the impact on the botanical gardens. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tunnicliffe. Um, Councillor Poro. I thank you, Chair. Yes, to pick up on similar. And my understanding is what we're being asked to look at now is taller than the extant permission in the areas that have already been given extant permission. And I would ask whether we could see what I'd like to see is the new building, so the one that is not included in the extant permission, so building C, and the impact of that on the botanics. I wondered if we could see the views again when the officer comes back. So looking from the two sides of the botanics that are impacted, because for me that is where I have some large major concerns in terms of policy compliance, in terms of the massing and the height. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Poro. Um, any more? Uh, OK, I've got a question uh, on the views Hills Road looking north at sea. Uh, the trees appear to be, the new trees and as part of the scheme, appear to be uh, about as tall as the actual buildings themselves are proposed. So can you confirm that will be the case or whether they'll be, uh, that's a certain time in the future, perhaps when they've grown somewhat, that would be useful to know. Um, I think that's all for the minute. Thank you. So back to you, Phil. So just before you thank start, you, I can, just hang on, Phil. I can see that Councillor Green wants to ask questions as well. So if you want to ask it now, Councillor, then Phil can do the whole lot together. Yeah, uh, well, it was the same thing. I mean, I've, we've seen the visual impact assessment from the developer uh, came forward to the um, development um, uh, control forum as well. Um, and the work that they've had done to demonstrate that the impact is negligible because um, of the trees screening the building. Um, but yeah, it's been interesting actually spending a bit of time up here today and just experiencing it. Uh, I would say that um, I would say that it's from this um, sort of uh, eastern end of the site, there is um, a lot more views of the building than I think the impact assessment possibly shows. Um, this is the noisiest part of the site as well because it's near to Hills Road and it, that is also noticeable, the traffic impact. So I assume as well as visual impact, noise impact, light impact would be an issue. And the um, the comments from the Cambridge University did talk as well about the impact on biodiversity, especially the microclimate, things like um, uh, the um, uh, the noise and the light um, pollution would have on on delicate um, areas of the botanical gardens. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, I'm, I'm here. So if anybody wants me to show uh, live on the screen, I can I can show the views. Thank you very much for that kind offer, Councillor. It's very good. OK, um, so actually, just before you go on then, Phil, um, so I just wanted to check uh, a couple of things from the um, reports by consultees. So because it's a while ago since I looked at it now this morning. Uh, so 
travel plan condition. I presume there's one tree officer of trees and tree points he's made at 6.22. At 6.23, the modelling of if a, there's pump failure for a basement, uh, wasn't clear whether that had been provided or not. 6.38, um, the access officer has made several observations which were, I think, worth noting. So I don't know if you've looked at those and um, uh, consider them to be satisfactory. And the public art officer at 6.39 has noted that there's there's nothing been provided yet, as far as we understand, unless there's something to be updated there. I don't know if you got all those points, Phil. Do I need to go over anything? Uh, I, th I think I've got them, Councillor. Do you want okay. me to do those now? No, no, well, just go through the questions as you see fit. Thanks. Okay. So, over to you, Phil. In terms of um, the comments from Councillor Thornborough, obviously the Historic England comments refer to a six story then and plus a roof level. So I, I did check with the Historic England uh, officer who commented and she's fully aware of the scheme being seven storeys, but the way she had worded it was that it was six storeys and four storeys plus, plus a roof level story. So that I think may be why the confusion has come from from that comment. Um, the landscape comment regarding uh, subservient building, that's obviously come from the landscape officer. Uh, yeah. I think that's more in the context of uh, the distant views rather than the views particularly around the site. Not so the landscape officer was content that the reduction in height had dealt with with that matter. Um, sorry, just to go back to the point about um, the Historic England officer, uh, I think that was in the context of pre-application discussions, not not the extant planning permission. So uh, versions that Historic England had initially seen were then subsequently reduced, and that's uh, in the comment in relation to not the extant permission, but but uh, other pre-application. Uh, discussions that they had had with the applicant. Uh, in terms of impacts from the Botanic Gardens, um, I've obviously got uh, colleagues from Urban Design uh, on the call as well, so it, and Landscape, so it may well be worth having them have some comment, uh, provide some commentary on the issues raised in relation to the context with the Botanic Garden uh, and Townscape impacts in that respect, uh, which I can ask them to do shortly and I can provide the, the views that you've asked for uh, to help with that discussion. Uh, in terms of other matters Councillor Green has just raised, um, there is proposed to, uh, a, a lighting and ecological management plan as part of the condition to, to deal with those impacts uh, and at the construction and, and operational phase to make sure that um, biodiversity is suitably protected um, once construction commences and then obviously during the operational phase to ensure that that um, is adequately managed in terms of its relationship with the botanic gardens. Uh, the pump failure matter has been resolved as well. Uh, there's comments in the amendment sheet regarding that matter and the lo lead local authority and the drainage officer are now satisfied with regard to the flood risk and surface water drainage management strategy for the site and there's conditions proposed with respect to surface water drainage that, that deal with those those matters. Uh, in terms of public art, um, a draft strategy has been submitted by the applicant. Uh, however, we're proposing that the public art for the scheme will be again a condition that we can uh, have a public art strategy and delivery plan uh, secured through, through that condition. Uh, I'd perhaps just invite um, Joanne Preston to talk through uh, some of the townscape matters if uh, if Joe's there. Yes, hello, I'm here. Hopefully you can hear me. You're a bit quiet, Joe. Just speak up a bit. Oh, sorry, is that better? Yes, yeah, better. Thank you. Yeah, great. Hi, um, Joanne Preston, Principal Urban Design Officer. Um, I think just to kind of um, pick up on some some key points that I think have been raised a, a few times around this. Um, when we're talking about scale and massing, it's important 
to say that we're not just talking about the kind of absolute height of the building. We're talking about how the scale and massing is perceived from the public realm. So we do have um, a really thorough methodology set out for testing this um, as part of policy 60. Um, and that's a, a kind of townscape and landscape visual impact assessment. And that's how we understand the impact of the scale and massing. Um, and that's that's the approach that we have gone through on this scheme. Um, and what that does is it, it identifies the visual impact of buildings from open spaces. So the obvious one here being um, the Planet Gardens, points of access, conservation areas and, and key appro approaches. And so the design has developed um, in response to this testing. Um, and, and that's there to really understand the relationship between um, the proposal with, with its context. Um, so I think sort of, uh, sort of setting out, that's the approach that we've gone down. Um, the, we've also had sort of seven pre-apps um, as part of this, and it has also been reviews, reviewed by the Design and Conservation Panel on two occasions. Um, the first time it was reviewed in March 2020, um, there were significant concerns around the scale of massing. The second time it was reviewed in, in June 2020, um, the panel welcomed the changes that had been made. I think the, the reduction was two stories from each building. Um, so that they ha we have gone through a, a process of testing the design against um, the views. Um, in terms of how the actual final design responds um, to its context, the really important um, element, I suppose, from a townscape perspective, is Botanic House and maintaining that as a landmark in the streetscape. And um, the, you can see from the view from Station Road looking south. I don't know, Phil, are you able to bring that on the screen? Um, it's in the, it's 22 in the report pack. Um, yeah, just bear with me for a second. Thank you. So you can see from that that key um, point of view, the buildings do step up at, and that Botanic House is still the kind of main marker at that junction, um, despite building B being in absolute height, um, taller than Botanic House. Um, I think it's also really important to note from this point of view is the way that the flying pig is understood in relation to building C, so the red brick building at the back there. Um, you very much understand the flying pig in relation to um, the five story building um, as opposed to in relation to the seven story uh, building B, which which is actually out of view from here. So I think it's important to um, understand that that the way that you kind of experience something as from an elevation is not necessarily the impact that you. Yeah, exactly. So you don't necessarily perceive it from um, the same point of view as if you're kind of on the ground. When you're on the ground, you see things at a different scale. Also, the setback of the building um, is really important here. So it allows the flying big pig to kind of stand alone um, as an element um, in, in the public realm. And the buildings are set much further back than what the extent permission would have shown. And this building's really, uh, sorry, this, this image is really important for showing that. Um, from <coughs> the Botanic Garden, um, the building B um, is obviously um, quite prominent and that has been noted from the um, landscape and visual impact assessment. Um, I think what I would say is that the, the garden is very much a garden in an urban environment. Um, the form of the building responds to the fact that it has to relate to the gardens by um, the curve bilinear form, which basically um, means that there's a difference in depth along the elevation. So as you're moving through the garden, you experience the building um, in a quite dynamic way. It's not the same as kind of building hard up against the edge of the botanic garden, which is actually what the extent permission does effectively. Um, so I think in that sense, it, it's quite a successful response to its environment. Um, I think, yeah, uh, yeah. And as you can see um, in, the, in the summer views, um, it, it does sit behind the trees, although granted that you it, it, you will see it in the winter um, and it will add to the enclosure of that eastern part of the garden. Um, but what I, what I would sort of say from a design point of view is that that is part of the character of the garden um, that, that you do experience buildings from within it. OK, uh, thanks so much. Yeah. Is that all? Yeah. That's all for now, yeah.
Phil, were you done or did you want to say anything else? Uh, I'm done, thank you, Chair. Yeah, take that picture down then, please. So a couple more councillors to ask something or other. So Councillor Paige Croft. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, just sitting back and listening to all this is going on. I, I keep hearing the extent um, planning keeps being brought up. So it actually is has got quite a bit of weight behind it. It's quite a heavy weight thing that we have got to think about here, this extent planning. Um, so, you know, maybe we, we should put the S106 fund up like, like uh, Councillor Th Thornborough suggested, because it seems to me that to, to have something, or I, I feel it's being held over our head a little bit, this extent planning, and that if we don't do what they want us to do, they're going to bring it forward and everything's going to change. And, you know, maybe we should put the S106 fund up a little bit. Sorry, that's what I think. Uh, no need to apologise. Thank you for your comments there, Councillor. Uh, and Councillor Thornbury, you wanted to speak as well. Yeah, um, yes, I again, going back to the, the current S106 on the current um, approval for housing, including affordable housing. It also includes more than two, it includes over £266,000 towards informal uh, and formal play area and children's play area. It includes £200,000 for public art. It also includes £227,000 towards preschool facilities primary school facilities and long long term learning um, and and also 183,000 pounds towards a community centre. So, you know, if if that's if if we're basically saying we need to consider change of use from all of those, you know, the housing with all of these, why can't at least all those financial things be moved forward as well? You know, I agree that it feels it feels very much like it's going to be one or the other. You know, if we if we weren't satisfied with this application, then we would have to accept that the flying pig is going to be pulled down apart from the front elevation because that is the other current application. You know, it's it's very much feeling like there's this weight on us to make a decision about um, this scheme weighed against, um, you know, if we if we weren't 100 percent certain about it then this is the alternative but but one of the things we haven't talked about is again the public realm and one of the one of the um one of the reasons argued about having this wavy building which is is uh, is, is very different to the character of anywhere else in in cambridge let alone this conservation area is the how it creates space between the pavement and the building but that that public realm i think is really poor it's it's a public it's a taxi drop off place it's a public it's the vehicular access to and cycling access and it there's the the gap and there's more vehicular there's another vehicular access to the gap between the buildings and the gap between the buildings and there's a, there's been a question about um overshadowing and the planting and we've heard reports that the wind uh the, the canyon effect and the wind, it won't be too much. But I get I get uh, comments from residents in Trumpington complaining about the whistling effect of their carport. And this is much bigger. And I feel that they, they, they we've got two spaces which are awkward and but potentially they could have been great um, public realm spaces and I've, I'm really concerned about the public realm spaces between botanic houses, botanic house and these two blocks, the, pub, the, pub, the, the, the public realm between these blocks and the botanic gardens and what might have been a really interesting public realm between the footpath and the buildings but it's just doesn't work I think. Thank you, Councillor. I'm not sure if there was a question there or not, but Phil, if you want to respond to something. Yeah, I was just going to say, Councillor Smart, it might be worth uh, Joanne just having a discussion about the public realm, and I can use a slide uh, for that to mm -hmm. hopefully um, allay Councillor Thornborough's concerns. 
Okay, sure, that, that's a response to any councillors concerns, but that's not how too much of a discussion about it. Time's getting on. We want to yeah. get a conclusion on this item. So Joanne, do you yeah. want to come on that? Oh, yeah. no, be before we go into that and while Phil is putting up the slides, could I just yeah. comment please? Um, there was a comment about um, perhaps putting the Section 106 money up. I just want to remind members that um, uh, mitigation needs to be properly um, costed and justified. I think many years ago it was more of a negotiation. I think under the SEAL regulations we need to properly cost and justify um, the, the amount. So we don't have the same freedoms that perhaps we had many years ago. I just wanted to make that point. Thank you. So am I right in thinking, Nigel, just to uh, respond to um, Councillor Page Gross' point that if we had any increase that would have to come back, be negotiated after this meeting if approved and then come it, back to Chair and Spokes? It would have to be justified, Chair. So we would have to be able to justify why we are asking for more money, what that money would um, be spent on and what, um, why it's necessary for that amount to, to mitigate the development. As yep. I said, I think many years ago, you, you know, we were freer to negotiate um, 106 um, figures, but but now things have to be properly costed and properly justified. So you would have to have a, a genuine reason for increasing that amount that, that could be demonstrated. Thank you, Nigel. So um, back to you, Phil. Uh, Joanne, you yeah. I'm happy to, to comment on the public realm. I mean, I, to be honest, I don't necessarily agree that the, the public realm is poor. I think it absolutely makes sense to concentrate the public realm along Hills Road, actually, um, by setting the buildings back in the way that they've done. At the moment, Hills Road is a pretty hostile pedestrian environment. And I think having a bit of respite along Hills Road, creating activity around the Flying Pig pub, which which the, the buildings with um, food and beverage on the ground floor and glazing will do, I think is a, will be a really um, positive um, change to that area. Um, in terms of the, the space between the buildings that you're talking about, I mean, it does double up as a service space. And I think the, the idea of the benefit to the public of that space is the square that you see actually on the Hills Road frontage um, next to the um, Next to the, um, I don't know if you can point, Phil. Yeah, exactly there. Um, next to the flying pig garden. Um, and it's really more about the kind of views through down to the garden that you get from that space. Um, in terms of the space around the back of the botanic house, I think it's quite important to provide um, a range of different types of public spaces, which this project does. So you've got the kind of square that we've just talked about. You've got the, the space along the frontage of Hills Road and then you've got this kind of much more um, as I guess private and contained space um, which again has really good access to the food and beverage on the ground floor there as well. So I think it does provide a range of different public spaces. I understand the concerns around um, vehicles encroaching but I think the transport plan is quite um, misleading in that sense because actually the way that the public realm is resolved with the um, paving it's all going to be um, quite seamless. It just uses different coloured kind of granite sets basically to define the different areas of space. So it won't feel kind of cluttered um, by paraphernalia associated with transport at all. And many of those spaces for kind of taxi pull-ins and things um, won't be, be used most of the time and for servicing. So that's the main points. All right, thanks so much for that, Joanne. Um, um, you've been challenged, Councillor Thornborough, on your opinion. So I don't know if you want to come back on that at all or whether you're happy to let it sit there. You're OK. OK, good. Um, so, Phil, you never answered my question about the size of the trees, if you remember. Yes. Sorry, apologies. So for in that. the image, um, particularly in the image, uh, Hills Road, mm, which one was it? I can't remember now. I think I said I south, didn't I? But it might not be. Let me just have a anyway, look. trees generally, there should, oh, I know, the Hills Road looking north at sea, so the trees appear to be as tall as the building, um, probably slightly less than because of perspective. So, so um, no, not that one. The one Hills Road looking north at sea. I mean, it shows it particularly well there, I think that's all. We have we have a landscaping condition uh, and it is intended that these street trees are quite substantial in terms of their coverage. 
right uh and so that they have a have an have an effect obviously as soon as the landscaping goes in these won't these won't be small trees and the, and and the, the landscaping scheme talks about a certain size i think eight to ten meters spread for these street trees um but yes obviously this this these images are not necessarily giving you exact interpretation of, of those trees as they will go in but it's obviously there will be an expectation that these are will can grow into quite sizable street trees that will soften that frontage and carry on yeah. sort of the, the, the green frontage that comes to hills road so if i may just <clears throat> come back a bit there please it, i mean it, it you're right it does soften and it is important it's only a couple of trees in a sense in the picture but it does have significance in how we read the view and we do talk about verified um views don't we i think they're called in planning uh so i presume phil or nigel that that's acceptable to show a tree in a picture to us on the basis that it's not actually that size when it goes in because it looks to me if it's that size we just said it'll be about half the size of the trees shown in the pictures yeah the images that are on the screen currently and are, are not verified views um the verified views take into account the the landscape as as presented in the photos uh and the the summer views that i think have been shown uh, are, are modelled on the C, a CGI, but they are not a strict uh, AVR in terms of what the requirements for meeting those standards in, in the Townscape Visual Impact Assessment. But the landscaping condition does seek to secure good sized tree, street trees in, in, in these locations All right, where, they, where, where they will have an impact um, as, as a landscape feature. Nigel, you like to start? Yeah, if I could just add, Chair, it's important to recognise, I think, that these these images are for illustrative purposes only. And members clearly need to consider the the plans themselves as the as the development that they are they're considering today. These are uh, an aid to assist in in uh, getting some idea of what the final development will look like. But uh, you know, as Phil said, they're not verified views and they're only there as, as an aid to, to um, assist consideration, but it's the actual plans that clearly members need to be considering. Thank you. Yeah, fine. OK, and Phil, I asked about the points made by the access officer in 6.38. There are about 11 bullet points there. They all seem very sensible to me. Can we be sure that those will be taken into account should the, the matter be approved? Yeah, so let me just stop sharing my screen. Um, those yep. those points have uh, the, the key points have been addressed. Some of the matters I think fall outside of planning um, in terms of the points raised, but the key points in terms of a changing places toilet was one of them. Um, accessible toilet provision in on the on every level have been provided. Um, the other points, as I say, I think fall out of fall outside of planning and, and probably more in, in the scope of, of building regulations. Um, but the, the the applicant has has addressed the key points that are raised by the access officer. OK, that's fine, Phil. So we're, we're coming to a conclusion now, but I can see a couple more questions coming up. So Councillor Porro. Uh, thank you, Chair. It's just to come back. What I'm struggling with is the difference between the extant permission views from the botanics and what we've got now, both from the because we've got pictures in the pack of what it looks like now, but what I haven't seen, apologies if I missed it, is one where it shows the massing of the previous permission versus the new one as we've got at the front. Because my personal concerns rest more with the botanics end of it actually, rather than the flying pig in the public realm at the front. So, and I also I just wonder if the officer might comment on this. Because obviously the idea of Botanic House when it section 73 was agreed, but this was the landmark statement building. But now in effect, what we're doing is saying, oh, that's already there. We're going to build to the same height. So again, if, if the officer could, could just confirm how many more stories we're adding, I think it's two on the building next to Botanic House. Because I'm just because we've got the pictures at the front, but I'm missing the kind of the contrast at the back at the moment. OK, if, uh, can you answer those two questions, please? Phil? Then we'll go to Councillor Thornborough for her question. Yeah, the, the the contrast with the plans at the back um, has been of the extent and what's proposed has been um, 
the, the existing extant permission plans I, I weren't weren't available on on the on the site in terms of a, a full elevation. So I haven't actually got a copy of that, and because I, I couldn't have I couldn't find them on the file. Um, so, but they I but I consider that they do run in a similar vein to what has is shown on the front. And I'll just go back to sharing my screen again. Hang on a minute. So this this image. So this shows the proposed building B height as a compared to the Tannic House. The structures on the other side are are of a similar scale as as I understand it, particularly at the at, at this end. And then I think they may drop down slightly on the on the other end um, through here at the southern south southwestern end. Um, so that that is this, this the, the height comparisons I have in terms of the, the street scene. OK, I can um, see. But I, I, haven't, I haven't got I haven't got I haven't got plans of the elevations of that running along the, the botanic garden side, unfortunately. OK, can we get those from anywhere I feel or are they not available? I I check the the extant permission and I they they weren't available in, in a full elevation of a run a running along that um along that frontage. Okay we'll have to make do with what we've got then Councillor Poor in that respect. So um a couple more councillors still want to speak. I think that's what I missed. I'm sorry Councillor Green do you want to speak first before Councillor Thornborough thanks yes I'll try and be quick because it's five to three and we're still on the first item but um I uh, it was just really when um, it was mentioned previously about the frequency of um, in, uh, people commenting on the extant permission and um, how in that um, in that context people councillors were concerned that they should be weighing it quite heavily. I did just want to say that I'm not I'm not interpreting it like that. I'm actually interpreting it um, that I believe um, there's I think actually there's if I'm very honest I think there's been a bit of bias actually in, in respect to the extant permission because when I look at all the officers comments I do see this thread running through all their responses um, I'll, I'll show you what I mean so very quickly um, bias by you, I, Green. do you mean by the officers yes so into the bias first towards the, first, the or, or I don't understand Yes, well, if, perhaps if you let me explain what I am saying, Chair, then you will understand. Um, so on page 35, the conservation officer, the first comment was, um, the first time I spotted it was at 6.7. With regard to the flying pit, the officer considers it is a significant improvement of the extant consented scheme. I know the conservation officer did speak to us and he, he seemed to contradict that when he spoke to us, but it's there in writing that he views this application more favourably in the context of comparing it with the previous application. And then I spotted it again on page 37, the landscape officer at 618, 6.18 said, um, would have been significantly more harmful due to mass, height and scale of previous versions, but also the potential impacts of the extant permission. And it comes up again, um, Cambridge past, present and future say after careful consideration of the pros and cons of this development, consider that it's a significant improvement on the 2007 permission and likely to be the best scheme proposed for the site. And then it comes up again, um, uh, the um, that's page 57.6, a neutral representation has been made by the University of Cambridge as adjacent landowner of the Botanic Garden, raising the following observations. The design appears more articulated than previous, although the scale is considerably increased over the existing scheme. So again and again, we see consultants saying that they think this is OK because by comparing it to the previous permission, it's not as bad. And I think I'm worried that what's been happening is the conversations that have been taking place 
between the officer and the consultees is, well, look, we've had this scheme and it's not ideal, but it's better than what we had before. Um, um, chair, I, I, I need to speak at, at some point shortly, Chair. Okay, right, Sharon, yeah. Carry on, Councillor Green. When I look at page 23, the summary, um, it says, right, there is strong, uh, the development accords with the development plan for the following reason. There is strong demand, which results in a significant benefit for jobs in Cambridge. That's in terms of um, additional employment floor space. We're not sure there's additional strong demand. The empirical evidence is there's empty employment units around here. It also says the design and scale of the proposed development responds positively to the surrounding built form. We're not sure about that. It says the proposed development will not adversely impact on the character and quality of the Cambridge skyline. Again, we're not sure about that. Um, and it's got comments about the flying pig, which we're not sure about. It's got comments about the botanic gardens we're not sure about. It's got comments about highways, which we're not sure about. So I think it's a very subjective application. And when, Sharon, when you spoke to us earlier and you said that we had to weigh up for ourselves the, the, the weight, we had to make it take a view as councillors on what weight should be applied to the extant permission, I took the view that we shouldn't apply very much weight to it because there have been three cycles of the local plan since the um, original permission and because of changing um, factors like office accommodation versus housing, issues to do with new planning policies on transport coming out and the um, and the way that we should consider, um, uh, you know, uh, walking and cycling. There are so many variable factors that I don't think we should see all these comments about the extant permission as meaning automatically meaning that we should weigh that heavily. I just don't see it like that. Uh, thanks for that, Councillor. So just before you do speak, Sharon, I'd just like to say that um, I don't think I quite read it that way, Councillor. When you say bias of the officer in favour of the applicant, I read it more that the officer was um, stating matters of fact in terms of the quality of what was being offered in this application. And in terms of being sure about, well, again, the, the officer is make, writing the report based on the evidence they've got in front of them. OK, well, you sorry, the word bias, I'm me. using that in an academic sense. Sorry, I'm not using it in a literal sense. I'm, I'm saying answer. bias can be introduced by the way that you speak to people. If you implicate at the start of the conversation, um, you know, a presumption about um, the extant permission could be built out. That hasn't been answer. confirmed. We're getting into semantic com conversation here. Let's just let's stick to the facts, the evidence in front of us. So Sharon, you wanted to speak. I, I think I just wanted to reconfirm what you just said, Chair, that officers are stating the facts of the case. There is an extant permission. I would expect in any um, advice that comes from key consultees for them to make reference to the extant scheme and to compare the current proposal with that extant scheme. And that would be normal practice, Chair. Thanks, Sharon. So obviously, Councillor Green, you're in, you are here to, to make your own opinion. That's what the committee is all about. So if you don't agree with what the officer has stated in the reports and said today, then that's your prerogative and you can vote accordingly. Now, uh, yes, and I'm, I am undertaking a weighing up exercise, but it was just when a few moments ago we started to the, com the debate, start, the debate started to to making comments about, oh, we keep hearing about X stamp permission. I, think this, is, I think this is important. If I, thank you, Councillor. OK, so uh, there's one thing outstanding that I can think of in that. Um, yes, I can see everyone stretching a bit. Uh, thank you very much for bearing with. Um, is the matter of any form of gain for the Flying Pig pub that might be possible? Uh, if this application was to be approved and we left that sort of outstanding, didn't we, Phil, when we talked about it. So I think it's a matter of whether there could be any potential fund for music in the city of, I think, a, a figure of 100,000 was mentioned in another city at another time, could be 50,000 a year or something for this scheme, who knows. Um, it could be also be a rent free period for the pub. Um, when it gets going again, although I, it seems to me that in, in terms of common sense, that's not what they need. They need to survive during the interim when it isn't operating. So I don't know if there's any sort of possibility of any sort of 
payment to the landlords to keep them going, like a sort of furlough payment, like the government doing at the moment, or any other possibilities. And all of these things are possibilities, and I, I don't really know where to go with this, but I do feel that we need to, if we're going to approve this item, that we need to know what's possible and at least give officers a steer if they're going to come back to chair and spokes later. Uh, Nigel, do you want to say anything on that? Uh, yes, I just wanted to say that um, uh, in the lunch break, uh, we were working on a revised recommendation. Um, so uh, Keith Barber's put together a revised um, recommendation which which deals with this. So um, what we've asked members for is uh, um, delegated powers to go away and look, look into this, explore the possibilities, explore whether it would be still compliant, um, explore with the applicant what the potentials are, um, and that we would we would do that uh, and bring to chair, vice chair and spokes um, uh, uh, through delegated powers. Um, and we've got a form of words that I can use in my summing up of the recommendation, if that's helpful. OK, I mean, I think ideally uh, we'd we'd have that in front of us right now for councillors to be able to take into account when they vote. But we are where we are, so I'm content with that. But I would just say at this point, I mean, if we were to go ahead with this item and and the flying pub was um, to be lost in some way, either during the build or later, that I think that void that was created in the space would be a constant reminder for, for residents, the current landlords, even the, the applicant of this site and the users of the site going forward, such that I think it's, it's imperative that the, the applicant does and I'm sure they do, but we don't know that for sure, uh, uh, that the applicant does take the, the um, sustainability of the, the Flying Pig pub going forward very much into account as a part of this whole scheme. And I know they have in terms of the site. Sorry, Jonathan, you can't say anything now, but um, that we get a new building, if we're going to approve this building, with the Flying Pig as a, as a hall, that the whole thing is going to succeed and be a, a great set of buildings going forward with, you know, all of the things that have happened before, before COVID happened, like, like live music and the Flying Pig and all of that. So I really do feel that the applicant hopefully will listen to what I'm saying and take that into account. Their end of the speech. In that case, if there's no more debate, I think we'll go to the vote on the item. Can't see anything in the chat. So the officer recommendation is one of approval. Oh, hang on a minute. I need to ask the delivery manager, don't I, to state the um, the recommendation, Nigel. OK, so bear with me. So we've got quite a yeah. sort of detailed um, um, yeah. amendment to the recommendation. So uh, the recommendation is approval subject to the prior completion of a Section 106 agreement uh, with delegated authority to officers in consultation with chair, vice chair and spokes to negotiate and complete such an agreement on the terms set out in the officer's report and including covering appropriate financial mitigation provisions for the flying pig, which will contribute to its viability, its possible relocation to alternative premises for the period of its closure during construction of the development and other terms considered appropriate to make the development acceptable in planning terms. The recommendation is also subject to the conditions set out in the officer's report and to the amended and additional conditions as set out on the amendment sheet. I'm happy to read all that again, Chair, if it's helpful, but hopefully that's clear enough. I, I hear it all. Councillor Poor, yes? I think the officer mentioned that he was ha wanted an additional condition about the structural survey for the frying pig um, that he mentioned including, so I just want to check that was in there. I think it was to do with just before the, the work nearby was undertaken but I'm sure Phil will correct me if I'm wrong. Okay just before you answer officers, um, uh, Councillor Pagecroft do you want to say something as well? Yes Chair thank you. I, I just want to make um, to see if it's clear about the wall, the wall being a bit bigger and also an acoustic uh, wall going around there as well. Um, it's going to help people sitting in the garden, the noise from the traffic, so we just need that wall raised. And I did ask in the very beginning about that lovely window in the pub whether it could be saved and put back. Yes, thank you, Councillor. All those points have been made already and they've been heard. Uh, we can't redesign the scheme on the table. We are in the middle of the vote process, basically. We can't have a discussion now. So, uh, Keith, you want to say something? Uh, yes, please. Um, just for clarification, I, 
um, the bullet points that are in the uh, recommendation on page 110 of the report concerning 106 obligations, they are uh, included in 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 the amended recommendation that Nigel read out. He didn't specify them, but they are they remain part and parcel of it. So it's those obligations plus the pieces that uh, Nigel referred to concerning the flying pig. Thanks for that clarification. OK, Nigel and Nigel, did you want to respond to Councillor Porro's point? Um, I don't think we made a decision that that condition would be added. Uh, I'm happy if you're happy that we we consider drafting a condition along those lines. And again, if we could take that to chair, vice chair and spokes after we've considered that, if you're happy with that, we could add that to the recommendation. Councillor's nodding, that's fine. Councillor Bajan, you want to say something? Chair, I'd like to ask that if it does go to chair and spokes, that rather than that, it comes back to the whole committee. If there's going to be any changes, this committee needs to discuss it and not the chair and spokes. I think my opinion, I, I, don't, I can't vote for that. Thank you. Well, could, I, could I clarify there, Chair? I could yeah, yeah. to say if, if chair, vice chair and spokes will not approve what negoti officers negotiate, then I think naturally it would need to come back to, to full committee for um, further resolution instruction to officers. Um, I don't know if Nigel or Sharon want to pick up on that. No, I don't think so. No one said anything. Uh, yeah, we'll go with that then. So if you... I agree with Keith. Yes, go ahead, Sharon. The advice that Keith has given is correct. Yeah, OK, thank you. Yeah. There you are then, Councillor Bajan. Have you heard the advice? So, uh, Chair, I heard the advice, but it, I don't think it's mandatory that it comes back to Chair and Spokes. I think we should, I am arguing that it should come back to this committee, not go to Chair and Spokes. But well, if that's not allowed, that's not allowed. Well, anything's allowed. We're, we're the we're the decision making body, the planning committee. But what we're saying is, it's more efficient in terms of getting decisions done. Is if it's a small change or something that can be decided in the future. That's the whole point of chair and spokes. So, we'll do chair and spokes. Actually, Pedro doesn't agree. Then we'll have to decide that what he's going to do about that later. So, Nigel, have you done with reading out the recommendation? I, I have, Chair, if, unless you want me to go over it again. I think you better do it again now because we've okay. had, basically had a debate in the middle of the recommendation, haven't we? OK, so the, the recommendation is of approval subject to the prior completion of a Section 106 agreement with delegated authority to officers in consultation with Chair, Vice Chair and Spokes to negotiate and complete such an agreement on the terms set out in the officer's report and later referred to um, by Keith in, in, in his uh, interjection. Um, and including covering appropriate financial mitigation provisions for the flying pig, which will contribute to its viability, its possible relocation to alternative premises for the period of its closure during construction of the development, and other terms considered appropriate to make the development acceptable in planning terms, and also subject to the conditions set out in the officer's report and to the amended and additional conditions set out on the amendment sheet. And we've also asked for delegated powers to consider um, the appropriateness and the wording of a condition regarding the, the building structure. And again, we would um, consult with Chair, Vice Chair and Spokes on that matter. Thank you, Chair. All right, thank you, Nigel. So, um, we'll sorry, sorry, Chair. Um, there's also the matter of the delegated authority re in relation to the uh, EIA regulation, which is uh, para two of the existing um, uh, committee report recommendation that shouldn't be lost. Thank you very much Nigel's logging, nodding yes good thank you Keith for that uh, clarification and I guess now we we'll go to the vote so uh, go alphabetically Councillor Bajan how do you vote? Thank you Chair um, I'd like to qualify how I'm voting I'd like to say that the main reason why I'm voting for rejection on this is that it is Councillor, all we really need is why you, how you vote for, against or abstain. It isn't a speech. OK, Chair, I vote against. Against. 
Thank you. Uh, Councillor Green? I also vote against. Councillor Pagecroft? I'm against, Chair. Councillor Poro? I'm against, Chair. Councillor Thornborough? Against. Councillor Tunnicliffe? Against. And I vote against. In that case, we I think we're going to probably have to have a break now before we come back to uh, decide the, rec the um, reasons, planning reasons for refusal. Uh, actually, before we do that, perhaps we better just, um, actually what we'll do is we'll do the reasons, then, then we'll have a break while officers put them together. That'd be the best thing to do, wouldn't it? So, um, Phil, Nigel, do you want us to go, or, or do you want actually, yeah, if councillors just bring forward any reasons they can think of that haven't been, Clearly stated. Councillor Thornborough. Yeah, I think um, policy 21, which is um, which is the requirement for mixed land uses, is is not provided. Um, I also think policy 14 regarding the highest quality design is not provided. I think this particularly regarding the scale of the development being too great and the harm just it would cause to the setting of the historic potential. Just stop. Councillor Green, can you turn off your microphone? Oh, you've done it right. Thank you. It's just very windy. Sorry, Councillor Thornbury, can you carry on? So I think there's particularly the scale of the development is too great and would severely harm the setting of the Botanic Gardens, which is grade two star. Um, I also personally, I feel that the policies 56 and 57 regret re regarding creating successful places, places and designing new buildings have not been met. Um, and also there's a condition which was referred to about the pub, about public houses 76 and the, ensuring that the viability is assessed properly. And then finally, there's the 61, which is the uh, policy regarding conservation area, which. Brilliant. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Yes, Councillor Bajan. Chair, yeah, my, my points, my speech now <laughs> is, is, is about, first of all, conservation. The pub should not be pulled down. It's a, 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 a sign of this city and it needs to stay there and they shouldn't be allowed just to destroy it just to build offices. The yep. second point is design and how it's the design of the building, this wavy front just is not appropriate in my mind. I think that the lack of accommodation for people to live in this site and the destruction of that and the argument for more and more offices is, is a failed and wrong argument. Yep. And I'm also concerned that this is going to add to congestion and I think that there's an appropriate link to LTN 120 involved here, which should be setting out. We should always be setting out now to reduce traffic in the city centre. This place is 500 yards from a railway station on a central bus and bike route. There's no reason to have all those cars come in there. Thank, Thank you. Let's just stick to planning reasons rather than. Um, yeah, LTN 120 is a planning reason. Oh, sorry, I'm no. not getting angry, Chair. I'm just getting, I feel passionate about this. Yes, yes. And if we could not sort of cheer along, councillors, please, when other councillors are making um, points for reasons for refusal. Councillor Poor. Thank you, Chair. I'll list the policies if that's quickest. In terms of the flying pig, I think policy 76, D and E, so it's a viability for me. Uh, and policy 73 in terms of loss of a community facility that would be impacted by that. I think policy 55 A and C responding to existing features and local characteristics. And um, for me, policy 56, possibly the red brick part against the botanics for me personally is, is I find doesn't what well, it detracts from the character of the, the grade two gardens. Um, policy 60 again with the skyline and the setting. I know that the overall skyline for Cambridge, but certainly from the botanics, there's a very clear visual moderate harm, as I think it was described. Policy 61, as Councillor Thorne has already alluded to, I think pretty well A, C, D and E for that for me. And I, I suppose policy 58 talks about altering extending existing buildings. I know this isn't an existing building, but it is some of it is an extant permission. And for me, um, 
again, I wondered if the fact that the impact on the setting by the, the increased height worried me. And so for me, it's a matter of waiting. The affordable housing worries me, but for me, it's not. I, there's not enough weight from the other public benefits against what's there at the moment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Councillor. Any more? Um, I presume you can still hear us, Councillor Green. You appear to be walking along Hills Road at the moment. Yes, thumbs up. OK, good. Thank you. Um, so I'll just say that I would like to see um, a clear package of measures in place for the uh, future uh, sustainability of the of the pig, the flying pig uh, presented to us, which hasn't been done today. Um, just I mean, I think what has been done is we've seen a picture of the flying pig still there in front of the building, but we haven't been assured how that's going to happen because it's more than just a building, of course. Um, the other thing I think is it's been sort of said already, but I'll just reinforce. I think the scale of massing of the building as proposed, proposed is still very large on that street, and I'm not convinced of the beauty of the curving building. It's a very fashionable thing to do. But um, in that context, yeah, on that site, I'm just not sure it's the right thing to do. And it seems rather disappointing that the, I think the president of the RIBA has proposed such a building. Uh, it doesn't feel like it fits very well to me as a Cambridge resident. Um, any other points for officers to go away and look at? No. Um, obviously officers take into account all that's been said already over the last five hours and um, come up with the best you can. Uh, obviously we don't need, it's not a matter of the number of reasons, it's a matter of the best ones. So we'll look at what we've got when we come back. So uh, Nigel, how long would you need, do you think, to get things ready, obviously a bit longer? I, I think, it, to be honest, Chair, we, we might need up to about 15 minutes to, to draft okay. these. So it's 15, 20 now. Um, it's quite a complicated scheme. Isn't it? I think possibly that, let's give it 20 minutes then. So if we go from 15.20 to 15.40, if we come back at 3.40, I think that'll be best, councillors. So let's have a cup of tea and a break now, and then we'll come back and put these reasons and refusal together and vote on them. OK, thanks very much. Just leave it, uh, just turn your cameras and microphones off and we'll stay on live stream. Thank it's you, Chair. Yeah, just to notify everyone that uh, if you turn your video and microphone on, it will still be broadcast. So please uh, refrain from having them both on. Thank you. Yeah, and Damien, your camera is still on, by the way.
is now joining. Hello, Martin. Hello. Chair, sorry, I think you're muted at the moment. I was saying very importantly, David, at least I've got some tea and uh, cherry cake to keep me going, so. Yes. Too bad. I think I think that was the single longest uh, session I've ever had. I, I was thinking too, it might well be. Yeah. Cherry cake, good idea. Yeah, unfortunately the cherries were all at the bottom, but I made sure my slice sort of got most cherries, so it was all good. <coughs> so, shall I do a roll call yet, do you think? I can see an empty chair at the moment. Chair, could we also check whether officers are present? Um, planning officer, chief officer. That's going to be a bit of a challenge, isn't it? Um, we are about to return. Here we are. Right. OK, I'll start the roll call then. It's, it's, it's 3.40. So uh, just alphabetically, councillors, if you don't mind, let me know that you're present, councillor Bajans. Um, not a good start. Ah, yeah. Councillor Bajan, are you present? <laughs> OK, Chair. Sure. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Green. I'm here. Thank you. Councillor Paige Croft. Yes, Chair. Councillor Pora. Present, Chair. Councillor Thornborough. Present, Chair. Councillor Tunnicliffe. Present. And officers, are you all there? I think you probably are. I think Phil, you're back. Nigel, yeah. Keith, yeah, all the important people. And Sarah, you're there, aren't you? Yes, OK, um, so we have voted against the officer recommendation. The officers have been away to put together in a form of words our reasons for refusal, which we have spoken about over the last several hours and also succinctly sort of clarified at the end of the debate for officers. So Nigel, do you want to, uh, or I think it's you or Phil, would want to present those to us? Yeah, I, I'll ask Phil if he'll present them, if, you, if he'll put them up on the screen and read them out. Um, I mean, clearly, I think it would be helpful if the committee were to vote on each of the reasons separately. Um, and then I'm happy to advise on the, um, on the potential use of the adjourned decision protocol. Um, I, I currently don't feel we need to go down that route because I think although these reasons are finely balanced, they are defensible. Um, but but I'll see what comes out of the, the next debate, Chair, if that's all right. Yes, I thought so too, uh, Nigel. Um, but obviously, councillors may have a different opinion. So that's why I never uh, went down the ADP route to start off with. But we can still do that, of course, because we can negate the previous vote, can't we, and go that way if we want to. So we, just... We, yes, I mean, Chair, just to, just to be clear, we're in a neutral position. Yeah. So um, um, it's open to members to to um, uh, to vote for the ADP route, so that's the agenda decision protocol route, if members are minded to. But um, it, as is normal practice, we as officers um, advise, and we we would advise that that's not necessary, um, subject to no you know significant changes to these reasons, because these reasons that we're going to present to you, we feel are defensible. Um, so I will leave it to Phil if that's all right to go through them one by one. Yeah, OK, Phil, can you make that text a bit bigger so we can read it as you speak then, please? Yeah, certainly. Scroll down as you do them one at a time, um, if that's possible. It's quite a lot of text there. That, uh, that I can read that myself. Hopefully everyone yeah. else can. Is that better? If you did one page at a time, it might be better, but I don't know if you're able to do that or not on your screen. Uh, I'm only, I've got them in sort of one Word document. OK, if well, if you could just to, read them. We can if you it. go to view uh, one page, Bill, that should do it. On the top menu, if you go to view. And then one page. And then if you enlarge the. Oh. 
Yeah, you can probably zoom in more actually. No, yeah. Chair, I think that when we go to that, we lose the whole page. We, I'm only getting half the page. It's OK, uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll, I'll scroll I'll down. Scroll down as we go. OK, go ahead then, Phil. OK, so reason one, the site is located within the station areas west and Clifton Road area of major change, which seeks to support the continued and complete regeneration of mixed use areas of the city. Site M44 is allocated for mixed use development, including residential use. The proposed development fails to provide residential dwellings and therefore does not provide an appropriate mix of uses within this area of major change, contrary to policy 21 of the Cambridge Local Plan 2018. Reason two, the proposed development by virtue of its siting, massing, height, scale and design would appear as an incongruous addition to the street scene and cause an undue sense of enclosure, significantly reducing the openness of the Botanic Garden to the detriment of the character of the area. Furthermore, it fails to preserve or enhance the character and appearance of the Newtown and Glisson Road conservation area or preserve the setting of the Botanic Garden. The harm caused by the proposed development amounts to less than substantial harm However, the public benefits do not outweigh this harm. The proposed development is therefore contrary to the National Planning Policy Framework and policies 55, 56, 57, 61 and 67 of the Cambridge Local Plan 2018. Three, insufficient information has been provided to demonstrate that the proposed development would not adversely affect the viability of the Flying Pig Public House contrary to the National Planning Policy Framework and Parts D and E of Policy 76 of the Cambridge Local Plan 2018. So they're the reasons that we've discussed and feel, as Nigel said, are defensible reasons. OK, thanks, Phil. Just to take that down then, go back to councillors and officers on screen. Uh, councillors, uh, any points on those three reasons for refusal? Uh, Councillor Bajant. Chair, at the end, I'd like to suggest, not insist, and may affect the position of the public house as a building to be conserved. or that should be conserved. I think that could be just a bit smarter, but, you know, I just think it, it's, it's a may, not a definite, but it's an add-on. OK, Councillor, I mean, it will still be a building of local interest as it is at the moment, but thank you for that. Any more points, Councillors? Councillor Porra. Do we need to directly address the fact that we noted the extant permission, but this is actually higher and more substantial and outside the area, or does Nigel and, and Phil feel that is kind of covered in the debate? Because obviously for me, it's, it's I noted the extant, I gave it weight, but not enough weight because it was higher and it was expanding far more into the Botanic Gardens with the additional site area. But I don't know whether you feel that is already covered. Right, so, so I better be going back to officers with these points, I think. So Phil, Nigel, the first one from Council Bayesian about adding that bit on and also then take a Councillor Pora's question there. Any comment? I, mean, I think in, in, if, if I could do a Councillor Pora's question, um, I don't think it's necessary to specifically refer to it. I mean, there are a lot of material factors that members have considered um, and I think um, the, the reasons as we've um, expressed them don't need to specifically refer to all of those. Um, it, it's kind of covered. Um, Clearly, in any in any appeal that may that may come up in uh, come out in 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 our um, defence of an appeal. Um, I'm not sure about the first point. Um, Phil, did you have a comment on on Councillor Bajant's first point? I, I don't know if that is that getting more towards a, a, 
a conservation issue rather than necessarily a, a viability issue. Um, I, I think so. I think it is. Um, because that third reason of refusal is specifically about the fact that we just don't have enough information um, to ensure that the viability of the park, its future viability um, is is secured. Um, I don't think that's about the appearance of the building um, or its preservation as a building, in my opinion. Mm. Councillor Bajan, I'll come back to you there. I think my point on that, Councillor Bajan, would be that it's a little bit problematic to use the word may in any organ because we need it needs to be evidence based for these reasons for a refusal. But what do you think, Councillor Bajan, having heard that? Well, I, I use the word may advisedly because I think that it should be a building that should be conserved, but I don't I don't have the ultimate judgment on that, and it might be good for the inspector to make that decision. Does does that argument make sense? Does that hold together? Because it may be a building that should be preserved and shouldn't be pulled down. But on its own, we are only saying it may be, and the inspector could make a judgment on that. Yeah. But I'll defer to the to the officers if they think that's a, a non-valid argument. All right, thanks, Councillor. Can, uh, so, Sharon, you want to say something? Yeah, I just wanted to go back to the wording of Policy 67 and, and Part E, because I think there is a hook there in Part E, which relates to including where the building is of merit or has any distinctive architectural features. And I, and I do think, because we will be, we are cross-referencing that part in the reason for refusal, uh, that gives us a little hook on that basis. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Sharon, for that. Any more points, councillors? Councillor Thornborough. I just want, I, I'm not sure if you picked up the point about uh, my concerns about the public realm and whether that, that was in paragraph two. Uh, and I don't know whether the, the other councillors feel that that was an important issue that hadn't been um, adequately addressed. Well, um, obviously you're free to make your own points, councillor. I think the thing with that, the problem with that, possibly the argument is that the public realm in the provided in the item is an improvement on the public realm that exists already. It may not be that which we would prefer to see, but that's, that's a weak argument I would have thought to put forward. But I'll, I'll defer to get to officers, Phil. Uh, yeah, very good point. Um, yes, there, there's there's no public realm at the moment. Um, and this introduces public realm, um, or, albeit that perhaps Councillor Thornborough doesn't consider that it is appropriate. Um, but so it's a good point, Councillor, and I completely agree with you. But the thing is, is we these reasons need to be solid. That's why we have a limited number, you know, so yes. that once officers will agree with us on, on I think that would be my opinion. Okay. Um, also, um, Chair, you raised there was a discussion about the quality of the architecture, not just the mass massing scale and massing and scale. And again, um, I'm not sure that's been included, the quality of the design rather than the scale and the massing. Yeah, so since you referenced me, I mean, in a nutshell, I see it as not being well designed and not beautiful. I use the word beautiful advisedly as it is a word that's being promoted now in planning. And I, I do feel that it's not a, not a um, proposal that has great beauty. And I think that's important for the city. So well, I would so. I support you on that, but I'm not sure it's actually covered up, picked up at the moment. Yeah, so something about that might be good if possible, Phil or Nigel. Um, um, Councillor Tunnicliffe. Uh, yes, Chair, I'm a little nervous about the um, viability argument. Every, every single pub almost in the whole country is currently um, shake, shakily viable. And I don't think an inspector will give much time to a, a plea that um, viability is the issue when when you only have to look at you know They're all shut and we don't know for how long, could be for months and months. 
Yes, and I don't want to debate it here and now, but I suppose that there's a difference between COVID and a new building. Today, and we're talking about new buildings, aren't we? If I may, Chair, I think yeah. the reason of refusal is, is simply saying there isn't enough information contained within the application because the pub will be closed for a number of years and there isn't enough information around its viability as a result of that closure, I think. OK, okay. thank you. And just in that third point, I think it was like a sort of, um, I can't remember the exact text now, but it would not adversely or something like that. I don't, can't remember, Phil. Could you just read out the third one again? Don't have to show it up. Yeah, insufficient information has been provided to demonstrate that the proposed development would not adversely affect the viability of the Flying Pig Public House, contrary to the National Planning Policy Framework and Parts D and E of Policy 76 of the Local Plan 2018. The, so, the, wording, so, the wording in the policy is about adversely affecting its viability. OK, so I presume that's the best way of putting it. Is it in, in a sense not adversely? We don't want to sort of say that we want to have information provided in a positive way, or is that the best planning speak to achieve the end? I think that's how we feel the wording should be framed. OK, that's fine. that's fine. No worries. Yeah. Any other points, councillors? Happy with three reasons. It's a good number. Sorry, Chair, yeah. just on the point of design, design is referenced in reason two. Is it? Yeah, so the, do you want me to read it again, just to be clear? Yeah, just, just briefly go over reason two then. Yeah, the proposed development, by virtue of its siting, massing, height, scale and design, would appear as an incongruous addition to the street scene and cause an undue sense of enclosure, significantly reducing the openness of the Botanic Garden to the detriment of the character of the area. Furthermore, it fails to preserve or enhance the character and appearance of the U Town and Glisten Road conservation area or preserve the setting of the Botanic Garden. The harm caused by the proposed development amounts to less than substantial harm. However, the public benefits do not outweigh this harm. The proposed development is therefore contrary to the National Planning Policy Framework and policies 55. 56, 57, 61 and 67 of the Cambridge Local Plan 2018. Great, thank you very much, Phil. OK, I think we're all done on looking at them then. So let's have some voting. So as uh, was suggested, we'll vote on each recommendation, sorry, reason uh, separately. Uh, I don't think we need to have them read out again, do we, councillors? No. So reason one, um, is it absolutely necessary to, re to vote separately? Could we vote for them on block? No, Chair, you could vote for them all in one. It's, it was just a, a suggestion. Yeah, can I vote for them on block, councillors? I, I feel I want to vote for all of them together. I, I can see nodding. We'll try that, I think. If, we, if it doesn't work, we'll go back to individually. Yeah. OK, so all three reasons for refusal, one, two and three, as read out. Um, how do you vote, Councillor Bajant? I'm nodding, Chair. Thank you. So you're in favour of the reasons for refusal. Councillor Green? Yes, I'm in favour for all three. Thank you. Thanks to Councillor Page Croft. Vote for all three, Chair. Councillor Porra? Uh, in favour of all three, Chair. Councillor Thornborough? In favour of all three. Councillor Tunnicliffe? In favour. And I am in favour of all three reasons for refusal. In that case, I think we now go to the vote on the item and whether we seek to uh, refuse planning permission or accept it. Is that the way to put it, Nigel? Um, yes, Chair. So um, having agreed the reasons of refusal, um, mm. our advice would be as officers is that the adjourned decision protocol isn't necessary. I think they are finally balanced with defensible reasons. So you could now just go to vote to refuse the application for the reasons that you've agreed upon. OK, so I'm supporting that that um, way and I can't see any councillors want to do otherwise. So in that case, we'll do that. So Councillor Bajan, how do you vote? Support. Support you. refusal, Chair, that is. Yes, I understand. Yeah, support refusal. Councillor Green. Support refusal. Thank you. Councillor Page Croft. Support the refusal, Chair. Councillor Porra. Support the refusal, Chair. Councillor Thornborough. Support the refusal. Councillor Tunnicliffe. Refuse. 
And I refuse to. So I don't think I need to ask you, Sarah, to sum them up, do I? Because it was unanimous. So the uh, item is refused to planning permission. So norm thank you very much, officers, councillors. So normally uh, I'd have a little break now, but we haven't been going that long since the last break. So I think if everyone's OK, we'll just carry on with the next item. Um, is that OK with everyone? I don't mind a five minute break if you need it, but there is a limit, isn't there? To how many breaks? I think, yeah, OK. Right, let's crack on then. So in that case, we'll go on to the next item. Chair, Chair, I'm just changing my hearing aid battery. Just be, uh, be okay, okay. Well, let's just give it a minute or two then. Just have a is it? clear our minds a bit. Chair, if I may, is, is Councillor McQueen now taking part? And yes, of course. I yeah, am, I am, Chair. I was about to introduce myself again. Thanks. Yeah, it's in. Thanks for reminding me on that, Sarah. Um, so I don't think I need to do a roll call for you because you've just spoken, haven't you, Councillor McQueen? So you're definitely here. That will be madness. So in that case, we're all here. The next item is item six, St Matthew's Centre. And Dean, you're the officer. So um, speakers, We've got one, two, if they're here, of course. Um, and I apologise to any speakers that have been waiting around. I hope it's not been too bad, but uh, I'm afraid that's just the nature of the beast. Um, so we've got um, Dr. Neil, Leticia Powell, Rob Hopwood. Um, so the latter one is the agent. So we've got two objectors. So our Dr. Neil and Leticia Powell here. Leticia Powell, actually. Yes, I am here. OK, hi, sorry. And I'm present as well. That's Dr. Neil. Yeah, I see you. Yeah. OK, good. Right. Um, and Rob Hopwood, the agent. Are you around? Probably somewhere. Uh, can't see him. Anyway, I'm sure we'll, he'll get there when he needs to be. And then we've got councillors Richard Robert, Councillor Robertson, Councillor Davies and Councillor Davy to speak and possibly Councillor Johnson. I've got question marks after, but we'll come to that when we need to. So um, I think we'll get on with the presentation then, please, Dean, if you're ready. Thank you, Chair. Share my screen. I check you can see that chair. Yes, that's great. Thank you. OK, so this application is at the St Matthew Centre, certain streets and the proposal is for new student accommodation, um, a cafe use and outdoor terrace and associated developments. So just to give you a bit of context of the site, uh, the site is located in Petersfield Wards, that's adjacent to St Matthew's Peace, which is protected open space. Uh, the new market road to the north, East roads through here, Crown Court buildings here. This street is New Street, runs to the north of the site, and York Street runs to the east, Burn Street to the west. The existing site is occupied by the Cambridge School of Visual Arts, Visual and Performing Arts. Uh, it's been occupied by them for a number of years, um, and this just shows uh, the it's building at the moment, easy. which is single story in height. Car parking is set to the front with the main entrance coming off New Street here. As you can see, St Matthew's Peace is to the rear. The main site constraints, um, the site is located within designated Mill Road Conservation Area. It's also located within the Eastern Gate Opportunity Area, which I'll discuss later. Uh, the site is lined with mature trees, uh, which uh, have statutory protection via tree, tree preservation orders and through the conservation area itself and St Matthew's Peace is a protected open space which um, is protected and the protected open space also um, encroaches into the site along the eastern boundary. So the existing elevations, um, hopefully you can see these and um, so this is the existing building um, at the moment looking from new streets from the north of the site and this is the uh, view elevation, York Street, the eastern elevation of the existing building. As you can see, the existing building is 
relatively low lying compared to the existing residential developments. And again, this is looking Sturton Street from the, from the west of the site. And this is the view from the south. So the proposal um, includes a, a, a building comprising three storeys in height, plus a rooftop um, floor with pods on, as you can see um, on this image here. There's also an outdoor uh, cafe terrace um, to the back with associated garden. And the proposed cycle parking uh, is closer to the east and also on the roof of the building itself. So this is the north elevation looking from New Street, so looking from the main entrance. Um, as you can see, the existing building be raised on or supported by timber column stilts um, above the existing um, building. Um, as you can see here, this is the uh, new reception building, which is close to the front of the site with the rooftop pods on top. This is the south elevation. So this just shows where the cafe terrace will be at the back of the building and also shows the, uh, the proposed staircase uh, coming down the eastern elevation. So this is the view looking from York Street to the east of the site. As you can see clearly here, um, the staircase is sending down into the um, protected open space with two elevator cores to allow access to the top of the building. And this is the view from the uh, west, on the west um, on Sturton Street. And as you can see, you can see the relationship between the proposal and the existing residential form along New Street. The materials are quite different to what was um, present in the local area. And um, the elevations will be a constructed of steel cladding and um, to which a various number of um, terracotta battens will be attached to. Um, at various angles to create a nest like appearance um, in and amongst the, the existing tree line. Um, the elevator cores will be uh, made of terracotta cladding um, and the staircases will be a green aluminium and the rooftop pods on the top will be a green zinc material. So There's quite a combination of uh, materials which are proposed. These are visualisations and um, supported with the application. So on the left, that's the existing view from New Street. This is the uh, proposal. Um, it should be mentioned that the building will be um, right up hard against the um, frontage with New Street. And this is looking from St Matthew's Peace at the back to the south of the building. Um, so as you can see, the existing building will be um, above the existing um, building here, and that's the new cafe terrace there. That is the proposed floor plans. Um, this floor plan is repeated on the first, second and third um, storey of the building. And um, the proposal will form 14 cluster flats, which will be arranged in um, sort of grid-like patterns. Each room will have um, an ensuite and each student will have an access to a common room which will be located in the centre of each floor and there'll be a light well running through the centre of the building to allow light through. The roof and um, there are two more uh, cluster flats each with a common room and in between there will be um, 42 cycle parking spaces proposed and this area is all green roof. The proposed landscaping plan just shows um, the uh, location of the outdoor terrace to the back and the soft landscaping um, to the rear of the site. Uh, this is a new footpath which is being proposed to allow um, better access for pedestrians and students um, from New Street to the rear of the site. And there's the um, reception building with bin storage at the back, car parking more or less is what, what it is as existing. New cycle parking here and here and here. The assessment of the planning application officers have assessed the application against the local plan policies um, and are recommending refusal on seven reasons. And these are the principal design visual impact, impact of the conservation area, loss and impact of protected trees, 
impact upon the protected open space, lack of open space provision, and impractical cycle parking. I'll go through each of these in turn. So reason for refusal one, um, policy 46A, the local plan, um, requires applications for student accommodation to identify a clear need to demonstrate that the proposal is required. Uh, the planning statement submitted with the application um, identifies um, more general needs, uh, which student accommodation um, provides in terms of releasing more housing across Cambridge and more general needs. Um, it also acknowledges that the Cambridge School of Visual Performing Arts wishes to grow and expand and to encourage more students to um, participate in art, um, for, um, sort of the arts industry and um, engage in careers in that industry. Um, officers considered that the, the information was a bit, little bit light on identifying specific needs uh, for the scale of student accommodation on this site. Um, the applicant did submit an accommodation needs assessment um, to further demonstrate the, the need, um, which proposed or which laid out this table, which just shows the numbers of existing students at um, other student accommodation across the Cambridge City. Uh, which are all fully utilised at present. Um, notwithstanding this, the application doesn't fully demonstrate the total numbers of students applying to Cambridge School of Visual Performing Arts, so officers still feel uncomfortable that the identified need is not fully demonstrated as part of the application, and therefore um, the application is contrary to policy 46A of the local plan. Policy 46G, um, requires application to demonstrate that the mitigation of antisocial behaviour um, is fully accounted for and um, given the site is located adjacent to a um, protected open space, St Matthew's Peace, which is readily used by local residents for recreational uses, um, as well as the surrounding development residential. Um, officers are concerned that given the number of students uh, which will congregate within this area and behaviour could be an issue, issue and cause noise and disturbance upon local residents. Um, again, the application didn't really um, fully demonstrate that uh, sufficient mitigation and measures were put in place. The applicant did submit a student behaviour policy which is used across other um, came, uh, student accommodation sites, but this is more general and doesn't really um, tailor, it's not really tailored to fully demonstrate um, how student behaviour will be controlled on this site specifically. And therefore, the um, application is contrary to policy 46G. The reason for refusal to design visual impact, and the site is located within the Eastern Gate Opportunity Area, and this area identifies sites which are capable of redevelopment subject to a number of criteria. So as you can see, the site is located within this red line boundary. Um, the SPD, um, Eastern Gate Opportunity Area SPD, um, states that a maximum height of two plus one storeys of buildings um, will be permitted. Um, the proposed building, although the, the, um, the proposal is actually three storeys and an additional rooftop um, floor. And the guidance in the SPD es um, estimates that a, a floor height of three metres um, equates to one floor. So given that the building will be raised six metres above ground level on stilts, um, the proposal actually equates to five storeys plus the one rooftop and um, floor on top. And um, so therefore is contrary to the, the guidance of the SPD. This elevation just shows the um, the height of the building in relation to the, the neighbouring um, development, and clearly you can see that it's, it's significantly higher um, in terms of scale and loom and would loom over and dominate um, the local area. In some of the visualisations um, submitted in the uh, visual impact assessment by the applicants, again just showing this view is looking down New Street. Uh, from the east of the site, and as you can see, the massing and build of the build was would dominate the um, two-storey uh, residential properties adjacent. And this view is looking back up New Street um, from the 
from the rest of the site. Again, the materials, as I briefly mentioned, um, they are in contrast to the um, existing materials, which are traditionally uh, are predominantly traditional brick. Um, so the steel cladding, the green aluminium and the terracotta battens is considered to be overly engineered and doesn't really sit um, well, it's not in keeping with the character of the local area and is therefore refused. The reason for refusal three, so the application site is located within Mill, Mill Road Conservation Area. Uh, the conservation area is mainly uh, predominantly um, terrace properties in rows sprawling up from Mill Road, which is further down here. Um, and the site is obviously a set adjacent to um, St Matthew's Peace. So Matthew's piece is considered to be a significant asset within the um, conservation area as it um, provides a green open space to uh, break up the built form um, within the within the conservation area itself and allows views through um, within the conservation area. So this is just a visualisation of um, what the present site looks like when the trees are not in leaf. Um, so as you can see, views above the existing building are retained, but with the proposal due to its scale and size and massing, we completely erode this openness and the views through and the open space and therefore is not considered to um, retain the character of the conservation area in this instance. And there are no public benefits to outweigh this harm and therefore is refused policy 61 the local plan. Reason for reviews of four impact loss of trees and um, the trees around um, the site are considered to provide a significant level of amenity within this area. They've been there for many years and um, and are a, a significant asset and um, to the character of the area. And um, due to the size of the proposal and the uh, positioning of the proposal along the front, two trees are to be removed and um, which are uh, protected by tree preservation orders and a statutory, statutory protection through the conservation area. So this is just a visualisation. So it's this tree here and this tree here, which would be removed. But also given the massing of the building and the proximity of it to other neighbouring trees along the front, um, it's considered that these are to be pollarded and due to the scale of the building, and um, the development and growth of these trees would be significantly harmed and therefore the um, the proposal would result in the loss of important trees and significant harm upon existing trees and therefore the policy and um, the proposal is um, refused against policy 71 local plan. The reason for refusal five um, as I briefly mentioned before the open space and um, provides recreational um, use and environmental benefits um, within the area for local residents to enjoy. Um, given the massing of, of the building and um, the significant impact on the experience of, of users using St Matthew's Peace and um, to the rear. Um, this area of protected open space is one of very few within Peacefield Ward um, and given the um, high density of the area within, within um, Peacefield Ward um, its retention is considered to be vital to provide that recreational use and environmental benefit. So one of the aspects of the, of the building are these staircases on the eastern elevation um, and this just shows the, um, the way in which they would descend down into the protected open space on the eastern section of the site. They would descend quite dramatically downwards into that space which would erode some of that open space for local residents to use and this view here just from the south just to highlight that. Again the experience of the same sorry, of St Matthew's piece and um, to the back uh, would be significantly affected uh, due to the overall scale of the building which would loom over the open space and erode the open the sense of openness. The applicant is proposing a, a new footpath link on the eastern um, side of the site to outweigh this harm and um, the officers consider this is um, not considered to outweigh this harm in, in this instance and therefore the proposal is contrary to policy 67 of the local plan. 
uh, reason for refusal six, uh, lack of open space provision. Um, the only open space provided within the uh, as part of the proposal is the soft landscaping to the rear and the outdoor terrace. The outdoor terrace would um, be associated with the cafe use. Um, the cafe is to be used by both students and um, the general public, and therefore officers do not feel that this is an adequate space for just students to use um, and enjoy. And therefore, the level of um, open space provided within the as part of the application is limited, um, given the number of um, students to be accommodated for um, is, is severely and inadequate. And therefore, the, the, the application is contrary to policy 68 of the local plan. And reason for refusal seven, and um, hopefully you can see these is a bit blurry, so apologies. And um, this is just showing the ground floor level, showing the proposed cycle parking in the red hashed squares. And um, this parking here is um, considered to be acceptable and mm -hmm. accessible um, by this footpath link. And um, however, the cycle parking on the roof is not considered to be um, easily accessible. So the cycle parking on the roof, 42 cycle parking spaces are proposed on the roof, um, and the proposal requires students to enter these elevator cores and come up to the top level with their bikes and navigate their way along these narrow spaced corridors through single door and doorways and, and access the cycle parking up here. Officers do not consider this is um, acceptable um, and it would also cause a conflict with other users using the elevators and um, such as students accessing um, these rooms at the top and therefore a significant conflict could, could arise um, and therefore the proposal does not provide an um, adequate or easy accessible cycle parking um, in this instance and this element here is uh, refused um, on policy um, 82 of the local plan. So in summary, um, officers of the view that the application fails to record a number of policies in the Cambridge local plan and associated guidance documents and therefore the um, Officers are recommending refusal on the following grounds. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for that, Dean. So if you stop sharing your screen now, then Dean, please. And um, we'll go to the so there's two objectors, and because there are two of you, and it's quite an important item, a lot of um, interest from residents, you have three minutes each to speak. So Dr. Neil, you're first. So just wait a minute though, so we get you back on the screen. That's it. Yeah. Okay. So um and you're speaking on behalf of Friends of St Matthew's Peace and past, present and future. Dr Neil, when you're ready. Uh, Dr Neil, can you hear me? OK, when you're ready, Dr Neil. Sorry, I didn't realise I hadn't unmuted. I've now lost my text. OK, no, we, do you want a second and we can have the other other person first? I've, I've actually got my text now, if that's all right. Okay. I'm, I'm, happy to, I'm very sorry. OK, all I'm right. Valerie Neal and I'm speaking on behalf of Friends of St Matthew's Peace and Cambridge Past, Present and Future. The Cambridge Local Plan protects our quality of life, our heritage and our environmental assets. Exactly what is most threatened by this application, as is clear from the hundreds of objections that have been lodged without a single supporting comment. Planning law requires applicants applications to be determined in accordance with the local plan. This places a heavy burden on any applicant to show why a decision should be taken contrary to that plan. The officer's report demonstrates this application substantially breaches many local plan policies. We all object to this application in the strongest terms and support the officer's recommendation of refusal. Our many responses, supported by those of officers and of key consultees, focus on how this application fails to comply with the local plan policies. If approved, this development would fatally undermine the local plan. These proposals would significantly harm the conservation area mutilate the glorious mature trees our community prizes so highly, disrupt our only park's tranquility and despoil residential amenity. 
the building would dominate and overshadow protected open space and the modest homes that encircle St Matthew's Peace. Under policy 60, any proposal significantly taller than the surrounding built form must demonstrate that it has no adverse impact on either neighboring buildings or open spaces in terms of overlooking or overshadowing. This or anything remotely similar unavoidably breaches policy 60D. For 4,300 residents, Little St. Matthew's Peace is the park nearest to their home. Proximity is of particular significance to people with disabilities and their carers, or for those with impaired mobility due to either advanced age or the challenges of looking after young children. Surrounding properties are flats with little or no private garden or compact terraced homes with very small gardens. During the current pandemic, St. Matthew's Peace has been essential to preserving our mental and physical health and its vital role as a public open space is indisputable. With no substantive public benefit arguments in support of these harmful proposals, we ask members to refuse this application in the clearest and most compelling of terms. Thank you, Chair. Okay, uh, thank you, Doctor. So the next person is Letitia. Uh, we've got three minutes to speak. Yeah, Letitia Powell, thank you. Okay, so my name is Letitia Powell. I live in York Street. My friends and neighbours all object to this application, talking to each other in this close-knit and supportive part of Cambridge. Not a single person has a positive view on this matter. This project fails to enhance the character or to fit in the scale of our residence area. It is very much out of character. It will cause overshadowing, overlooking and destroying the setting, character and appearances of conservation area. It's open space, the trees, but also diminish the little greenery that we currently have. This park is always very important to us. It became safe haven in this difficult time for the people who live around here. Walking, playing, meeting up, exercising, discussion, book club, even book club, and especially now while respecting social distancing. If you come and visit our park, you will see that it's always enjoyed by children playing, families together, people exercising, socializing, people from York Street put bulbs and plants there to enhance these parents and we also go and clean them every so often. If this will really reduce significantly already mega open space and threatens our precious trees, which are absolutely beautiful. And are the only trees in the Agenda Street. The building is too high. This will reduce daylight in our streets and all of us know the benefit of natural light. The building design and its size will not fit in the setting. Our streets are already so busy with traffic, causing much noise and pollution. Our streets are very narrow. People are already stressed by the current traffic level and parking. This is increased traffic and we're already suffering of antisocial driving by people going too fast and being aggressive at times. We have endured recently heavy traffic with trucks going through York Street and Hensworth Street for the building site near Hope Street, where trees were also taken down for the mere road depot development. We are concerned about potential trucks with building materials going through it again. The play area will have to be closed and moved. How long will it take? And where would the children play, at least play safely? A picture says thousands words. Please come and sit down on the bench and watch. It is a wonderful mix of people who all have chosen to live here. People from all walks of life talking to each other. All are awaiting very much love concerts and festival, which has not taken part this year. This will not improve the lives and well-being of the current and future residents. The mental health and the well-being of our residents should be of concern. There seem to be very little thoughts in regards to us who live here and use the park in those plans. There is enough space in other location for such a project in the surrounding of Cambridge and plenty of available campus facilities. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, Rob, you're the agent. You've got six minutes to speak. Yes, yeah, thank you, Chairman. Can I just ask a point of clarification? Yep. Um, I understand the school has written a letter to you 
And I just wanted to know whether or not you had received that because it might save me some time on my presentation in part. Yes, we've received it. Um, and um, that would be read out by an officer, I guess, before you speak as part of the six minutes. Um, can I just check, Keith, um, are we OK to hear this letter from the school who I presume are linked to the applicant, Keith? Um, when when did we receive the letter? I think it was this morning. Well, I see no uh, uh, no reason why it shouldn't be read, uh, Chair. It's your discretion for a for a for a late submission like that. But um, I okay. think yeah. I think you can yes you can uh, you can read it out. Just to be clear, Keith, I was alluding not to the lateness of the entry, but to the fact that the Cambridge School and Visual and Performing Arts letter comes from an organisation that's related to the applicant and they're writing in support of the applicant. If, um, I, if I can, oh, sorry, I can help. Um, hang on a minute, I'll ask you in a minute, Rob. Keith, anything to say? Um, I think on reflection it comes late and it ought not to be included. Sorry. OK, uh, Rob, what do, you, what do you want to say? Well, all it is, the actual application is for the school to inhabit the building. Mm. So uh, if That's you don't fine. read it, I'll, I'll read it within my six yeah, minutes. Yeah, yeah, I realise that. So in that case, we'll have the officer read the letter out and then you have your conversation after that. All right, Rob? Thank you. OK, so um, Sarah, do you mind reading the letter out then, please, and start the clock at the start? Yes, Chair, I'll do that now. Um, so CSVPA wish to express their disappointment regarding the officer recommendation to refuse planning permission for the proposal to create purpose built student accommodation at St Matthew's Centre, Certain Street. Since CSVPA launched as a standalone school in 2014, St Matthew Centre has provided important education facilities for us. The centre continues to be central to our planned growth as we further develop our performing arts courses. CSVPA's vision is to grow the talent pipeline for the creative industries from 16 plus and to develop visual arts digital talent from games designed to data visualisation and other such subjects. The college's existing under 18 accommodation is fully utilised with no opportunities for expansion. The site at Sturton Street is with its sorry, existing performing arts building, therefore provides an unrivaled opportunity to support the work and vision of the college and its growth aspirations for 16 to 18 accommodation. The integration of new student accommodation with St Matthew's Centre in which our students are taught means the space facility would be uniquely and ideally suited to meet the needs of our students with a localised campus. The provision of purpose built student accommodation will also allow CSVPA to have greater direct management of students and a greater capacity to support the learning, health and well-being of the students. A strong emphasis on pastoral care is provided and all under 18 boarding are managed by a highly trained team of professional house parents who will be residing at the property. All students must obey the college's clear conduct rules as well as curfew times to be back in their rooms. There is also a 24 hour emergency number which can be called as well as a telephone number for the house parent. CSVPA trusts the committee can recognise the significant opportunity that the proposal represents in supporting the continued growth of a Cambridge based institution and its ability to compete nationally and internationally together with adding to the vibrancy of the city. Chair, that's submitted on behalf of the Rector of Cambridge School of Visual and Performing Arts. Thanks a lot, Sarah. So, Rob, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Chairman, for that. Uh, just firstly, I'll talk, talk about the principle of development. Paragraph 8.1 of the officer's report confirms that the site is within a sustainable location, walking and cycling distance of the city centre, close to the other school's education facilities. And this is seeking to provide a combined space for the existing dance studios and new accommodation above uh, for the students. The officer confirms in his report 
that the location of the application site for student accommodation is suitable. Secondly, in terms of design, scale, height, mass, bulk and depth of the scheme, this was informed by the 2015 PREAP advice. The final feedback from that process gave the green light to the scale, massing and siting of the 2015 scheme. The new proposal has the same footprint as the 2015 design, but adds another story in, in order to provide the accommodation needs. The proposal is designed to position the building behind the trees surrounding the site, reducing its impact on the surrounding area. As a new addition to a modernist building by award-winning architects, which has a no demolition policy at its heart, the proposal is intended to be visually distinctive to the existing building and surrounding conservation area. The proposal will be a BRIAM excellent uh, and complies with policy 28. The natural coloured terracotta baguettes provide a contrast to the black finishes of the existing building while being sympathetic to the gold brick of the wider conservation area. The building's facade is designed in response to the surrounding trees, creating a man-made canopy. By building above the existing building, the proposal removes as little open space as possible, and the open space is enhanced through landscaping and improved general accessibility. The addition of the community cafe with bathroom facilities also improves the quality of St Matthew's piece as a public open space and amenity. Revised ground floor arrangements and improved cycle storage design were prepared recently and shared with the local planning authority, as referred to in para three of the officer's report. But unfortunately, the officers did not accept the resubmitted information. This reduces the impact on the open space and the option to designate other parts of the site as protected open space could result in net gain. Just on the trees, the removal of the two trees on New Street was a result of advice received during the 2015 pre-app process as the original designs were set back behind New Street tree line. Advice from the urban design officers led us to bring the building forward to create an active frontage on New Street. Comments from the tree officer at the time accepted that creating the active frontage justified the loss of the two trees and was also previously supportive of the designs with similar masses in similar locations. Thirdly, in terms of the impact on the conservation area, the heritage statements can carefully consider the impact. Due to the proposals being visually contained by the existing trees, impacts beyond are very limited. The intention of the design approach has been to directly acknowledge this unique setting and trees. We do acknowledge the aspects of uh, adverse impact on the conservation area would indeed arise and these largely stem from the reduction of openness within parts of the site and park itself. But there will be very little awareness of this effect further afield. Taking into account the extensive visualisations provided, the assessment of adverse impact is judged by the applicant to be below that claimed by the conservation officer. Thus the level of public benefit to outweigh that harm level is more than that is presented in the officer's report. Chair, Finally, if I may, sorry, you're coming up to, well, you've, you've exceeded six minutes, Chair. Okay, well, just well, last thing to say, Rob, we hope you would support the proposal. That's fine. Thank okay, you. Thanks. Thank you for that. Thanks, Sarah. All right, so now some councillors want to um, present. So, Councillor Robertson, I believe you're first. Are you there? I, I am indeed, thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you um, I'm Richard Robertson, one of the city councillors for Petersfield, which includes the St Matthew's piece. And I felt the drawings provided to the committee did not convey the true horror that this proposed structure would be if allowed to be constructed. Now, I, I think um, uh, the planning officers got some slides which I asked if we could see, which were once presented by the uh, applicant and, and some by the friends of St Matthew's Peace. So Dean, is that available? Yeah. If we can share the screen. So they're all okay for us to see then, Dean, in terms of yeah. clarification. Yeah, okay, go ahead then. So just stop the clock a minute then, Sarah. Well, oh, you don't have a clock, do it, it's Councillor. Yeah. yeah. I won't be as long as last time, I yeah, promise. Yeah, then, please, Councillor. Right, well, the first picture when it comes up is a picture taken recently in the winter of um, 
National of New Street looking south. So let's wait for that picture to appear. All right, hold on. Um, for some reason I can't share my screen. Bear with me just a second. Well, while that's going on, I'll deal with the issue. Of, oh, sorry. Um, we'll go back to the first picture. Take it full size if you can. Well done. Thanks, Dean. That's great. So just get the right one up. Is that. Uh, no, keep going. Right. Okay, sorry. There you go. Next, next slide. There might be a lapse. Yeah. Right. OK, so that's the first picture taken from New Street looking south. And it's a winter picture, as you can see, the sun shining through the trees. Um, next slide, please. And that is the proposed structure that would be imposed on our park. The, de the developer carried out a consultation a year ago, which resulted in over 200 responses from local people, criticising the concept and particularly expressing concern at the proposed imposition of this structure on the local park. Following that consultation, I suggested to the developer that they should recognise that the building was the structure was the structure was not wanted and they should drop the whole idea. Next slide, please. Now this slide shows the view from the south uh, of the site, looking through the play area at the Howard Mallet or St Matthews Centre uh, at the end of the building. And the next slide shows what it would look like with the imposition of this monster on the site. Um, despite the negative response to the consultation, um, they, they, they went ahead with the application and produced something that's almost exactly the same structure as was in the original proposal. And it, as you've heard, is a building which effectively is six stories high with the setback area on the top. Um, and I, on the right, you can see that those green structures are the um, staircases which would provide access to the upper floors. And they, they stick out sideways and encroach on, on the uh, open, protected open space. Next slide, please. That is the protected open space, uh, that striped area north, uh, north of the red line and the, the building on the left is the existing structure. Uh, next slide please. It's the same, this is, this is taken from the um, Eastern Gate uh, SPD showing again the area of, of open space of St Matthew's Peace and the area to the right of the existing building is it continues to be protected. Next slide. This is similar to the picture shown by the officer earlier. The top of the page is top of the, the grey area at the top is the protected open space. And you can see if, if Dean can just demonstrate again the staircases. Those staircases intrude onto the protected open space and uh, totally unnecessarily impose themselves to deprive the neighbourhood of part of the uh, open space. Um, Next slide, please. Now this is an issue which um, has, has come up, which is a, this is a picture or a description produced by the applicant showing how the, the new structure would impose itself on the skyline and take and impose itself on the park itself. Next slide. And this drawing I got the applicants to produce because it shows the main structure of the building and on the left you can see the two-story buildings opposite which are of great concern to uh, us that they would be overshadowed by the uh, the new structure and uh, my colleague Councillor Davies will talk about that a little bit more. Next slide. This is the same but from the opposite side looking west rather than looking east. Again, you can see a 20 metre high building totally dominating the two storey buildings on the other side of New Street to the right. 
and also take note of the size of the people who have been depicted walking around on underneath and beside and along New Street. You know, this is an enormous proposal for, for to be imposed on our park. Next slide, please. This is a, another way of looking at it. This is the structure without the trees around it, but this is the structure. And this is trying to show the daylight and the sunlight. This particular drawing shows the sunlight at 12 midday on uh, December 21st, mid midwinter. And you can see that the sun has totally taken from the two story buildings on the other side of New Street. The other thing is, of course, later in the day, as the sun goes round, the shadow would fall on the area in front of us in between the building and York Street and really deprive that of complete of all sunlight every day in the midwinter. Next slide. And those are the trees in summer which would be in shadow as a result of, um, of, of the lack of sunlight caused by this building in position on the park. Next slide. And that's another view from the uh, New Street side of what the building would look like imposing itself on, on the streetscape. And I think the next is the final slide. And that's again is what we would have imposed on us. Um, now, there are two issues I need to deal with. Firstly, this proposal seeks to ignore the requirements of the local plan that we've got. And frankly, I cannot remember ever seeing an application which so blatantly went against so many of our local plan policies. It really is unbelievably blatant. Um, I would need to comment on the CSVPA issue that uh, uh, concerns, which was just raised by Rob Hopwood. What CSVPA, who are the current occupants of the of these uh, Howard Mallet building and run their school there, what they've got to recognise is that, that this accommodation won't, can't always be necessarily guaranteed to be for their school. CDSVPA must realise that they may not always be occupiers, occupying the building. There is history of proposals for a school to occupy this building. And once planning permission was given to allow that building to be used for as a school location, a different school was actually moved into the building and leased to a different school. The, the point is the planning permission would not be personal to CSVPA. And once it's granted, any school could occupy this building and we could end up with a language school, for instance. So although CSVPA have a point that they'd like to occupy the building, they can't guarantee they will always be in occupation. And that is a kind of grave concern to local residents to lose even further control of what's going on there. So I, in conclusion, I very much support the recommended rejection of the perverse application and hope the committee will agree with that refusal. There is an additional reason for refusal, which I have of myself and the friends of St Matthew's Peace put together, which it would be an eighth uh, re reason for refusal. And I did submit it to the officers on Monday night. And that is basically to recognise that policy 60D in particular is concerned with structures which are significantly taller than the surrounding built form and not just the effect on the skyline. And we all think that an addition of this uh, additional reason for refusal should be included. Um, and I can read it out. It says overall, by virtue of the excessive scale, height, mass, bulk and depth, the proposal is significantly taller than is characteristic of the surrounding built form in the Mill Road conservation area and would result in adverse impacts on neighbouring buildings and open spaces in terms of both overlooking and overshadowing and as such is not in accordance with policy 60 D of the Cambridge Local Plan 2018. I hope that can be added to the reasons for refusal and I hope the committee accepts it should be refused. Thank you very much. Right, thank you, Councillor. If we just go back to the 
people then please, Dean. Um, I just want to check, Keith, I did ask you, Dean, if those views were OK for us to see. So I just want to check. So or maybe Dean can answer this. So I mean, obviously I can't control the cancerous invasive language at the start, but the views of West and East were not from the same point, were they, from before and after? I mean, you've got roughly the right sort of uh, comparison, but it wasn't exactly from the same point. So I presume that we can be be looking at those and comparing them, Dean. Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, uh, and, and it's OK to look at a view without the trees, because obviously the trees are a component part of the site, aren't they? Yeah. OK, thank you, Dean, for that. So next speaker is uh, uh, Councillor Davies. Thank you. Can you all hear me OK? Yeah. Lovely. Thank you. So I'm speaking as a city councillor for Abbey Ward and many of the streets neighbouring the proposed developments fall within Abbey Ward. And as such, I will focus on the impact of this proposed development on Abbey residents. And I'd urge the committee in the strongest terms to reject this application in accordance with the recommendation. The breadth of the objections from the Friends of St Matthew's Peace, from residents and the detail of the officer's report makes clear a list of policies breached by this proposal. Today I'd like to focus on two factors in particular, overshadowing breaching policy 60D of the local plan and the harm to protected open space breaching policy 67. First, on policy 60, the officer's report states that the proposal is broadly in, accor in accordance with policy 60, on the basis that it is not considered to result in any intrusion upon the skyline. But we'd contend that the proposal does breach policy 60 with reference to 60D in particular. And as Councillor Robertson and the Friends of St Matthew's Peace have set out, would ask that policy 60 should therefore be added to the rationale for rejecting this application. As the committee will know, policy 60 refers to, and I quote, any proposal for a structure that breaks the existing skyline and or is significantly taller than the surrounding built form. The proposal is much taller than the surrounding buildings. It's more than double the height of the terraces opposite on New Street. And so policy 60 clearly applies. One of the criteria is 60D, which says applicants should demonstrate that there is no adverse impact on neighbouring buildings and open spaces in terms of the diversion of wind, overlooking or overshadowing. And I'd emphasise the phrase there, no adverse impact. Councillor Robertson has addressed the adverse impact to the open space. And I'd like to focus on the adverse impact for New Street residents. The proposed development at 20 metres high would tower over the two storey terrace homes on New Street directly opposite the entrance and would very clearly overlook and overshadow the properties all round. This would block sunlight to residents' homes and ruin residents' views as confirmed by consultees' reports. Indeed, the applicant's own townscape and visual impact assessment concedes that the local properties would be greatly affected. Councillor Robertson has shown images demonstrating very starkly how the proposed development would at certain times of year block sunlight onto the new street terrace entirely, even at midday. Further, this overshadowing would damage new street residents' capacity to contribute sustainably generated energy to the national grid via installed solar panels. An obvious adverse impact, particularly given the climate emergency. Number 89 New Street, which would be directly overshadowed by the proposed development, has solar panels on the roof. Loss of direct sunlight will have a negative impact not only on the energy generated by these solar panels, but also on the economic viability of existing and also possible future solar arrays in the area. The overshadowing of these solar panels by the proposed development and the resulting loss in energy would very clearly constitute an adverse impact from overshadowing breaching policy 60D. It's worth the committee noting that overshadowing of solar panels has previously been ruled to be a material consideration in planning. A recent High Court ruling in William Ellis McClellan versus Medway Council and Ken Kennedy 2019 has set a new precedent with regard to both planning and climate change law. The local authority had granted, had granted planning permission for an extension, although it would block sunlight to a neighbour's solar panel. When challenging court, the judge overturned planning permission on the basis that the electricity generated helped to mitigate climate change. 
Interference with solar panels through overshadowing is a material consideration and there is clear legal precedent. Policy 60D says there must be no adverse impacts. This proposal would very clearly cause adverse impacts for New Street residents through overshadowing and overlooking, including by blocking daylight, blocking views and blocking light from solar panels. Given that any overlooking, any adverse impacts from overlooking or overshadowing constitutes a breach in this policy, I would urge the committee to reject the proposal and add breach of local plan policy 60D to the rationale. Before I close, I'd like to also briefly address policy 67 on the protection of open space. As you've heard, this proposed development would dominate the open space on St Matthew's Peace, overshadowing the green space, damaging trees and changing its character completely. I'd like to take this opportunity to address the importance of this open space to residents within Abbey Ward. As Dr Neil said, for 4,300 Cambridge residents, St Matthew's Peace is the park that is nearest to their home and many of these residents will live in Abbey. But the piece is also of importance to the wider area, including, for example, the Riverside community. It's an important community space for the many Riverside parents of young children who have enrolled them at the Brunswick Centre as they use the playground and open space before and after nursery hours. It is also the only green resting space for residents walking back to Riverside from the railway station, from Mill Road or the Grafton Centre. This is especially important for older residents or people with young children or for anyone on particularly hot days. There is, so St Matthew's Peace is a precious green space in Petersfield. It is also of huge importance to the wider community including Abbey residents and should be protected by rejecting this proposed development. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Davey, you're next. Sorry, can you hear me? I've suddenly yes. invariably yes. after six hours suddenly got dodgy internet connection. Wouldn't that just be the way? Yeah. Um, so please bear with me. Um, OK, um, thank you very much, Chair. Uh, as, uh, my name is Mike Davey. I'm the local ward councillor for Petersfield uh, and also the executive councillor for finance and resources. And I'd also like to speak against the application. Um, I did contact the clerk to the uh, committee meeting earlier, and I'd like to begin by reading out a submission from Councillor Linda Jones, the County Councillor from the Petersfield Division. Uh, Linda can't be in attendance herself here today, but she wanted me to read out a brief submission. I hope that's OK, Chair. Um, that too long. No, it's, it's very brief, three minutes at maximum. Uh, right. uh, this is an instance, Linda states, this is an instance of overdevelopment on a site that is adjacent to one of the few public open spaces in a densely populated Petersfield area, part of my division as the local county councillor. I live and locally and regularly lose this area for walking and cycling. I challenge the claim in the Bidwell's report that a shortage of student accommodation currently exists. That's paragraph 617 of their report. And given the less than full capacity, evidence from other sites and the more likely impact of online learning. Whatever the case, no evidence for the claim can be made in the report that is offered. As a resident, I also challenge the framing of the moderate adverse impact that Bidwell set out. They argue that the admitted moderate adverse impact can be reduced to being minor or even negligible by the added biodiversity landscaping, as if that is all that is needed for some large new building is some new flower beds. Similarly, the presentation of the walkway to St Matthew's Peace from New Street as an accessibility gain conveniently overlooks the fact that over 100 students are likely to be reducing the accessibility to the park for local residents. As a local councillor, I challenge the assumptions made about access and travel. Similar claims have been made for other student developments as planning stage, claiming that student travel is almost exclusively by cycle and foot. Yet subsequently, residents have reported noise and inconvenience caused in part by high use of taxis and late night activity. There is no date given for the travel survey in Appendix B, so it's unclear if there's a summer or winter snapshot affecting travel modes. The earlier claims about no parking space for disabled are then changed in disabled and two others. The purpose of others is unclear. So that, uh, Councillor Smart, is, is the submission from Linda Jones. If I can now move on to my own submission, if that's OK. Yeah. I'd like to begin by stating that I actually love good architecture. 
always have done. I've travelled miles to visit exciting and innovative buildings, be it Gary's Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao or the wonderful Glasgow School of Art designed by Rennie McIntosh. So I'm not against, in the applicant's words, landmark buildings, but I am against un I am against buildings that do not embrace or enhance the environment that they belong in. And sadly, this proposal does neither of those things, and at its worst, disrespects the very community in which it seeks to be built. Can I begin by reminding the committee that the planning officers have recommended and refused the for seven reasons that you've already seen and read? As Councillor Robertson stated, we would also like a further applicate, a further a rejection to be considered by the committee, and that relates to policy 60D. I would therefore support the, the proposal made by Councillor Davis and Councillor Robertson. However, there is one final item that is worth bringing your attention to your attention relating to the application that is missed so far, and that relates to fire safety. It's referred to in para 98 of the report. It appears the response from the fire and rescue services consultation has not yet been received, and this should be sought formally to evaluate the fire safety strategy within the design access statement. Their advice is needed as to whether or not the fire safety procedures are satisfactory and whether or not the application should be improved. Should there be suitable firefighting equipment, possibly including dry risers and firefighting shafts should be required. The proposed structure, to remind folk, is over 20 metres high and therefore above the standard height of a high rise building. Furthermore, the proposed structure would be suspended over another building with a wider base, both adjacent and thickly canopied trees, and this would impair access for the emergency services, particularly from the west. To go on now to the policies um, uh, that I would wish to discuss in relation to the planning application. As Dr Neil stated, there is a strong presumption in favour of the local plan, which therefore places a heavy burden on the applicant to demonstrate why any decision should be taken contrary to that plan. However, and repeatedly in this application, the applicant fails to comply either partially or fully with the local plan. To go through these, Policy 23 and the Eastern Gate SPD. Policy 23 relates to the Eastern Gate Opportunity Area, one of several in Cambridge, and the purposes of this supplementary planning document can be summarised as to provide a framework that will coordinate and guide future redevelopment in line with the Council's local policies. The duty is to enhance the character of the area by developing buildings of a scale and massing to respond to the context and reflect the predominantly residential nature of the area. The effects of the development in relation to policy here are described above by the applicant as only being partially applicant, uh, compliant with policy 23. The applicant is therefore not compliant from their own mouths with policy 23. Councillor Robertson has already demonstrated the impact of scale and massing, so I will say no more on this at this juncture. Quite simply, the frontage is significantly higher than the SPD requires. Policy 55 is the first of seven Cambridge local plan policies re relate to protecting and enhancing the character of Cambridge. The emphasis throughout is upon the special character of Cambridge and the need to preserve it. The section opens with an essential aspect of Cambridge's attractiveness as a place to live, work, study and visit is its character. The character stands from the interplay between its rich architecture and the spaces between buildings. Trees and high quality public rail also play a significant role. So the challenge, therefore, of any new development is to ensure the city's character is not adversely affected. Again, the applicants, through their own view, indicate that they are partially compliant with this policy. With regards to the built and natural environment, the entire project is out of scale, breaching both the 2018 local plan and the EGSPD. And rather than being appropriate to existing buildings, it is entirely alien. With regard to the physical characteristics, the application ignores the traditional proportions of the whole of St Matthew's piece, destroying the last vestige of its historic shape by dividing the space irreversibly into two incompatible zones, north and south, in contrast with the current coherence. Policy 57. This indicates high quality new buildings can be supported where it's demonstrated to have a positive impact on the setting, are convenient and safe, and successfully integrate functionally such as refuse and cycling, bicycles and car parking, and include an appropriate scale of features and facilities to maintain and increase levels of biodiversity. Again, the applicants believe that at best this is only partially compliant. We've dealt with scale and massing previously. 
Dean has already outlined the problems relating to the cycle parting, which is totally unsuitable. As the correct applicant correctly states, the net biodiversity impacts would affect the whole of St Matthew's Peace. The problem is that that impact would be almost totally averse to the needs of St Matthew's Peace. Policy 59. Um, the applicant must show that the existing features, including trees, natural habitats, boundary treatments and historic street furniture and or services positively contribute to the quality and character of the area and the microclimate is factored into design proposals. So the, the, again, the developers say they are only partially compliant. The quality of the material and building of the judgment of professional and weighted in the balance of other material consider considerations. Whilst a distinctive design here would make an undoubted contribution to the townscape, the contribution would be entirely negative on the basis of the extensive and serious policy compliance failures. Now, Section 60 and Appendix F have already been mentioned by Councillor Robertson, Councillor Davis, and Dr. Neil, and they've spoken eloquently about the breaches to Section of Policy 60. The only thing I would like to add is we've discussed many of these throughout the application, and the comprehensive breaches of the fundamentals of Policy 60 are problematic. In particular, I underline the unqualified protection given under Section Policy Section 60D, which explicitly requires the applicant to demonstrate that their proposal has no adverse impact on neighbouring buildings and open spaces in terms of diversion of wind, overlooking or overshadowing. That clearly isn't the case here. Policy 61. Policy 61 is listed as pertinent to the determination of this application. The proposed building sits in the northern half of St Matthew's Peace. This is a registered park that dates back from 1898 and it needs it's a heritage asset in itself which needs the full protection due to it from the local plan. St Matthew's Peace lies entirely within the Mill Road Conservation Area. It is the only designated park in Petersfield Ward and as uh, Dr Neil's already indicated it's one it's, it, it's uh, densely populated, Petersfield, excuse me, Petersfield is a densely populated ward within the city and although St Matthew's Peace is one of the smallest parks in the city, it nevertheless does a double duty. And together, these consider considerations mean that St Matthew's Peace is a premium heritage asset of great significance. The documents submitted for the application repeatedly reveal a failure to either understand or recognise the local significance of St Matthew's Peace or its wider environmental role, or its heritage role within the conservation area. There is no reference to St Matthew's Peace having been designated a recreational space in perpetuity, and this significant publication declaration alone makes St Matthew's Peace a most significant heritage asset, with its importance only underlined by the uniquely heavy population pressures exerted upon it. The application makes no justifications for perpetrating these manifold and substantial harms to the peace and the conservation area. Policy 67, which Councillor Davis has already referred to, and I won't go into much more detail, only to say it is quite apparent from the impact of the proposal to, to policy to house so many students will have a considerable impact on the use of the peace. Noting that St Matthew's Peace satisfied the local plan criteria for environmental and for recreational importance, which is intrinsic to the application, would therefore harm the character of the open space of the environmental and or recreational importance. Final policy from me, policy 71. To reiterate, St Matthew's Peace is one of the smallest parks in Cambridge, the only park in Petersfield, the city's most densely populated board. During the current pandemic, St Matthew's Peace has proved essential to maintain the mental and physical health of local residents. The trees within the Peace encircle the whole of the Peace are the park's crowning glory. As an arbicultural, I knew I was going to struggle with this word, as the arbiculturalist Diana Oviatt Ham wrote to the planning department in 2006, the existing trees are magnificent and nothing must compromise their attention. The benefit of the trees in the urban environment is now well documented and can be summarised as, as follows. For the environment, trees can reduce the urban heat island effect and sequester carbon, provide shadow and make streets cooler in summer, increase biodiversity, reduce the effect of, of flooding, improve air quality, reduce dust, dust particles. The article, the applicants themselves recognise that again, they are not compliant with meeting policy 71. To conclude, the application is really important to me personally. As Councillor Davis has indicated, it has a huge impact on the people who live in Riverside, where I do with my family. 
My daughter attended St Matthew's Primary School from 2011 to 2019. On the way back and forth to and from home, we would stop, play, chat, meet friends, walk the dog and so much more. I've used the piece countless times over the last 10 years. It may be small, but it's wonderful. The piece has a has, was and is a fantastic community space used by all. This application is just poor and there's nothing to enhance the space. But don't take my word for it, experts against it. The, not just the planning officers, the planning application breaches the key local plans as confirmed by the urban design officer, the conservation officer, the tree officer, the landscape officer, the Cambridgeshire yeah. County Council yeah. transport team, the local lead flood authority, Cambridge past, present and future. Even the developers repeatedly question whether they are actually compliant. But most importantly of all, the community, our community, is against it. It is hugely disappointing that the first time the school seek to communicate with our community is through a letter on the day of the very committee meeting itself. This is no demonstration from the school of a commitment to Petersfield. Over 300 members of that community responded to the application and not one, not one spoke in favour of it. This is simply a bad application in the wrong place at the wrong time for the wrong purpose. I would therefore urge the planning committee to reject the application. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor, and thanks to all the speakers. Um, having four councillors speak on an item, I suppose, reflects the strength of feeling in those communities that they represent. Uh, and we should be uh, cognizant of that fact. So, um, just going on to the, oh, just before we start the debate, perhaps if speakers, uh, it might be best if you turn your cameras off and muted so that we can have a debate and see one another, because not all the pictures will be on screen otherwise. But of course, it'd be great if you can carry on listening to the debates if you so wish. Um, so um, if you want to put in the chat, if you want to speak, councillors, and um, I'll just kick off with a couple of things. So um, it's been said that nobody's spoken in support. I could say a couple of things in support of this item. And, um, and also, actually, just before we start, I think what we need to do here is if anyone wants to speak in support, let's hear it. Uh, if anyone wants to speak against, they only really need to do that, I guess, if there are significant people that want to speak in support, because otherwise there's no point all trying to convince one another of what we already believe to be the case. However, we need to have a fair and reasoned debate for the applicant. So just to make that clear from the start. So I do find the building quite exciting. I think the cluster flats are good, better than having individual accommodation. Um, one comment on the first uh, reason for refusal, as it were, uh, noise and disturbance. There seems to be the implication that students make lots of noise. I don't accept that. I think lots of people can make lots of noise and there certainly will be lots of students. So I think in my mind, it's the, it's the fact that there are going to be lots of people potentially if this building was approved. That would be the problem in terms of noise and disturbance. Um, I do also feel in terms of its context, in the area of the ARU building opposite the back of Mackay's is quite a, an adventurous building in its own right and actually has some significance to bear I think on on the uh, what this building could be. Um, in terms of the conservation area the current building is not of a quality um, it's probably worse than it ever was at the moment in my opinion and it never was very good. Uh, certainly in terms of the look of the building and the function of the building, it was never, it was extremely bad in that sense, for example. The loss of the trees is extremely bad and the, also the effects on the trees. Um, nothing else to say positively, I don't think, but just to also, I mean, comment, and I'm, others may just feel this anyway, but the, the thing that counts for me against any positive thoughts about the building and its exciting nature and such like, are, are somewhat counteracted by the design designer or designers of the building uh, putting cycle parking on the roof, for goodness sake. It's such a remote location for students to, or users of the facility to, to put their bikes. How could a good designer that was going to design a good building in any sense do that? So for, to my mind, um, there's only one factor, but it's a significant factor. So I did make a couple of positive points, but on balance, I am minded to support the officer recommendation. Councillor 
Thornborough, I think you were first. Um, well, I, I one of the I do like the architect's principle of no demolition um, and utilizing existing structures and um, building up. But um, and I know that they've done this very successfully elsewhere, but I do not feel that it, this is the right location. I, I wanted to bring up a point about safety because these are young people using the rooms and I am concerned about the safety for those those children going up the stairs um, to their accommodation because there is no surveillance. This is a kind of lifted above the ground and there's no ground level surveillance. And I this is a fear of safety is something that is of material consideration. And I do feel that this is not appropriate for young people's accommodation. Not only that, I do think that it would be um, uh, actually increase the fear of safety for people around because there there is antisocial behaviour in and around Cambridge. And I think this pro providing this cover into a park and parking space is going to it could exasperate it make the situation worse. So I that so I, I do feel that that's a, I personally feel that's a, a, an important material consideration and um, should be added in. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Porro. Um, yeah, I agree absolutely with Councillor Thornbrook. I think it's not just about antisocial behaviour, as, as the chair says, people, but there is a security issue. I also wondered if um, the officer could um, sort something out. In the recent submission that you got read out from this morning, they're talking about house parents with the implication perhaps that they would live in, but looking at the accommodation, there are no sort of warden flats. And I would be concerned if the wardens were going to take the accessible larger flats, which I'm assuming are there to be compliant with um, equalities legislation to allow students with disabilities to access it. Um, again, I am not against landmark buildings and different buildings. This one reminded me a bit of the Holyrood Parliament with the batons. But for me, this is not the place to put it. And I think the impact on the trees, the impact on everything else concerns me hugely. So uh, I think that's oh, and the Porter's Lodge as well. So again, in terms of security for the students who will be 16 or 17, so vulnerable in that sense. My understanding is the Porter's Lodge. I don't know if it's proposed to be staff 24 seven, but again, it's not protecting the access in and out or indeed for other people to go in and out more worryingly, given that, you know, issues of antisocial behaviour. We want to make sure that our 16 to 18 year olds are safe. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Green. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, I'll try and be quick. Um, so uh, I also have concerns about the proposal. Um, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of issues which I think the officer report um, may be lacking. And that is, um, I think, uh, just reading the reasons for refusal. First, the first point is that um, whilst there are sort of seven reasons for refusal, a lot of them do rely on the word significant. So the development would have a significant adverse impact on the character. The overall scale of the building would significantly impose um, and be dominant um, and uh, the overall scale of the building would dominate St Matthew's piece. It does it does appear that there might be a bit of wriggle room here if the applicant were to resubmit and I'm just a little bit concerned that we might need to be a bit firmer um, or think think about um, sort of drawing some lines in the sand really. I, I, I'm I very sympathetic to the view that this this open space should be protected. I'm sitting in the open space right now. It's been humming with activity. It's been really busy with families and children like everybody's um, spoken about. So it is a lovely open space and very important in the local area. But I think um, I'd like to see a bit more recognition of this point that it should be, this open space should be maintained should be retained in perpetuity um, and I think we've got to really be careful about um, allowing any development to creep in especially things like the staircases that Councillor Robertson alluded to you know they do they they would um, impact um, spatially on the open space so they would detract from the 
quantity of open space available. And, so, and Petersfield, the ward that I represent, is actually one of the least well supplied wards with open space. Um, it's, it's got the, one of the smallest amounts of, of um, open space per person in the city. And that's including Fenner's Cricket Field, which is actually not even public open space. So this, this area is crucial to provision of open space and for people's well-being in the local area. So I think we do need to be firmer in the reasons for refusal. I'd like to see um, a reason in there which incorporated um, that it would amount to a loss of open space, not just an impact on the open space. Um, and I would also like the, the tree officer, as far as I can tell, the trees down here don't have TPOs on. There's no reference to any tree preservation orders. Whilst it is in the conservation area, the tree officer would have the option to protect those trees if they were at risk. And I think they are now at risk. So I think we need to see, uh, oh, here we are, St Matthew's Peace and the application site, which have statutory protection through conservation area and by virtue of tree preservation orders. So I think possibly more needs to be made of that. We need to um, say that the trees, trees are to be preserved, and that would mean um, that we would take a strong view against um, development on this site. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Uh, so, Councillor Tancliffe. Uh, thank you, Chair. Yes, um, Cambridge, as we probably all know, has a, almost an international reputation for modern architecture. I think we've won the Sterling Prize at least twice. Um, and I have to say that um, I disagree with uh, the comments uh, that this proposal is not attractive. I, th I find it an exciting um, and, and well thought through um, pro proposal which could bring together, not divide, but bring together the um, inhabitants of, of the immediate areas. It's nice, it's nice to have a, a landmark, it's nice to have something that is exciting um, and I think that this um, proposal is just that. Um, it, it isn't going to reduce the green open space. It's on the car park side. Is, is that not right, um, Councillor Green? It's uh, uh, through the chair, please. So through the chair. Yeah. Well, will it then answer from the officer? Yes. I'll show you. Yes. That, yeah. that on, Green. And it's fine. We'll, yeah, yeah. Let's go through the officer, Councillor Green. You carry on, Councillor Tanacliff. Yes. Sorry. Well, there is it part part of the part of the green open space, but it it's also on the it over the school, isn't it? And the school isn't exactly a handsome object. Um, this this in fact I think would do much to um, improve the environment around the immediate, immediate school. So while I respect the wishes of local people and wouldn't wish to Im impose my view. Um, it, it is clearly very strongly felt. Um, I do, I do feel that um, there is a, a good case to be made um, for for this, and uh, it's a pity that it um, is so uh, badly looked upon. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Tanikliff. Um, before we go back to the officer, I believe you want to speak, Keith. Uh, yes, thanks, Chair. I I just want to say that. We shouldn't be having a um, visual report from uh, Councillor uh, Green from the site. This is a committee to determine an application. It's it's not a site visit, so um, no visuals, please, Councillor Green. Thank you. Chair. Thanks for that, Keith. Councillor Green, you want to say something? Yeah, through you. I was trying to point to the area where I believe the staircases would come down onto the open space in response to Councillor Tunnicliffe's question. That was yeah. the purpose. I understand. I think you were, you were you're just a bit too novel for all of us, I think, but we could do that maybe if the officer needed your help, but I think the officer will be able to cope with that answering that question anyway. Um, are there any more points from councillors? Um, so we've got a couple of questions in there, I believe, um, to answer. To the officer. Also, I just wanted to also um, ask about the terracotta battens, which I find quite fascinating. So um, I don't know if you can answer this, 
but will they not break if a football gets kicked against them? Because they're only they're made of clay, aren't they? Baked clay. It seems rather, and yes, they're not actually terracotta, just ter terracotta coloured. I don't know. Um, so yeah, that was just a just a side point, really. But I was interested to know. Okay, so can we get some answers then, please? Thanks, Dean. Yeah. Um, so the first question regarding um, safety of students. Uh, yeah, this was um, a concern for officers uh, with the proposal, and um, an informal discussion was held with the um, building control officer. Um, who looked at the submitted design and access statement and he was of the view that the information contained within that statement was um, satisfactory um, in terms of safety of, uh, of students. I mean policy 46G um, only refers to antisocial behaviour, it doesn't really specifically uh, relate to um, safety and um, precautions of um of, of, of the students themselves and um, so that's why the word safety doesn't appear in the reason for refusal because it's not specific to policy 46 um, and g on that on that instance um, in terms of security of the site yeah this is obviously a massive concern to us um officers and hence why that the um the reason uh, one refers to lack of uh, sufficient mitigation measures to control antisocial behaviour and control the security of, of future students. Um, there are um, larger rooms proposed in the floor plans, as Councillor Fora um, noted. Um, however, they're not for um, wardens um, or house parents, they are for disabled students. So um, it's unclear as to how wardens would um, uh, control um, student behaviour on a 24-7 basis. Uh, which is obviously a, a huge concern in this, in this location. Um, in terms of reasons for refusal, um, Councillor Green's raised, um, I mean, the, the information contained in the report um, does give basis for those reasons for refusal. Um, I understand that you're probably inferring that a future application may come back. Um, obviously, we can't preempty what um, the applicant um, decides to do. Um, following any decision uh, today. Um, so in terms of the reasons for refusal, in terms of being more specific, um, in terms of the harm um, uh, uh, realised as part of the proposals, um, I'm happy to, to take on members' thoughts on that in terms of rewording them slightly, but in terms of what officers have recommended, we feel that they are strong enough and robust enough um, to refuse the application as they are written. Um, in terms of the trees, the trees are and uh, they do have statutory protection through the conservation area and tree preservation orders um, and they have been there for many years and do significantly contribute to the, the immunity of the area. Um, so the, the loss of the two trees to the front and the um, resulting harm upon the neighbouring trees to those trees being lost due to the building um, the building's location is a concern and um, that is reflected in, in the reason for refusal four. Um, in terms of, I think that was everything, but in terms of the terracotta battens, um, I'm not sure if a football was kicked at them, I'm not sure if they would break or not. Um, I mean, yeah, it's it's the, the structural um, stability of the building is um, interesting and possibly questionable, um, but um, yeah, in terms of football being kicked at it, uh, yeah, there's only one way to find out, I suppose, but um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure on that, I'm afraid. I mean, just for interest, I think it probably wouldn't be terracotta, it'd probably be terracotta coloured aluminium rods or something like that. So um, I don't know if we missed something there. So policy 60D was mentioned, taller structures as being added to the list of reasons for refusal. Did you touch on that, Dean? I didn't hear that bit. No, sorry, sorry, I forgot about that. So um, yeah, policy 60, in terms of um, the reason for refusal two, um, which is recommended, does refer to the overall scale of the building in terms of its impact on the character of the local area, which is predominantly terror to two storey terraced um, dwellings. Um, officers feel that the reason for refusal uh, to relate to or refers to policies 55, 56 and 57 of the local plan, which actually covers um, scale, height and, and characteristics of design, which would in this instance result in a significant impact on the character of the local area. 
Policy 60, um, officers feel that this is uh, relevant to buildings which encroach the skyline um, across Cambridge as a whole. The um, visual impact assessment submitted with the application um, does refer to um, various viewpoints which are taken to demonstrate that the proposal would not actually um, impose upon this um, upon the skyline across Cambridge and therefore officers feel that um, broadly that the, 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 the proposal is broadly um, in acceptance with with policy 60 and in this instance doesn't um, doesn't uh, um, uh, or is not in, not in, in accordance with policy 60 in this instance. Policy 60D um, refers to um, overshadowing um, impacts on neighbouring properties. The applicant has submitted a daylight and sunlight at impact assessment with the application, which assesses the um, light being received um, upon neighbouring properties along New Street, um, Sturton Street and York Street, which are the neighbouring streets around these sites. And um, various calculations have been um, presented and they are all in accordance with BRE regulations and they all pass. And therefore officers feel that um, the proposal would not result in any um, significant overshadowing impact upon these neighbourhoods in this instance to warrant refusal. And so that was the reasons why officers felt that policy 60D does not apply in terms of reasons for refusal in this instance. Thank you. OK, thanks for that, Dean. So just to be clear, before I go to Councillor Thornborough, who wants to speak again, um, does the BRE guidance, which I'm familiar with, take into account the uh, effect on solar panels on buildings that it might get overshadowed? And also, just to be clear, yes, I misunderstood, there are, go there are potentially going to be 113 children in this building, under 18s that is, who will have no adult on-site supervision. Is that correct, Dean? Yeah, it's correct, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. OK, that's the Thornborough. Uh, thank you very much, Dean. Um, I was refer my, my concern is regarding the requirement of policy 56G, which, to, which is to do, it, the, the successful places are designed to remove the threat or perceived threat of crime and improve community safety. And I feel that the the two stairwells coming down into a park with um, with chat, you know, with a dark area which is overshadowed by the building and creating spaces um, at high and low level because there's a gap between the existing building and the uh, uh, the building above and places to hide. I feel that 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 create the design has created a threat of crime and therefore i was wondered if the um can, uh, reason one could be um, edited to include um uh, that threat to crime and add in 56g that's you dean yeah um oh i see i see what you're 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 referring to now um in terms of community safety the crime prevention officer has been consulted um and although specific details um haven't been um submitted with the applications to demonstrate how um community safety would be um controlled for um conditions uh, requiring these details um could be imposed upon any um permission granted Therefore, officers are of the view that given that these could be conditions um, or these safety um, measures could be conditions, um, it doesn't uh, amount to a significant um, harm to, to warrant refusal on this basis. Um, however, if members are minded um, to include this wording, I am happy to um, include it within one of the reasons or create a new reason for refusal, but that's where officers um, um, we're, we're coming from on that. So we feel that we, those details could be conditions should the application be approved. Um, well, what do councillors think? I, I support the view that's just expressed by Councillor Thornborough there. Do, <coughs> no one's speaking against it, Dean, so I think if we could add that as well then, if that's OK. That's certainly yeah. the way I saw it in a sort of common sense sort of way. I'm not an expert on crime, but um, that's what I could see there. Um, I think, uh, 
I, I just to, to if I if I may, I, I think that would be acceptable. I think we'd be happy to revise condition one as uh, Councillor Thornborough has suggested. I think that's probably the, the way of dealing with that, Chair. OK, thank you. And I mean, I think as Councillor Green said, we need to be robust in our refusal of this application because it's not just about refusing application now, it's about any other application in the future, I think. So we need to be clear what we're saying and say it robustly. So Councillor Green, did you want to speak again? Yes, I asked a similar question if we could include um, a reference to the loss of open space rather than just the impact on the open space, please, in, in the context of being more robust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So is it the case that we're losing open space, Dean, that those staircases actually go over the open space, do they? Yeah, yeah, the, the, the two staircases on the eastern elevation do encroach into the, um, the open space on the eastern boundary. So I'm happy to refer to that into the reason for refusal five, um, which uh, refers to the impact on the, on the open space. I think that's fair and I think it's probably good to do that. You know, people talk about having a red line. Well, we have a, a sight line, which is a red line and they've gone over it really with the application, haven't they? And um, Obviously, this site has a has a checkered history locally, and we want to defend the space as much as we possibly can uh, when residents come forward in their hundreds to to let us know what they think about something. Any more points from councillors? OK, in that case, then we'll go to the vote. So uh, can the planning delivery manager put the recommendation to us, please? Uh, yes, thank you, Chair. So the recommendation is uh, for refusal for the reasons set out in the report um, uh, with um, revisions to reasons one and five as discussed. And we'd ask for delegated powers, please, to to um, make those revisions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. So uh, we'll go through alphabetically. Councillor Bajan, how do you vote? I uh, support the officer's position and ref to refuse the proposal, Chair. Yes, I understand. Uh, Councillor Green. Support the recommendation to refuse the application. Thank you. Councillor McQueen. I also support the officer's recommendation to refuse the application. Thank you. Councillor Page Croft. I support the officer's recommendation. Councillor Porro. Uh, yes, Chair, I support the officer's recommendation to refuse. Councillor Thornborough. Yeah, support to refuse. Councillor Tunnicliffe. Abstain. And I support the officer recommendation. So uh, you don't need to add those up from me, Sarah. So there was, uh, well, I, actually, maybe you do. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven votes to support the officer's recommendation and one abstention. So in that case, the application is refused as per the officer recommendation. So um, that is the last planning item of the day, as we will not do item seven today. There's not going to be enough time. We could go on later, but I don't think we should. It's been a long enough day as it is, and we can take that one at the next planning meeting. And I'm sorry it's been a such a long meeting, councillors. I'm afraid these two big items have come forward from the last planning meeting when they were meant to come, but had to be pulled at last short notice, unfortunately, due to technical reasons. So that was that really. Um, so thank you very much again. It's been a very good meeting. And I think, you know, we've not all agreed all the time, which is good, but we've, we've had some good debate. I really appreciate that. So just before we do finish, we just need to um, note the uh, last item on the agenda, which is the Planning Advisory Service Review Report, which you've all received. Um, it isn't chair, sorry, uh, Chair, can I interrupt? Oh, yeah. I believe um Sharon wanted to talk to that report she's left me a text to let her know uh just before we get to it I hadn't appreciated that item seven had been pulled so Sorry. can you bear with yeah. us oh, she's I, um, I, I just um been in touch with officers to check that out really so um that's fine so um if you can just let her know now then so don't go away councillors yet so um what I was saying was that, I mean, obviously, as always is the case when I've chaired meetings with items to note, if councillors want to speak 
to them uh, in any way, that's fine. But I don't want a fully fledged debate about the item because it isn't appropriate at this time and there isn't time anyway. So I can see that Sharon's come back on screen now. So Sharon, do you want to speak to the uh, planning advisory review then, please? Yes, Chair, and I will be very brief in my um, introduction. So members will be aware that um, the planning advisory service were commissioned to carry out reviews of both the South Cambridgeshire District Council Planning Committee and Cambridge City Council Planning Committees back in the spring. The reviews were delayed because of COVID-19 and lockdown. The City Council Planning Committee reviews being completed. The review report is attached as Appendix A to the committee report. Uh, paragraph 3.4 sets out the process undertaken for the review. Paragraph 3.5 of the report outlines the main findings and conclusions. There are 11 recommendations as set out in the report on page 10 of the agenda papers. Some of these are already being implemented. Others will be progressed as part of a wider planning service review, which will take place during 21-22. This will include a review of development management processes and procedures as part of phase one of that review. Um, a separate report will be taken to the Joint Development Control Committee, although there are only uh, fairly short areas of the report that deal with the, de uh, the Joint Development Control Committee. And a very similar process has already been undertaken by South Cambridgeshire District Council in respect of their Planning Advisory Service Review Report, which was published on the 13th of January as part of their Planning Committee agenda on that date. So the recommendations um, are set out on um, page two of the agenda papers, Chair, in terms of the report. Um, and I will stop there and just allow members to speak. Thank you, Sharon. Uh, so just to say, it's really good to have this review by the Planning Advisory Service. They're a really good body and they know their stuff. So I recommend you all read this review. Um, as far as I'm concerned, I think we've come out of it quite well. Um, I, I really like the way that this committee works. I think we do good work. Um, and that's, you know, some, I think the only criticism that could be made is we take too long sometimes, but it's difficult sometimes to stifle debate when the debate is so interesting and diverse. So um, that's all good. Uh, so on balance, I'd say we're doing a good job and well done. However, read the report. So, councillors, did anyone want to say anything further to that? Yes, Councillor Porra. Um, in effect, could I check with Sharon? Is the main debate on this going to be at planning and transport? Because I just had a couple of minor points, but I'm happy to raise them at planning and transport if that's easier. Um, I think it's fair enough for members to raise any issues. There will be a programme, obviously, the decision of Planning and Transport Committee will be to commission the setting up of the joint member um, officer group and they will oversee the implementation of the recommendations or as the recommendation in the report makes clear or decide if they don't want to implement those recommendations and set out why. Um, some of the recommendations will clearly directly involve the Planning Committee going forward. So the scheme of delegation review is a matter for the planning committee. The review of the adjourned decision uh, protocol is a matter for the planning committee. Um, so there will be a relationship between the planning committee and the uh, scrutiny committee. Now, it may be that that group would be composed of a mixture of planning committee members and scrutiny committee members. That will be to be discussed in due course. I have discussed the issue of how planning committee members uh, get their views um, expressed to scrutiny committee uh, with the democratic services manager Gary Clift and he has confirmed that it is possible for uh, planning committee members to attend the scrutiny committee meeting or to submit written comments and would expect the chair to be invited to attend that meeting the chair of the planning committee. Thanks for that, Sharon. Is is that OK, Casey? Uh, sorry, Councillor Pora, because if you're the only yeah. one. You could... I mean, literally the only tiny thing I was going to say was there's a couple of places where it talks about chair and vice chair 
looking at good practice. I'd just like to include spokes so that we're actually covering all of us and make sure we can all feed back to our groups on that. But that was all. And I, I agree with the chair in terms of I feel that it was a good report. Yeah. OK, that sounds sensible. Sharon, yeah? Yes, that's sensible. Yeah. Yep, yep, OK. In that case, then, as was said, we can feed into the process further in various ways, as Sharon has outlined going forward. All right, everyone. So thanks again for a long day. Um, have a break now <laughs> until some of us have to meet again at six o'clock. So bye for all. Bye to all. And thanks very much. Bye. 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 bye.